Chapter 10 Blow Up the Outside World By the time the 37th Annual Grammy Awards rolled around in 1995, Soundgarden had done the dance at the glitzy ceremony three times and come away with nothing. In 1990, Ultra Mega OK lost out on Best Metal Performance to Metallica. Two years later, Bad Motorfinger lost to Metallica again in the same category. In 1994, they had been up for Best Metal Performance for their rendition of Black Sabbath's Into the Void. That time, they lost out to Nine Inch Nails, who claimed the prize for their explosive industrial anthem, Wish. There was hope that this year would be different. During the ceremony at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles on March 1, 1995, Soundgarden was up for awards in four categories. Best Metal Performance, Spoonman. Best Hard Rock Performance and Best Rock Song, Black Hole Sun. And Best Rock Album, Super Unknown. The commercial success and critical plaudits pegged them as a favorite to win at least one. Chris brought along his mom, Karen, who shared a story with MTV about how he used to beat on the drums in their garage when he was a teenager. I'm really proud of him, she enthused. Chris cracked a joke about trying to set her up with Tony Bennett, who was lurking nearby. Whoever was charged with picking the presenters for that year's ceremony had a unique sense of humor. Because when it came time to announce the winner for Best Metal Performance, previous award winners like Lemmy or James Hetfield were nowhere to be found. Instead, the task fell to blues icon B.B. King and soul music legend Al Green, both of whom looked immaculate in their expertly tailored suits. The prevailing feeling in the room was that Soundgarden wouldn't win this particular prize. Most were expecting Rollins' band, who had just performed their song Liar, to take home the trophy. But then King opened up the envelope and read the words within, Spoonman, Soundgarden. The band ambled up from the crowd and appeared on stage dressed uncharacteristically dapper. Chris went with a black suit and black shirt, which he dressed up with a variety of silver necklaces and a large red ribbon to support AIDS awareness. Ben Shepard appeared in a black suit jacket and white shirt and didn't say a word. Matt Cameron chose a blue jacket and black shirt and took a brief moment to thank his mom. Kim Thiles spoke last, thanked his loved ones, and then chided the Grammys for making Rollins' band perform and then passing them over for the award. As the front man and song's writer, Chris spoke first and spoke the longest. It was more difficult than he had expected especially given the added shock of receiving the prize from one of his musical heroes. All of a sudden, it's Al Green giving out the award, and I go up and I shake his hand, and I didn't know what to say, he remembered. That was one of the few moments I've had. It was like, I feel like it's great to get this, but we're all standing there as a band feeling like we gotta look like we don't care. Chris joked about Soundgarden's classification as a metal band, marveled at the talent of the men who presented him with the award, then thanked his wife and manager, Susan Silver, his label A&M, for putting up with us and letting us do whatever we want and letting us not do anything if we want, his former labels Sub Pop and SST, for being there early on when nobody else cared. He also thanked Cameron Crowe and his parents. Soundgarden's night didn't end there. They also bested their buddies Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam to win Best Hard Rock Performance. In the end, however, Super Unknown failed to take home Best Rock Album. That prize went instead to the Rolling Stones for Voodoo Lounge. For years, Soundgarden had been pushed by a loud contingent of hard rock and metal-loving fans as the next big thing. Now here they were, receiving the critical recognition long lavished on so many of their peers. It was another winner that night, Bruce Springsteen, who summed up the bizarre phenomenon that are the Grammys while taking home a prize of his own. If you stick around long enough, he said, they give these things to you. Soundgarden had stuck around for far longer than most of their newest fans had realized. They'd done the Van Tour thing. They'd done their independent record label thing twice. They'd lost members, gained new ones, changed their sound multiple times and had played in front of crowds from Osaka to Oslo. And now here they were, reaping the benefits superb artistry and tenacity had sown. The trophies and sheen of respectability that came along with them were great. So was the commercial and cultural acceptance. 
The money was nice too, but at the end of the day, the success was all the sweeter knowing the hard road they had traveled to make it to this moment. They had stayed true to themselves and waited for the world to come to them. Now, it finally had. That's one thing I feel really proud of when I think about Soundgarden, that a 15 or 16-year-old or even a 19 or 20-year-old buying our music is buying into an honest thing. Chris told Request in 1994, It came from the heart of this band, and it became a part of them, and it was honest. We weren't pandering to them. I can go to sleep at night knowing I wasn't trying to steer them in a direction where they'd give me money and I'd walk away laughing all the way to the bank. After finishing out their tour of the Pacific Rim, Soundgarden only had about a month to regroup back home before catching a flight to Europe to start their next run with a show at the stately Shepherd's Bush Empire in London on March 12, 1994. It was a quick-hitting performance, made memorable by the appearance of Artist the Spoon Man. Chris picked me up on stage once the song was over, about two feet above the floor, Artist recalled. I said, no, man, I'm heavier than you think. Despite his protestations, Chris had no problem manhandling the muscular Spoon Man. He was a strong, strapping man, Artist noted. A week later, the band crossed the channel and formally kicked off their Days We Tried to Live tour in Dortmund, Germany. In a fitting touch, the first performance took place in a venue called Soundgarden. Before the gig, Chris managed to learn how to speak the phrase, take off your pants in German. And during the show, more than a few audience members were eager to oblige, including a group of army officers who crowd surfed in their boxer shorts. From there, they hit all the familiar markets in Scandinavia before looping back around to Germany, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Belgium. A lot had changed since the band first stormed Europe in the late 80s. Grunge mania had hit the continent hard, and its effects were visible whenever Chris looked out into the crowd. Five years ago, we'd go to a country where they all dressed completely different, Chris told MTV in 1994. Five years later, we go to the same country, and everyone dresses like they're from Seattle. Where once they had been the alternative in rock, now they were living, breathing avatars of the mainstream. On April 8, 1994, Soundgarden rolled into Paris, one of Chris's favorite cities in the world. The four guys were pretty worn down on the drive to the two-century-old Elysee Montmartre. They were even more tired than usual that afternoon, after having been awoken at around six in the morning by the sound of jackhammers on the street outside their hotel. Chris made a top ten list of reasons why they should just go ahead and cancel the gig. But with Paris being such an important market, no one took his complaints seriously. Soundgarden played through soundcheck, further annoyed by a local noise ordinance that capped the decibel level, then waited for the gig to begin. Tad served as the supporting act. Soundgarden opened the show proper with Jesus Christ pose. During one segue, Chris flashed a bit of his French, telling the crowd, Va chier, Paris. Go shit, Paris. By all accounts, it was a solid performance. Soundgarden delighted their French fans with copious cuts from Super Unknown, ending with Head Down. Before, off to the wings, eager to crack open a few beers and gear up for the final push through the UK in the coming days. On their way backstage, Kim Thile was intercepted by Kurt Danielson, Tad's guitarist. He had bad news to break. I wanted to tell them myself because I thought they should hear it from a friend, Danielson said. Everyone gathered together in a room and shut the door behind them. Kurt Cobain was dead. The Nirvana frontman had been unreachable after escaping from the Exodus Recovery Center in Los Angeles. It had been the latest in many attempts made by Cobain to get sober. Chris had heard through the grapevine that Cobain had been struggling lately. Many had tried to get through to Cobain and offer help, including R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe, who sent him a plane ticket and a driver in a futile attempt to get him out of Seattle and away from his worst influences and impulses. Chris had thought about reaching out himself once he got back stateside, but now it was too late. After leaving Exodus, Cobain hopped a flight home. He was seated on the plane next to Guns N' Roses bassist, Duff McKagan. But once they touched down, Cobain vanished. There were sightings of him around town, but nobody could seem to get in touch with him. 
His body was eventually discovered in the greenhouse above the garage of his home near Lake Washington by a visiting electrician. Three days earlier, he had injected a lethal amount of heroin before turning a shotgun on himself. It's hard to convey what a shock it was, Danielson said. Chris was moved and saddened by the news and wept openly. We all did. There wasn't a dry eye in the room. Ben Shepard had been closer to Kurt than anyone and was devastated. Chris turned to the bassist, apologized, and wrapped him in a big hug. It was Andrew Wood all over again. A great personal trauma. The loss of a respected friend and peer. And here Soundgarden was, once again, stranded thousands of miles from home. The next day, the tour rolled into Manchester, England. They were fortunate to have the night off. Some of the band, along with members of Tad and the touring crew, wound up in a nearby pub before migrating to the hotel bar to wash down their sorrow. Chris stayed in his room. Are you guys up for this? Chris asked the audience roiling before him the following night at the Manchester Academy. They screamed affirmatively, and the show turned into a semi-cathartic exhibition of anger, confusion, and melancholy. In the quieter moments between songs, Chris howled like a wolf. Alcohol dulled the pain, as did wanton acts of destruction. Once off stage, the band ripped the steel door to their dressing room off its hinges and pulled a motion detector off the wall. The next night in Glasgow, Scotland, they destroyed a table backstage, ripped off one of its legs, wadded up a piece of white bread, and played a rough-and-tumble game of baseball, which caused even more damage. The tour manager phoned Susan Silver to ask what he should do. She essentially told him to leave them alone. Soundgarden played a final boozy gig two nights later in London at the Brixton Academy, during which Chris invited a sauced fan on stage to sing God Save the Queen. The drunken Englishman obliged in truly reprehensible fashion to Chris's obvious delight. You just won a fabulous set of steak knives, he joked. Shortly after that, another fan fell down in the mosh pit, causing a lengthy delay. To entertain the crowd while medics attended to the person, Chris implored the Brits to chant like Soundgarden was their home football team before kicking half-full cans of beer into the audience. I'm trying to score, he yelled. When everyone was safely out of the pit, the gig resumed for another 20 minutes before ending with a performance of Mailman. The next day, Soundgarden hopped on a plane back to Seattle. Coverage of Cobain's death was still leading the national news when they landed. Networks carried multiple stories about the departed Nirvana leader, and MTV put the band's videos into near-constant rotation. Over the next several months, the members of Soundgarden were asked repeatedly to give their thoughts on Cobain, his death, the proliferation of heroin in Seattle, the general ennui of Generation X, depression, rock stardom, the so-called 27 Club, and a whole host of other morbid topics. They did their best to satisfy the inquiries, but sometimes there are no good answers. Sometimes a tragedy is just a tragedy. For Chris, the questions about Cobain never really stopped. Throughout the years, he did the best he could to try and put the tragedy in the context of his own experience. It's a misconception that all rock stars and movie stars are into drugs and heavy drinking, he told the Irish Independent. When I went to meetings to get myself straightened out, I would literally be the only musician in a room full of 50 people. I'd be there with longshoremen and housewives and subcontractors. The reason people sometimes walk away with the idea that young starlets and rock stars all have drug problems is that those are the people you talk about. If someone is a construction worker and they crash their car or they OD, nobody writes about it. There are lots more people like that who are struggling with the problem. He also went out of his way to discourage those from reading too deeply into Cobain's lyrics to try and find clues that could point to his eventual end. What are you going to do when you read mine? Chris asked in 1994. A lot of people have had that sort of pain and didn't necessarily end it that way. Or had that sort of pain and planned on killing themselves but were unfortunately hit by a bus on the way to the gun store. Even as the black cloud of Cobain's suicide hovered over them, the demand for Soundgarden was at its zenith. The singles from Super Unknown dominated FM radio stations across the country, and everyone, it seemed, 
wanted a piece of the group. The band only managed to carve out a month and a half of downtime before kicking off the North American leg of their worldwide tour, just a few hours up I-5 in Vancouver on May 27th at the PNE Forum. Two nights later, they were back in Washington, playing a semi-hometown gig at the Kitsap County Fairgrounds in Bremerton. During the encore, Chris paid homage to Cobain. This is for Kurt, he told the crowd before launching into Head Down, Ben Shepard's mournful psychedelic ballad. The next three months were a whirlwind of nonstop concert dates. The shows were marked by a noticeably elevated production budget and featured more lights, more volume, and bigger stages than ever before. A massive screen displayed colors and video clips behind them, including an ominous one of a child riding a bicycle that opened each performance. The band largely eschewed material from the earliest portions of the career, opting instead to play more familiar tracks from Bad Motorfinger and Super Unknown. On rare occasions, they treated crowds to old favorites like Flower, Ugly Truth, or Beyond the Wheel. Despite their newfound status as a big-time rock band, Soundgarden was hell-bent on remaining grounded as human beings. That meant treating their opening acts better than some of the megastar bands had treated them in years past. It felt more like a caravan, Eleven guitarist Alan Johannes said. It wasn't like, oh, don't talk to me, or here's my bodyguard, or don't go into certain areas. Thankfully, none of that. We were pretty lucky to have been around. Chris enjoyed touring with Eleven so much that years later when they lost their deal with Hollywood Records and didn't have a budget to go out on the road, he dipped into Soundgarden's pocket to make sure they were on the bill. He calls and says, We chipped in 15 grand so you guys can come on tour with us, Johannes recalled. You can use our techs, or you can hire a tour manager in a van. Just come with us. It was a really amazing thing to be invited, because the opening band never gets supported like that from the headliners. That never happens. Two of the most notable performances from this run took place at the Armory in New York, one of the most loathed venues in the city. It was this huge hangar-like structure, so even Soundgarden felt like a tiny thing in this immense place, Danielson said. Besides that, it was extremely hot and humid, so everyone was soaking with sweat. There was a micro-atmosphere in that place, so it was like raining in there. It didn't take long before fans started passing out from heat exhaustion. From his position on stage, Chris compared the venue to hell. The next evening's performance went pretty much the same, albeit with an added cameo on the song Fresh Tendrils from Natasha Schneider and Alan Johannes from Eleven. Soundgarden's performance was ultimately overshadowed in many people's minds, however, by O.J. Simpson's infamous freeway Ford Bronco chase earlier in the day. Chris cracked a couple of different jokes about the former NFL running back between songs. Around the same time that the band sweated it out among their fans in the armory, A&M Records released the Black Hole Sun music video to MTV. Soundgarden had high hopes for the song, but they couldn't have anticipated how deeply the single would resonate with people. The surrealistic clip quickly became a fixture on MTV, captivating an entire army of Gen X kids home from school on summer break. On July 16th, the song hit number one on Billboard's mainstream rock radio chart, where it rained for seven consecutive weeks. Whether it was the compelling video, the surrealistic lyrics, or the way Chris's voice pierced through the kaleidoscope of psychedelic guitars, there was something about Black Hole Sun that captured the imaginations of an entire army of young music lovers much in the same way that Smells Like Teen Spirit and Jeremy had a few years earlier. It became the song of 1994. In August, Soundgarden crossed the border into Canada, where they played a one-off festival show with Nine Inch Nails at Molson Park in Barrie, Ontario. It was a momentous meeting of the musical minds and a rare treat for alternative fans who couldn't get enough of either Super Unknown or The Downward Spiral. Both albums had been released on the same day a few months earlier, and both groups had dominated commercial radio ever since. A new group named Marilyn Manson opened things up, playing cuts from their just-released debut album, Portrait of an American Family. Nine Inch Nails played later in the evening, 
and did everything they could to make life difficult for Soundgarden, turning in a bracing set filled with some of their most intense songs, like March of the Pigs, Sin, and Terrible Lie. The headliners responded with energetic renditions of Jesus Christ Pose, Rusty Cage, and My Wave. Less than a week later, the band trucked a few thousand miles west to Calgary, where they were followed around by Shepard's brother Henry and the crew for the documentary Hype. The filmmakers sought to chronicle the proliferation of the Seattle music scene in the 80s and 90s. One of the film's producers, Lisa Dutton, had served as the maid of honor at Chris and Susan's wedding a few years earlier. Finally, on August 13, 1994, the band rolled back into Seattle for the final show of the exhausting tour at Memorial Stadium. The timing of the concert seemed curious to some outside observers because many of Soundgarden's peers, including Nine Inch Nails, were on the other side of the country in upstate New York, taking part in the Woodstock 94 Music Festival. Soundgarden had been offered a slot along with a hefty payout, but they turned it down, viewing it as a cynical nostalgia play. Woodstock, to me, is really nothing more than a way to do a Lollapalooza this year, Chris told the New York Times. I think we spent enough time playing in situations like that. It isn't our show. For people that are nostalgic, they can go see some band that's reformed, like the Eagles. Soundgarden's hometown return wasn't quite the triumph they'd anticipated. The band was worn out from so many months on the road, and Chris was plagued by vocal issues. Yet... Out in the crowd, the mishmash of seen veterans who recalled the band's earliest, fiercest shows at the tiny Central Tavern up the road near Pioneer Square, and the younger newcomers who saw Soundgarden as vital spokesmen for their generation were whipped into a chaotic frenzy. They slam-danced with abandon as multiple mosh pits swirled while the band played their hits. It was as if the crowd were pocketed by maelstroms of mayhem each one closer to the stage, a more rapidly whirling whirlpool of humans in hyperdrive. Seattle Times reviewer Tom Phelan wrote, As soon as the show ended, a frustrated Chris walked straight from the stage and into a waiting car. Chris's vocal struggles turned out to be worrisome enough that he saw a doctor, who diagnosed him with strained vocal cords. In order to prevent permanent damage to his voice, the physician recommended that the singer take some time off to heal. Soundgarden already had plans to return to Europe for another run of standalone shows and festival appearances, including a marquee slot at the venerated Reading Festival. But under doctor's orders, they decided to cancel all of their pending plans. Soundgarden issued an official statement offering their apologies to fans who had already purchased tickets. With Chris adding... I always want to give Soundgarden fans and my band the best performance I can. It wouldn't be fair otherwise. I take seriously the fact that our fans pay hard-earned money to buy our records and see our shows. They deserve the best show I can give, and I wouldn't want any of them or myself to be disappointed with my performance. After calling off the tour, Soundgarden largely went off the grid outside of a few sporadic appearances. Chris spent some time out at his cabin on Gamble Bay, on the other side of Puget Sound from Seattle. There was an 80-foot-tall tree just outside of the small house that he liked to climb with friends. He also had a boat which he moored at Duff McKagan's place. In the summer, he regularly took it out with his closest buddies and spent his days wakeboarding and drinking. One day, while cruising along the water, his foot slipped off and the board hit him square in the face, knocking him unconscious. When he came to, the greenish water around him was mixed with blood pouring from his head. Somehow I convinced my buddies that I was fine to drive myself to the ER alone and that they should continue to enjoy their sunny day of boarding, he recalled. That was a mistake. Heavily concussed, Chris drove around Seattle aimlessly and couldn't find his way to the hospital. Finally, he noticed a big blue H sign and pointed his car in that direction. He ran a red light and tried to park his car, but got stopped by a cop who looked past his wet hair and blood-drenched face and threatened to give him a sobriety test. Chris tried to make his way into the hospital, but then a policeman puts his hand on his gun and starts making intense threats that I don't really remember, but I wasn't able to make it inside. Finally, mercifully, another officer showed up 
recognized what was going on, and physically picked him up and carried him to the nurse's station. When he couldn't hit the waves, Chris took to the mountains to carve up some fresh powder. A couple of years earlier, Eddie Vedder had gifted Chris a full set of snowboarding gear, which he left on the singer's doorstep to open on Christmas morning. Chris had let the equipment gather dust for some time, but eventually hit the slopes and fell hard for the sport. Visits to the nearby Cascades became frequent. He was writing songs as well, but at least for the moment, Soundgarden wasn't his primary concern. I'm usually the one who starts calling everyone and saying, let's get together, I have tons of songs to play, he said. I didn't, and I wasn't calling anyone. I don't think they were waiting by their phones. Chris and Kim Thiel briefly resurfaced at the MTV Video Music Awards ceremony on September 8, 1994, where they presented the Breakthrough Video Award and picked up a prize themselves for Best Metal Hard Rock Video for Black Hole Sun. About a month after that, they returned to Bad Animals' studio and filmed a performance of Fell on Black Days for their next video. Directed by Jake Scott, the black and white clip captures the band in tight close-ups, performing a more subdued version of the song than the one on the album. Chris cuts a menacing presence as he stares into the eye of the camera, hardly ever breaking focus while crooning his despondent lyrics. That off-the-cuff version made its way out into the public a little over a year later, on November 21st, 1995, as part of a five-track EP titled Songs from the Super Unknown. The truncated collection gathered together a few scattered tracks from the Super Unknown sessions, including a haunting acoustic rendition of Like a Suicide that Chris worked up by himself at home, along with a truly odd cut called Jerry Garcia's Finger, that's less a song, per se, than a sonic churn of backwards echo and tinging cymbals. By the end of 1994, Super Unknown had sold four million copies, placing it just behind The Lion King's soundtrack, an ace of basses, The Sign, as one of the best-selling records of the year. And yet, for all the commercial success they were enjoying after so many years of being overshadowed by their more well-known peers in Seattle and beyond, the year didn't feel like a triumph. The band had a hard time trying to square their personal success with what they saw as a rough year for their city and the music that came out of it. Speaking with Charles Cross and The Rocket, Kim Thiel summed up their collective ennui. At one point, you had four bands from Seattle entering the charts at number one within half a year, and then all of a sudden, one of these bands is gone forever, he said. Kurt Cobain was dead. Pearl Jam was in the fight of their lives after taking a Don Quixote-like stand against concert behemoth Ticketmaster, who they argued were gouging their fans with obscene and unnecessary fees and service charges. Lane Staley from Alice in Change was deep in the grip of heroin addiction, forcing them to abort a tour with Metallica and go underground. Soundgarden's tour openers, Tad, were dropped by their label. There were these incredible high points in our career and incredible low points in our personal lives and in the careers of other bands, Thiel added. It was hard to make sense out of it. Were we supposed to feel good or bad? On January 8, 1995, Soundgarden emerged from seclusion and made an appearance on Eddie Vedder's independent radio broadcast that he dubbed Self-Pollution Radio for four and a half hours. Vetter curated a lineup of his favorite Seattle-based friends to come and play for an audience of whoever had a shortwave radio capable of picking up the signal. In many respects, the show was another front in Pearl Jam's ongoing battle against the corporate monopolization of the music industry and the efforts by the powers that be to make them conform to their way of doing things. Pearl Jam played a few songs, as did Mud Honey, The Fast Backs, and Mike McCready's new supergroup, Mad Season, which was fronted by Lane Staley. Chris Novoselic submitted a spoken word piece, while Dave Grohl debuted songs from his upcoming solo project, Foo Fighters. During their slot, Soundgarden eschewed their most well-known material and busted out a variety of deep cuts, like Kyle Petty, Son of Richard. They also played an early version of Fell on Black Days, a methodical whaler left over from the Bad Motorfinger sessions called Blind Dogs, and for the first time, 
a chaotic new cut they were considering for their next album titled No Attention. Kyle Petty, son of Richard, is one of the more interesting selections in Soundgarden's vast canon. It was included as the B-side to Fell on Black Days, then released again two years later on a 1996 charity compilation titled Home Alive, The Art of Self-Defense. As Chris told Radio.com, the send-up to the legendary race car driver was this little sliver of me being able to be someone else for a second, this asshole. He sounds like a seriously pissed-off version of Trent Reznor, spitting the words into the microphone. I was imagining this other band and this other guy, which I do sometimes, he added. A lot of the voices I've created and how I've created a voice is to ask, what is the singer singing this sound like? And try to figure out how to do that. Soundgarden popped into the public eye again in March to pick up their Grammys, then disappeared until August when they kicked off a slew of makeup performances in Europe, beginning with a show at the Sunstroke Festival in Dublin, Ireland, on August 23rd. The string of gigs was only scheduled to last a little under three weeks, but the timing of the tour could hardly have been worse. Just a few weeks prior to crossing the Atlantic, the band gathered together inside of Stone Gossard's new recording studio, Studio Litho, to begin work on their next album, the work was just getting underway when they had to break for rehearsals and the show their European fans had been patiently waiting a year to see. A few days after the Ireland gig, Soundgarden supported Neil Young as the second name on the bill at the renowned Reading Festival at Little John's Farm. It was an important performance, not just for the pedigree of the festival itself, one of Britain's oldest and most highly regarded, but because it was also being filmed for a special on MTV's 120 Minutes. Soundgarden rose to the occasion and delivered a ferocious 18-song set that honored their past while also hinting at where they'd be heading in the future. Aside from offering a half-hearted apology for missing the previous year's festival, we got lost on the way, he joked. Chris didn't address the crowd much, preferring to save his voice for the songs. Fan favorites like Rusty Cage and Black Hole Sun got massive receptions, but they also treated the crowd to a pair of new songs they were working on in the studio. The first, Ty Cobb, was a short rage-filled punk track that shared many of the same characteristics as Super Unknown's shortest cut, Kickstand. The other was called Christy, a swaggering monster of a song made memorable by its heavy detuned guitars and weird echo effects. Soundgarden decided against including Christie on their next album, even though it was one of Matt Cameron's favorites. Chris would just never allow it, producer Adam Casper explained. We're all like, man, it's so good. But he was like, nope, the vocals aren't right. The song became a long-lost fan favorite for years, until it finally showed up on the Echo of Miles compilation. For their encore, the band tore into a cataclysmic rendition on the swirling psychedelic coda, from the Beatles, I Want You, She's So Heavy, during which Chris interjected, Your football team sucks, as Thiel coaxed abrasive sounds out of his guitar. Once the Reading gig ended, the band motored on to Scandinavia, Germany, and Switzerland before ending the tour in Reggio Emilia, Italy. Shortly after arriving back in the States, work on their next album began in earnest. After a dozen years spent in recording studios up and down the West Coast, Collaborating with various producers, Soundgarden decided to pilot this project themselves. They did, however, bring Adam Casper back to man the boards and serve as engineer and co-producer. I think they wanted to do it themselves, and I feel like they realized that's kind of hard to do, Casper said. As a co-producer, you're the guy who's going to sit with Kim and relay what Chris feels about his part or bass sound. It's hard for band members to sit there and criticize each other. Studio Litho was formerly a lithograph shop, featuring one large room for the band along with a control room where Chris recorded most of his vocals. All told, the band spent about four months writing songs and working on basic tracks before returning to Bad Animals for two months of overdubbing and mixing. Down on the Upside wasn't quite as strenuous a record to make as Super Unknown, but a myriad of other factors made it perhaps the most challenging recording experience of the band's career. It was a little bit of a weird time, Casper recalled. I think there was some tension. 
I don't know what was happening at home, but I could tell people were tired. It was a very tiring process. Fun and great, but there was also a fatigue factor. They were doing so many songs. It was a mammoth undertaking. In 1995, Soundgarden had spent nearly a decade out on the road and in the studio together, going nonstop from album to tour and right back into the next cycle. The work had paid off, but the journey had exacted a toll. Chris was stretched especially thin, and there were moments when the process became so emotionally taxing that he would come home after a long day in the studio to his wife, lie down on the floor, and sob inconsolably. Increasingly, Chris managed his mix of exhaustion, pressure, anxiety, and depression by turning to alcohol, which had a profoundly negative impact on his state of mind. Out on the road, he downed an entire red solo cup full of ice and vodka, before hitting the stage. Though he'd always been able to hold his own, he was drinking more than ever, and communication between the band suffered. They were getting along better independently to some degree, Casper said. Matt and Chris cut a bunch of those songs like Burden in My Hand together. He's just sitting on a stool with a scratch guitar, and Matt's just nailing it. Susan Silver tried multiple times to break the ice between the four guys, and get them to talk to one another about how they were feeling and what they were thinking. She went as far as recommending they each read The Paradox of Success, a self-help book which she'd heard had helped Aerosmith, but they laughed her out of the room. It didn't help that Chris was withdrawing from Susan as well, refusing to open up to her about the issues that were bothering him and instead drowning his anxiety in vodka and beer. It only made matters worse. I didn't give a shit. He said, alcohol is a depressant, so I got depressed. And yet, Chris still managed to maintain his unique sense of humor. Just before Soundgarden entered Studio Litho to work on Down on the Upside, Pearl Jam had used the space to record their fourth album, No Code. Among the more curious items Pearl Jam had in their possession during the recording was a life-size dummy called Safety Man that they would throw in the passenger seat to take advantage of Washington State's carpool lanes without getting ticketed. After Pearl Jam finished No Code, Mike McCready left Safety Man behind on a couch where he sat and silently observed the proceedings. One day, Chris got to the studio before anyone else, stripped Safety Man down, and dressed himself in the dummy's clothes. Then he sat and waited. About 20 minutes passed before engineer Matt Bales walked in the room to get everything set up for the day's work. As soon as Bales turned around, Chris jumped up and screamed, scaring the ever-loving shit out of the unsuspecting engineer. The most tangible impact that Soundgarden's lack of communication had on Down on the Upside was a dearth of fresh material offered up by Kim Thile. Of the 16 tracks that made it onto the finished album, only one, the supercharged and psychedelic Never the Machine Forever was attributed to the band's lead guitarist. While Thiel added his own flavor to nearly every song on the record with his off-kilter, noisy, and vitriolic musical additions, his diminished output left a sore spot. It does bum me out, but I couldn't see replacing the songs we do have on there, he charitably explained to Guitar Magazine. It can be a little bit discouraging if there isn't satisfactory creative input. But on the other hand, I write all the solo bits and don't really have limitations on the parts I come up with for guitar. It's no coincidence that of all the tracks on Down on the Upside, Never the Machine Forever sounds the most at peace with Soundgarden's earlier, more abrasive records. Kim really needs a co-conspirator such as Chris to work on songs, Casper explained. His motivation was a little subdued and Matt and Ben had thousands of songs, so they were gung-ho to do all their stuff. Ultimately, Never the Machine Forever only made the final cut by the skin of its teeth. The band recorded the song at the last minute while simultaneously mixing the second-to-last song on the album. Communication was so poor between the members that they couldn't agree on whether they were actually making an album. One of Kim's hindsight things was he wasn't sure if we were actually recording. Casper said. It's like, Kim, we've been in here for months. Before and after returning home from Europe, Chris was working on songs that Thiel assumed were demos. Part of the pre-production process for the album that they'd work on together, eventually. Soundgarden was on a runaway train of momentum. 
carrying everyone along with it, regardless of whether they wanted to go. When we went in to start in July, we got about five songs into it and realized we probably needed more songs, Chris told Metal Edge. Then the European tour happened. When they got back, they hit the ground running. I wrote another four songs, then we went back into the studio, and it was just me and Matt demoing those songs. That was the same time Kim was recording, then we all went into the studio. Then Ben and Matt brought in different stuff. Things started to cascade at that point. Unlike Thyle, Ben Shepard was enjoying an impressive moment of inspired creativity. When all was said and done, the bassist notched six credits on Down on the Upside, including a sonically diverse three-pack of tracks stacked near the front. The triumvirate begins with the somber ballad, Zero Chance, which sounds like it sucked a lot of Stone Gossard's Pearl Jam DNA into it before segueing into the uncharacteristically upbeat pop song Dusty and ending with a bracing, expletive-filled middle finger of a song called Ty Cobb. Ty Cobb was originally called Hot Rod Death Toll, but Chris tweaked it to name-check the famously cantankerous baseball player. It was basically coming from the frame of mind of some sort of hardcore pissed-off idiot, the singer explained. It was just thinking of a character who was a combination of a lot of people I've met and didn't like. Two of the best songs on the album were holdovers from the Super Unknown sessions. The first was a scream-riddled barn burner called No Attention, which flips halfway through from a breakneck punk rock flurry of words and sounds to a swaggering 70s rock-style stomper, tailor-made to induce maximum headbanging. The more compelling song, however, was Tighter and Tighter, a dreamy, Leslie Amp-washed track that shared a similar doomed vibe to Black Hole Sun. Chris had written Tighter and Tighter around the same time as No Attention, and had included it on the home run demo tape he'd sent to Beinhorn. The reason it didn't make it onto Super Unknown was simple. They ran out of time. Soundgarden had already laid down the rhythm tracks. All the song needed was Chris's vocals and some extra guitar parts. In its initial form, Tighter and Tighter was much slower. But with a brusque kick in the ass and the addition of a wah-wah slathered solo from Thyle, it morphed into a psychedelic elegy. Tighter and Tighter proved to be a surprisingly contentious cut. Kim was strongly against including it on Down on the Upside. An outside voice broke the stalemate. It's Stone Gossard's favorite song, Casper said. Stone had mentioned it a few times, so Kim was like, all right, whatever. Everyone in Pearl Jam loved that song. The mood throughout most of the songs on Down on the Upside was decidedly grim, even by Soundgarden standards. The first song on the album and subsequently the first taste of Down on the Upside that the public received was a track called Pretty Noose. During his life, Chris used the noose as an allegory. An attractively packaged bad idea, he said. Something that seems great at first and then comes back to bite you. Pretty Noose was one of the more difficult songs for Chris to record, because he's singing near the top of his register throughout the whole thing. It was a challenge, Casper said. Recording-wise, the guitar part really had to be just right. I remember that one being really hard and personally never feeling entirely satisfied with the end result. Burden in My Hand is another fatalistic entry. It's also the most radio-friendly sounding song on the album, a jaunty acoustic piece written in the same open C tuning Ben Shepard used on Head Down. The vibe of the music belies a murderous narrative that evokes memories of Jimi Hendrix's Hey Joe. The mental image was this sort of destitute guy. I guess he'd lost his cool, if you want to put it that way, Chris explained. He's trying to figure out how he would stand up and put one foot in front of the other, or not. And the song never really resolves any of that. It's just that moment of somebody sitting in the dirt. Incredibly, the vocals to Burden in My Hand, Pretty Noose, and another track on Down on the Upside titled Boot Camp that ended up on the final record were Chris's first attempts at singing them. He literally read the words off a piece of paper as he poured his soul into the microphone. Given his druthers, it was his preferred way to record. I have better luck if the vocal is the last thing I do, he said. For Chris, the initial spark of inspiration remained the key to getting his voice to sound and feel right on record. 
I beat my head against the wall many times where I did a demo at home, obviously not well recorded, but there's something about it that I just can't replicate, no matter what I do or where I'm recording or who is engineering or what mic I'm singing into. And yet, neither of those tracks were as dark as Blow Up the Outside World, which opens with the line, Nothing seems to kill me, no matter how hard I try. Chris started writing this song while sitting in the back of the band's tour bus on the way out of Toronto, and over several months built it into an eye-widening tapestry of explosive sound and nihilistic fury. The whole thing sounds like a cross between a day in the life and happiness is a warm gun. It builds from a single disembodied voice over an acoustic guitar and snare drum to an avalanche of power chords and screaming before receding like the tide into a hazy coda with Chris intoning the name of the song over and over again. Near the end, explosions can be heard faintly, bursting in time with Matt Cameron's martial drum beat, an effect the band achieved by dropping an old Fender tube amp on the ground and recording the blast. For Matt Cameron's haunting composition, Applebyte, Chris wrote about how nothing really matters in the grand design of space and time. Grow and decay, grow and decay, he warbles. It's only forever. It's only forever. On boot camp, he evokes many of the same themes and feelings about the pressures to conform and be accepted by society that Roger Waters explored on Pink Floyd's magnum opus, The Wall. I must obey the rules. I must be tame and cool. And in Ben Shepard's Zero Chance, he wonders, why doesn't anyone believe in loneliness? There's a poll to try to read into Chris's lyrics to get a sense of what his headspace was like in a given moment and search for clues to explain why he chose to end his own life. More than any other album, he had a hand in creating. Down on the Upside lends itself to this kind of macabre line of detective work. And while Chris understood the impulse after seeing the same thing happen to Andy Wood and Kurt Cobain, he consistently downplayed the darkness in his own lyrics as a window into his own inner turmoil. If you're writing about a subject that's depressing or melancholy, ultimately, it's going to speak to someone who is in that environment who feels lonely, and they rise up because of it. He told Alternative Press, I would always sit in my bedroom and listen to music by myself. That was my favorite thing to do. I would often listen to really dark music. And if I was in a very dark period of my life, it made me feel happy. If I listened to Ted Nugent at a keg party, I felt horrible. Chris always prided himself on being one of the self-proclaimed normal ones to come out of the Seattle music scene, and throughout his life, consistently brushed away questions framed in a manner that suggested they were symbols of the author's psyche. Throughout the 90s, at least, he didn't feel like he completely understood himself as a person, and couldn't imagine anyone thinking they knew who he was based on the songs he wrote. By February 1996, Soundgarden had largely finished work on their fifth album. All the while, they bandied about titles before finally settling on one of Chris's early suggestions, a song lyric taken from Dusty, Down on the Upside. It had been a tough and taxing process, but the roughest stretch of road lay in front of them. Chapter 11. Wave Goodbye. A spark. A tiny burst of energy introduced into the wrong environment at the wrong time has the power to ignite a firestorm with the force and power to alter destinies. It's the kind of blaze that devours the bonds of history and memory while reshaping the landscape into a wholly unrecognizable and terrifying new terrain. In the face of such unfathomable destruction one is presented with two options. Rebuild by picking up the pieces and trying again, or start fresh. Leave behind the world that once seemed so inviting and comfortable, and seek out a new one. For Soundgarden, the spark that would alter their story forever was a malfunctioning bass rig. It was February 9th, 1997, and the band was in Honolulu, Hawaii, preparing for the final gig of their three-week-long tour around the far side of the Pacific Ocean. On that warm winter day, smack dab in the middle of paradise, hours before the horde of 8,000 fans descended upon Blaisdell Arena, the band ran through their sound check. The only problem was that Ben Shepard's bass 
kept dropping out of the mix. A tech seemingly fixed whatever was causing the issue, but nobody knew what would happen in just a few hours when they'd start to play. The show in Hawaii was important, a semi-victory lap before a hard-earned vacation. Susan Silver flew in a myriad of friends and family to watch the band cross the finish line, while also soaking up the sunshine far from overcast Seattle. After a local band warmed up, the thousands of fans huddled together, eagerly awaiting the arrival of their heroes. Soundgarden emerged and kicked off their set with a rousing rendition of Spoon Man. Over the next hour, they poured through selections from Super Unknown, Down on the Upside, and Bad Motor Finger with an inspired fervor. Chris had hardly ever sounded better. But then the bass player was clearly pissed off about something, and he was getting more and more agitated. Concert goer Daniel Peterson recalled. He started flipping us off. I don't know if he was flipping the crowd off or if he was flipping the sound guy off. The more agitated he got, the more I realized his bass was coming in and out of the sound system like something was wrong. By the time Soundgarden got to blow up the outside world, Shepard's fury boiled over. He ripped his bass from over his shoulders and smashed it onto the ground. Then he booted his amplifier kicked a stage light and stormed off. Matt Cameron jumped from his stool and gave chase. Kim Thiles set his guitar down on its stand and followed after them. Chris Cornell just shook his head and walked off to the other side of the stage, Peterson said. He didn't go over to the other side of the stage they went off to. Backstage, everyone raced toward the dressing rooms. Shepard was drunk and in no mood to negotiate with his bandmates. He especially didn't want to hear from their manager. When he reached the door of the dressing room, Shepard wheeled around and met Susan Silver face to face. They both stood looking into one another's eyes for a good 30 seconds. With Shepard's fist raised like he wanted to punch something, Silver backed down and walked away. Thiel cornered Shepard and pleaded with him to finish the gig. The bassist refused. Thiel continued until Shepard relented and agreed to follow them back out. But he lied. When Thiel realized he'd been deceived by one of his oldest and closest friends and collaborators, he became so upset that he also bailed on the gig. Ten or fifteen minutes went by and the crowd grew restless, Peterson remembered. Chris Cornell finally came out by himself and apologized. He had a Telecaster guitar and he played some songs. Just him. Chris felt the weight of responsibility to make up for his volatile bandmate's unprofessional behavior, and at Susan's urging, played a few cuts to satisfy the fans who paid their hard-earned money to be entertained for the evening. The one I remember was Black Hole Sun, Peterson said. Clearly, there's so much emotion in that song anyway, and there was so much emotion in the stadium where we were because of whatever was going on with Ben. It was really powerful. The crowd was just going crazy because he sounded great. That night in Hawaii, while the majority of Soundgarden sulked in the shadows, Chris Cornell took his first step out into the spotlight by himself. His past was several feet behind him, but his future was wide open. Down on the Upside had taken much longer and been far more challenging to record than they had ever expected. But on May 21st, 1996... Soundgarden finally released their latest creation. After waiting a little more than two years to hear the follow-up to Super Unknown, the band's fans rushed out to get their hands on Soundgarden's latest hour-long cacophony of serrated sound and twisted imagery. In its first week, the album sold 175,000 copies in the U.S. It was an impressive showing, but still came 5,000 albums short of knocking hip-hop group The Fugees' monster-selling record The Score off the top of the charts. Critical response was positive, but generally less effusive than it had been for the band's prior two releases. Spin gave the record 8 out of 10 stars. In his review, writer Ivan Creelcamp praised Chris for getting better and better at communicating down-to-earth feelings in grandiose musical settings. Rolling Stone reviewer Rob O'Connor enjoyed the album's brashness, but knocked it for lacking the eye-widening sonic execution of its predecessor. From a less ambitious band, Down on the Upside would be a grand display of technical prowess, showcasing rhythmic shifts, interlocking guitar lines, and firm control of dynamics, he wrote. But ambition 
is what has always made Soundgarden stand out. The three stars out of five that he ultimately gave it must have been graded on a curve. Meanwhile, veteran rock writer David Brown relished in the record's dark themes and sludge-covered sheen. It's music as primordial ooze, he wrote for Entertainment Weekly. And no matter the song, Chris Cornell never stops bellowing hysterical bummers. Despite the personal challenges he experienced while making it, Chris always held a rosy view of Down on the Upside. I think it's the crowning achievement of Soundgarden's life cycle, he told Revolver in 2006. It's my favorite of our records. I wasn't really aware of this at the time, since we produced it, which meant that I had no objectivity. But it was the record where the whole band was involved, and the whole band was there for everything. It's not like we were falling apart and I couldn't sit in a room. In fact, it was the opposite. We faced our biggest challenges together, which was following up a monster. In 1996, all four of the big Seattle bands released successful records. Pearl Jam and Nirvana both notched number ones. The former released a studio album called No Code, while overseers of the latter stitched together a collection of live cuts for an album titled From the Muddy Banks of the Wishkaw. Alice in Chains put out an MTV Unplugged album that sold over a million copies. Meanwhile, Down on the Upside hung around on the top 20 on Billboard's album chart for over two months, regularly trading positions with Evil Empire the second record from a rap-rock hybrid named Rage Against the Machine, on its way to eventual platinum certification. While the numbers suggested grunge still reigned supreme, the cultural sands were shifting beneath the feet of Soundgarden. Emerging musical movements like Britpop, led by bands such as Oasis, Blur, and Pulp. New metal popularized by Korn, Limp Bizkit, and Deftones, and Pop Punk, trumpeted by Green Day, Blink-182, and The Offspring, were stealing the focus among the next generation of fans. At the same time, new mainstream pop-rock acts like Counting Crows, Bush, and Hootie and the Blowfish were notching astronomical sales numbers and dominating commercial radio. Soundgarden was hardly old news, but they weren't driving youth culture the way they had a few years earlier. Chris took it in stride, the media can make you out to be more important than you really are, he told Everett True in 1996. Cultural shifts don't last very long. Ultimately, does it really matter if we've affected the way people dress for a few years? Well before Down on the Upside dropped, the band had already lined up their next high-profile live run that would keep them out on the road for most of the summer. In 1996, the organizers behind Lollapalooza tapped Metallica to headline the fifth iteration of the traveling festival. Metallica, in turn, requested Soundgarden appear with them. Soundgarden wasn't totally enamored with the idea of a Lollapalooza redux, but once they found out about Metallica's headlining status, they agreed to participate. They more or less said that if we are going to do the tour, then Soundgarden will be doing it with us, Kim Thiel remembered. Though Metallica was one of the biggest live draws on the planet, their selection as the main headliners generated enormous controversy online among alternative rock fans who viewed the metal icons as too far afield from the festival's alt-rock roots. Even Perry Farrell, Lollapalooza's founder, voiced his displeasure with the pick. I was very angry the first time they played Lollapalooza, he told Rolling Stone. I helped create the genre alternative an alternative was against hair metal, teased-out hair, spandex, bullshit rock music. Metallica, in my estimation at that time, wasn't my thing. Not that Metallica cared. Fuck all those fucking elitists who say Metallica's not alternative, or they're too big of a band to play Lollapalooza. The band's guitarist Kirk Hammett told Guitar World, they're just being very narrow-minded. Soundgarden largely eschewed being lumped in with criticism of the festival. Ben Shepard jokingly referred to the run as Larsa Palooza, after Metallica's effusive drummer Lars Ulrich. Before Soundgarden formally agreed to appear on Lollapalooza, however, they had a request. If they were going to sweat it out across the summer playing to a sea of Metallica fans, they in turn wanted the Ramones on the bill as well. The New York punkers had had a tremendous influence on each member of the band. 
Back in 1991, they even covered one of their songs, I Can't Give You Anything, for a BBC Sessions recording. Just a year before Lollapalooza, the Ramones announced plans to disband by the end of 1996. If their heroes were going out, it was important to Soundgarden to help give them the biggest stage possible from which to say farewell. On May 18, 1996, more than a month out from Lollapalooza, Soundgarden broke one of their foundational rules. We had two things we said we'd never do, Chris said that year. One was play when the sun was out, which we've now done, and the other was live TV. It was the season finale of the 21st season of Saturday Night Live, and the band had been specifically requested by host Jim Carrey to appear as musical guests. Carey was at the apex of his fame after releasing some of the most commercially successful comedies of all time, screwball masterpieces like Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Dumb and Dumber, and The Mask. As reticent as the band was about doing live television, it was too good an opportunity to pass up. The episode ultimately scored the highest rating of the season, with millions tuning in to watch Carey's zany antics. It remains one of the most watched SNL episodes ever aired. Soundgarden was originally supposed to appear in a skit with Carrie, appearing in a daydream during a job interview, where they would say, Hi, we're Hootie and the Blowfish. But between dress rehearsal and the actual show, the piece was cut for time. Their moment in the spotlight came about a third of the way through the show, just after Norm MacDonald's turn on Weekend Update. The band was introduced by Carrie as well as Chris Kattan and Will Farrell, who were both dressed as their nightlife-loving Night at the Roxbury characters. The camera zoomed in on Cornell, dressed head to toe in black, his black hair standing straight up like he just plugged himself into an electrical socket, and he sang the opening words to Pretty Noose. On a good day, Pretty Noose tested the upper limits of Chris's prodigious vocal abilities. Unfortunately, this wasn't a great day, and the performance came off a little sloppier than the band probably intended. The band made up for it, though, with a superb performance of Burden in My Hand. Once the night was over, Soundgarden expressed their appreciation to Carrie by giving him a black Fender Telecaster that they had all autographed. Dear Jim, please take this as a token of our appreciation, or something. Chris wrote in silver sharpie on the guitar's pickguard. The comedian held on to the guitar as a treasured possession. They also gifted him an autographed straitjacket. Shortly after SNL, Soundgarden played a few small shows in the Pacific Northwest, including a dismal corporate gig sponsored by the Molson Beer Company at a small venue called the Town Pump in Vancouver, during which Chris pointedly thanked their rival Labatt's on stage, before kicking off the latest iteration of Lollapalooza in Kansas City, Missouri on June 17, 1996. It didn't take the band long to realize that this Lollapalooza was far different than the one they enjoyed the first time around four years earlier. It had become an institution, Chris said. I think that there was a lot of fans there to see a lot of the other bands, but it seemed like the Metallica fans were hardcore Metallica fans, and they came there just to see them, and everybody else kind of was there to see everybody but them. Gone was the intense camaraderie that Soundgarden enjoyed with the other groups during their previous trek. This time out, Chris and the band spent much of the day hidden backstage, drinking beer and whiskey, waiting for their turn to play. The shows weren't the most fulfilling either, performing truncated sets to a sea of unruly Metallica fans who relished in chucking bottles, frisbee, food, and beach balls toward the stage was an exceptionally grueling challenge. Depending on the venue, Soundgarden would come on each night around 8 or 9 at night, play for about an hour, and then cede the stage to Metallica. Given the setting, the band largely avoided their newer material from Down on the Upside, relying instead on familiar songs like Spoon Man, which typically opened the show, Fell on Black Days, and Rusty Cage. One of the more interesting curveballs regularly thrown into the mix was a cover of The Doors' psychedelic stomper, Waiting for the Sun. Chris's attempts at Jim Morrison cosplay went over especially well when the band played it around dusk at the Gorge in the Columbia River Valley, just three hours east of Seattle. The other attention grabber was Black Hole Sun, which Chris played each night by himself on a Fender Telecaster, 
while the other members took a breather backstage. The lowest moment of the tour came after a performance in Rockingham, North Carolina, on July 20th, which also happened to be Chris's 32nd birthday. After the show, in which Ben Shepard sang Happy Birthday, Chris Stiffer, during his response part in Spoon Man, the band retired to their hotel to rest up before catching a lift to the next gig. A group of people who hadn't attended the concert but were part of a drunken wedding party spotted Kim Thiel and company in the lobby and began pestering them for pictures while being generally unpleasant. He confronted them, and eventually the cops were called. After the authorities gathered everyone's statement, the guitarist was led away in handcuffs. Thiel spent a few hours in a cell before being released on a $2,500 bond. It blew out of proportion, he said. It wouldn't have been that big a deal had I not been who I am, a guy in a rock band. Despite the arrest, Thiel and Soundgarden still managed to make it to the next evening's rain-drenched show in Knoxville, Tennessee. Lollapalooza 96 ended with a pair of performances at Irvine Meadows Amphitheater in Southern California at the beginning of August, both of which were broadcast over the Internet. Rather than hightailing it back home, however, Chris and Ben Shepard hung around Los Angeles. A few days later, they joined Eddie Vedder, Motorhead's inimitable frontman, Lemmy Kilmister, and half of Rancid at a converted nightclub called The Palace to send the Ramones off into retirement with a bang. During the second encore of the band's final show, Chris strode out in a peach-colored T-shirt and asked, You want to hear some more fucking Ramones? This is your last fucking chance, so make some goddamn noise! The fearsome fivesome emerged with Shepard and hit the rapturous crowd with an intense rendition of the Heartbreakers song, Chinese Rock. Chris and Johnny Ramone stayed in touch and became increasingly close, right up until the pioneering guitarist's death in 2004. Soundgarden continued to do their best to promote Down on the Upside. In November, they released a video for Blow Up the Outside World. The mind-bending clip found Chris strapped to a massive metal chair, a la Alex and Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, with his arms spread wide in a full-blown Jesus Christ pose while being forced to watch himself and the rest of the band perform the song on a video screen. At the end, both Soundgarden and the set explode, leaving Chris alone, squirming to break free in a debris-strewn room. According to the film's director, Devo bassist, Gerald Casali. The filming, which took place over three days, wasn't exactly a kumbaya experience. Everybody had their own dressing rooms and only came out for the takes and then disappeared back in their dressing rooms, he told Song Facts. They were very professional when they would come on the set. They were ready to do what they were supposed to do, but it was all business. By this point, a man named Jim Guerino who had worked with Soundgarden going back to their earliest days with A&M, was taking a more hands-on role with the band to try to help mitigate some of the divisive tendencies. Garino was intelligent and a canny music executive. He had originally earned the band's trust in the Louder Than Love days when he suggested they attach two clip-on lights to their merch area so that they could show off their T-shirts and make a few extra bucks while running around the club circuit. Garineau had since left his role with A&M and gone into business shepherding the careers of bands like The Offspring, Social Distortion, and No Doubt, as well as skateboarding legend Tony Hawk. He also did some work with Soundgarden and was one of the few people that the band thanked by name when they picked up their Grammy Awards the previous year. But while Garineau was close with everyone in Soundgarden, he was closest to Chris. Sometimes when Susan needed to ask Chris about a prickly issue that might draw some of his ire, it was easier to call Garino to act as go-between. His importance as an advisor and an advocate would only grow in the years to come. In September 1996, the band departed for Europe, running through a majority of the major markets throughout the continent over the course of five weeks before kicking off the North American leg in Salt Lake City in November. Chris was drinking more and withdrawing from everyone around him, while Ben Shepard was growing increasingly volatile on stage, smashing equipment and physically confronting fans and security personnel. It was usually left to Matt Cameron to step up and take on more of a leadership role. In a development that might have horrified the younger motel-dwelling iteration of Soundgarden, 
The volatility sometimes erupted offstage, like after a gig at the Roseland Ballroom in New York City. Chris was sick, the band's producer Adam Casper recalled. His voice was just gone. Frustrated that his body had failed him midway through an important gig, Chris took his anger out on his hotel room. He and Kim were back at the hotel and decided to tear up the bathroom and the bar and the hotel room later, Casper remembered. Susan was very pissed off. It was the classic TV out of the hotel window thing. Chris's drinking caused him to make questionable decisions. Like the time he got plastered and jumped out of the window of a 10-story apartment building and onto the top of a nearby pine tree, he easily could have been killed. Fortunately, he was adept at scaling evergreens and managed to scamper down the trunk unscathed. By December, Soundgarden made it back to Seattle. Originally, they planned on ending their year with a pair of shows at Mercer Arena on December 10th and 11th, but Chris fell ill, and they pushed them both back by a week so they could go out on a high note. The rest proved worth the delay. By most accounts, both shows were among the best Soundgarden had played all tour. They even brought out Artist the Spoon Man for old time's sake to rattle his cutlery to the hometown fans' everlasting delight. Chris's solo from the final night a stripped-down and gut-twisting rendition of Black Hole Sun was eventually included on the band's official live record, Live on I-5. Two weeks after the Seattle gigs, they flew across the Pacific Ocean and began a nearly month-long slate of performances throughout Australia and New Zealand. The band's decision to keep playing live instead of taking a breather was probably the worst mistake of their career. Ben Shepard wasn't in the greatest headspace, and there were moments he walked off stage while the band was still playing. Meanwhile, Chris was hardly reachable, preferring to spend most of his time alone in his hotel room. Then came Hawaii. On February 8, 1997, the band played a normal gig at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. The next night came the disastrous gig in Honolulu. Shepard stormed off, Thiel and Matt Cameron gave chase, and at the end, Chris came back out to try and give the fans their money's worth but it was the last straw. Chris couldn't even bring himself to talk to his wife about how angry, frustrated, and hurt he was. After more than 12 years, his mind was made up. Soundgarden was done. Two months after the show in Hawaii, Matt Cameron was walking home with his dog when he saw Chris's truck in his driveway. At first, the drummer was excited. It had been a long time since his buddy had visited him at his house. Cameron walked through the front door and said hello to his wife, who told him that Chris was waiting to talk to him downstairs. Cameron made his way to the basement, where Chris, reeking of booze and cigarettes and looking like he'd been awake for days, greeted him. Initially, Cameron assumed that he was there to talk about Soundgarden's next album. Cameron even played Chris a few tracks that he'd been working on. After listening politely to his buddy's music, Chris lowered the boom and told him he was leaving the band. Cameron was stunned by the revelation, but over time, shock gave way to relief. The Hawaiian experience combined with the recent run of unfulfilling gigs had worn on him as well, and he didn't know how Soundgarden was going to get back on track. Cameron wasn't the only one to receive a visit from Chris that day. The singer went to Ben Shepard and Kim Thiel's places to deliver his news in person. Outwardly, the bassist put on a brave face, spitting on the ground after Chris told him his decision, merely saying, all right. Inside, however, he was broken. Shepard had always been a tremendous Soundgarden fan, first and foremost. A world without the band was nearly too much to fully comprehend. My most intense feeling was relief, Kim Thiel told Guitar World. There's just a point in time where you just want to get out of high school, you know? You're driving the car, you're driving, but... It doesn't shine like it used to. It doesn't go as fast as it used to without it making weird sounds on the highway. That's the only reason. In an effort to shield his wife from any sort of legal ramifications for ending the band, Chris only told Susan about his visits to the other members after he had delivered his decision. He even went as far as to hire a separate lawyer to put her as far away from the fallout as he could. Once it had all been taken care of, he came home and let her know what had happened. Then he grabbed a bottle and got hammered. On April 8, 1997, 
just two days shy of the 27th anniversary of the Beatles' breakup. Soundgarden shared their dismal news with the world. The statement from A&M was matter-of-fact. After 12 years, the members of Soundgarden have amicably and mutually decided to disband to pursue other interests, the label said. There is no word at this time on any of the members' future plans. The announcement sent shockwaves of disbelief and anguish around the globe. Online fans gathered on message boards to commiserate while sharing unsubstantiated rumors about why Soundgarden was no more. MTV played their videos, radio stations played their hits, and in the media, there was an outpouring of tributes and appreciation pieces. Writing for Vox, Jerry Ewing called it possibly the worst thing that's ever happened to metal. Ever. Chris Cornell had led the charge in Soundgarden since he was 20 years old. At that time, he had evolved from the lanky singer-drummer to the chiseled, brooding leader of an entire generation. Soundgarden was all he'd ever known. And now, as he approached his mid-thirties, for the first time in his musical life, he found himself alone. The possibilities that lay in front of him were as terrifying as they were exhilarating. In Soundgarden, there was always a lot of loyalty and camaraderie, the feeling of us against the world. Chris said in 1999, We supported each other. We could make mistakes. We could do amazing things. The gang mentality, that's what I lost. But what I gained is absolute freedom. In the immediate aftermath of Soundgarden's demise, Chris kept a low profile. He stayed at home, visited his cabin, played around with his dogs, and considered what he wanted to do next. While he wasn't certain about what his next musical project might sound like, he was absolutely against the idea of jumping into a band, despite several interesting offers. More than anything, he wanted to take charge of his destiny, revisit old song ideas, and flesh out demos and discarded tracks with an eye toward making a solo record. Before he could truly dive into that project, however, an opportunity fell into his lap that piqued his interest. In 1997, Mexican filmmaker Alfonso Cuaron was in the midst of adapting Charles Dickens's 1861 novel, Great Expectations, into a feature film starring Gwyneth Paltrow, Ethan Hawke, and Robert De Niro. For the soundtrack, the producers reached out to a variety of contemporary artists like Tori Amos, Pulp, and Stone Temple Pilots frontman Scott Weiland, who all contributed pieces of music. Another name they hoped to add to the final track list was Chris Cornell. Chris had enjoyed working on songs like Seasons for Singles five years back, and the Great Expectations project seemed like the perfect chance to dive back into the world of cinema. He wrote a tender ballad called Sweet Sun Shower that was about as stylistically far removed from Soundgarden as it gets. Nevertheless, he was having a hard time finishing it, so he called his old friend, Alan Johannes, for help. Chris first heard about Johannes back in the 80s when Kim Thiel, who was still working as a DJ for KCMU, brought in a pre-release copy of an album by Johannes' band, What Is This?, to a Soundgarden rehearsal. The group featured Johannes on vocals and future Red Hot Chili Peppers member Jack Irons and Hillel Slovak on drums and guitar respectively. They petered out shortly after 1985, but Chris never forgot the impression it made on him. Then one day in 1991, he heard a voice from the other room that sounded a hell of a lot like What Is This on television. He rushed in just in time to catch Eleven's latest video on MTV. He quickly became a fan. Eleven eventually hit the road supporting Soundgarden on several tours throughout the 90s, and Chris, Johannes, and Eleven's other musical half, Johannes' partner, Natasha Schneider, grew increasingly close. Chris was calling all the time, Johannes said in that period, just after Soundgarden disbanded. He basically came over and stayed with us at the house just to kind of decompress. Johannes and Schneider's home, an inviting 1932 construction with Frank Lloyd Wright designed windows, a wealth of skylights, and a large coat of arms that hung over the fireplace, was a welcome sanctuary far from Seattle, where he could work on the Great Expectations' song in peace. After tweaking the track for a bit and dropping Sweet from its title, Sun Shower was finally finished, 
and ready for its big screen debut. Great Expectations hit theaters in January 1998, signaling the arrival of Chris Cornell as a solo artist. Meanwhile, his work with Eleven continued. After finishing Sun Shower, Chris laid down some aching vocals for the duo's rendition of Schubert's immortal 1825 composition Ave Maria for the Benefit compilation, A Very Special Christmas Three. They also recorded a song called Heart of Honey for the unreleased animated film Titan A.E. before moving on to work on a song called Someone to Die For that was in contention for the theme song for the next James Bond movie. It was going to be in the Bond film Tomorrow Never Dies, Johannes said. In the end, there was a fight between the label and Bond series producers, the Broccoli's. Eventually, Jim Necco sang it with Brian May. Someone to Die For ended up on the Spider-Man 2 soundtrack instead. While the movie themes and compilation songs were a fun distraction, Chris was still trying hard to conceptualize what the first album released under his own name would sound like. He'd abandoned the idea of polishing off unreleased older cuts from his archive and began writing new material. For hours, he sat down in his basement, strumming a Telecaster or one of his acoustic guitars, waiting for inspiration to strike. When cabin fever set in, he rented a place near Elliott Avenue, not far from where Soundgarden played their first show at Top of the Court, and set up a makeshift studio where he recorded a litany of fresh demos. Originally, his plan was to work with French-Canadian producer Daniel Lenoir, who was renowned for his work with U2 on their era-defining masterpiece, The Joshua Tree, as well as their engrossing follow-up, Octung Baby. Lanois was also a close collaborator of Bob Dylan's and helped the Nobel Prize-winning singer-songwriter realize one of his most critically beloved albums, Time Out of Mind. Lanois ultimately backed out of the project. I think he realized that with the kind of songs I was writing, he wouldn't be able to influence the record enough, Chris said. He does atmospheric, spherical kind of treatments, and that means the music has to be really straightforward. Three chords, open, unstructured. My songs weren't like that. Rather than bring another hotshot producer onto the project, Chris decided to keep working with Alan Johannes and Natasha Schneider. He's sitting at her house like, what the fuck am I going to do now? And Natasha goes, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to fucking start recording your record, Johannes recalled. Eleven had recently received a $200,000 advance from A&M to work on their fourth album, Avant-Garde Dog. But instead of pouring it into outside studio fees and gear rentals, they built a world-class recording setup inside their own home. Work on Chris Cornell's debut album began on the 4th of July, 1998. Just like his last few releases with Soundgarden, Chris maintained a deliberate pace when it came to recording. He'd come and go over a period of seven months, Johannes said. Chris typically spent a couple of weeks down in West Hollywood, cooking up new arrangements and laying down vocals. Then he would fly back to Seattle to dream up new ideas. It was pretty much a big secret, the guitarist added. He was just like this cool party hang. We'd go out to dinner, then work until 2 a.m. Then the next day we'd say, nah, I don't feel like working, and go to the movies, or we'd go to the beach. It was creatively fulfilling, tense, and focused, but also really fun. There wasn't any pressure or anybody looking over our shoulder. A key factor that contributed to the lengthy process was Chris's drinking. He simply had a hard time getting himself in the right frame of mind to make music. That was at my worst during Euphoria Morning, he told Lollipop Magazine. It was the lowest point. I was doing really badly. It took me six times longer than usual to finish that record. I wasn't writing under the influence. I've never been able to do that. But most of the time, it would take me entire days just to get over a hangover or something to be able to work. When I was in the studio for Preaching the End of the World, I literally spent more than half a day just waiting for this terrible headache to go away. The title of his first solo album, Euphoria Morning, originated with one of the record's central songs, a sparse acoustic ballad called Sweet Euphoria. Originally, he wanted to spell it Euphoria Morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, but was talked out of it. The name was always something that irked him. 
Someone reviewing the record said that the title sounded like a potpourri scent. And when I read that, I was just like, fuck, fucking bullshit, Chris said. Years later, when he reissued the album, he made sure that Euphoria Morning got its much-missed you back. If there was a single guiding principle that informed his decisions during this time, it was a desire to push his sound as far away from Soundgarden as he possibly could. Euphoria Morning is quieter and brighter than anything he'd released up to that point, and as he thought about how he wanted the music to feel, he kept returning to unexpected sources of inspiration, like Ray Charles and Otis Redding. He wasn't so much interested in recreating the musical style of Georgia on my mind or sitting on the dock of the bay. But as he wrote new material, he thought a lot about the way those singers used their voices to evoke distinct feelings. He wanted to create more space to show off the complexity of his greatest instrument. Chris had developed a keen instinct for how and when to deploy that instrument for maximum effect. At one point during a break from recording, the three musicians were dining out when Chris felt an overwhelming urge to lay down vocals to a song called When I'm Down. They abruptly asked for the check, raced back to the house, and got the vocal locked in after just two takes. Usually he'd go into one of the towel rooms and he'd take a cigarette or maybe a glass of red wine or maybe some tea, and he'd just sit there. Then he'd sing it all the way through, Johannes said. Then he'd take a little break, you'd see him thinking and feeling his way through it and we'd just be sitting in the control room waiting for him to say, okay, it might be five minutes, it might be ten minutes, it might be one minute, before going into another take. Songs like The Glistening Moonchild, which he wrote for Susan Silver, Preaching the End of the World, Disappearing One, and one of the only holdovers from an earlier era, the Poncier tape cut Flutter Girl, were constructed in such a way that the focus was always Chris's ever-shifting voice. These were largely tender compositions that dealt with his thoughts and feelings on a wide variety of subjects. It was paramount that each had its own vibe. If you listen closely to each song and the texture of his voice, each one is its own world, Johannes added. It wasn't like he was getting into character per se, but he just had this instinct and you could feel him searching to find it. And when he got there, he just did it so effortlessly. One of the more touching entries on Euphoria Morning is a funky Wawa painted elegy called Wave Goodbye. Chris wrote the song shortly after Jeff Buckley drowned in the Mississippi River on May 29, 1997. At the request of Buckley's mother, Chris performed Wave Goodbye at Buckley's private memorial service in New York. The song, a nakedly despondent account of what it feels like to lose someone too soon, gave Chris pause before he ultimately included it on Euphoria Morning. The feelings were too real, and the topic so close to him that he felt wary about sharing it with the public. In the several years prior to Buckley's death, the two singers, perhaps the two most naturally gifted vocalists of their generation, bonded over their shared talents, frustrations, successes, and travails. It's pretty rare to be able to call someone up on the phone and explain what you're going through as a songwriter or a singer or a bandmate and what you are going through with the music industry and have somebody totally understand everything you are talking about, Chris told Guitar One. I think that was the main part of our relationship. We were on some sort of common ground. The loss was devastating. Chris lent a hand to the curation of the posthumous Buckley Collection, Sketches for My Sweetheart the Drunk, where he was credited as Il Dottore di Musica, or Music Doctor. Buckley's mother was so touched by Chris's involvement with the project that when it was finished, she gave him one of her son's guitars, a 12-string Rickenbacker 360. She also gifted Chris Buckley's red telephone, an item he treasured for the rest of his life. While Chris, Johannes, and Schneider were able to handle many of the musical duties themselves, they still needed a drummer. Josh Fries, one of the best session drummers in the world who logged credits with Nine Inch Nails, Devo, The Replacements, and Guns N' Roses, handled most of the percussive duties on the album. When he wasn't available, Greg Upchurch, Victor and Drizzo, and Bill Rieflin were all brought in to play drums as well. But for one song in particular... 
disappearing one. Chris wasn't getting the right sound he was looking for, and he turned to an old friend for help. In the time since Soundgarden had disbanded, Matt Cameron had become the permanent drummer in Pearl Jam. He just happened to be in Los Angeles with the rest of his new group when he called Chris to see if he wanted to go out to dinner. The singer was down to break bread with Cameron, but first he asked if he wouldn't mind stopping by the studio to see if he might be able to help him finish disappearing one. The drummer arrived and, within an hour, managed to listen to the song, get a feel for what it needed, and lay down the finished take on the record. With twelve completed tracks, Chris felt ready to release Euphoria Morning. But as he was gearing up to share his first solo endeavor, the music industry was in a state of tremendous flux. A new peer-to-peer file-sharing software program called Napster had emerged in June 1999 and was beginning to siphon off CD sales from the big record companies. At the time, A&M, Chris's home for nearly a decade, was purchased by Interscope Records. Suddenly, he found himself at the mercy of a new set of corporate masters, largely unfamiliar to him. A&M had meant so much to him that on the label's final day of existence, he visited their offices one last time to say goodbye to many of the folks who had worked tirelessly behind the scenes to help make Soundgarden a worldwide phenomenon. The biggest change of all was on the management side. For the first time in Chris Cornell's creative life, Susan Silver wasn't the primary guiding force pushing his latest project. While she remained involved, Jim Garineau took over running the day-to-day operations of the singer's business affairs. The couple decided for the sake of their relationship that Silver should take a step back as they worked together to start a family. Almost everything surrounding the release of Euphoria Morning would be wildly different from anything Chris had ever experienced before. The propulsive opening track, Can't Change Me, was the first single released from the record in the early months of 1999. He also recorded a French version of the song for international release. The song did well and peaked at number five on the mainstream rock charts. It also nabbed him a Grammy nomination for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance, though the prize ultimately went to Lenny Kravitz for his take on the Guess Who's American Woman. Several months later, on September 21st, 1999, the full album hit stores. Despite the heavy anticipation to hear what Chris Cornell sounded like on his own, sales were modest. Euphoria Morning debuted at number 18 on the Billboard album chart, and in the ensuing weeks slowly slid down the rankings. I don't feel that was a record made for mass consumption, Chris said years later. My chief goal on that record was to make something that didn't sound like anything I'd done before. The same month Euphoria Morning dropped, Chris launched his first solo tour, backed by Johannes and Schneider, along with Rick Markman on bass and Greg Upchurch on drums. The run began with a performance at the Sanders Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts, on September 13, 1999. It wasn't technically the first solo concert of his career. That distinction had come many years earlier, when Soundgarden was still around and he performed an hour-long local gig playing a 12-string guitar with Scott Sundquist on percussion and Matt Cameron on backup guitar. The stakes were much higher now. So were his nerves, especially when he heard a rowdy, hard-rock-loving fan wearing a Soundgarden T-shirt, causing a ruckus in the front row. Emerging in tight black jeans, black T-shirt, and his hair slicked down and parted across the center of his forehead, Chris dove headlong into much of the material from his new album, peppering the hour-long set with selections from his career like Seasons and the Temple of the Dog Deep Cut, All Night Thing. He performed only one Soundgarden song that night, Like Suicide. I remember playing my first gig in Boston. I walked out, started playing the first song, and nobody shot me, he told Rolling Stone. And the rowdy Soundgarden fan in the front row that caused him so much concern... He jumped up towards the end of the first song and shouted, All right, fuck yeah! I guess he just decided he liked it and went with it. After a quick sprint through theaters across America, Chris and his band flew to Europe and barnstormed their way across the continent, beginning in Manchester, England in October and ending in Copenhagen, Denmark by November. While the show kept the packed theaters wrapped, 
Some of the more memorable moments took place behind the scenes. I remember him climbing around the outside of a hotel in Paris, going from room to room, knocking on the windows, Johannes recalled. He's hanging outside our window balcony like, Hey, how's your mini bar? You got any champagne in there? Then he takes it and goes, All right, I'll see you guys later, and goes back out the window again. I guess he went to our drummer's room after. Shortly after the European run, Chris notched his first appearance on Late Show with David Letterman on November 15th, 1999, performing the song Can't Change Me. Two months later, he played The Tonight Show for the first time, busting out Euphoria Morning's second single, Preaching the End of the World. A new North American leg of the tour kept him on the road until March 3rd, 2000, and a final very loose gig at the House of Blues in Las Vegas, at the end of which Chris joked, We're going to go out and beat this house and every house in this town, and we're going to walk home with truckloads of money. Then he added, Actually, don't bet. Don't give these fucking people your money. Fuck them. By now, Chris had something far more important than music taking up much of his attention. During the winter, he announced to the world that his wife Susan was pregnant with their first child. Lillian Jean Cornell was born on June 28, 2000. She was named after Susan's mother, Jean Lillian Silver. After becoming a first-time father, Chris laid low to spend time with his burgeoning family and decompress from the months spent far from home. When they start to become a person, these babies, you just can't imagine or remember life without them. Chris told CMJ in 2003, I'm doing the typical dad stuff, pushing the baby in a stroller at Disneyland and having to drive slower because your baby's in the car. For the speed-loving adrenaline junkie that Chris was, trying to remember to cruise below posted speed limits remained a bit of a challenge. Just three years after ending Soundgarden, Chris Cornell was again at a crossroads. The sheer number of paths he could walk down in the coming months and years was almost too numerous to contemplate. Another new solo album? More soundtrack work? There was even talk of forming a new group with Johannes Schneider and Matt Cameron. Then, a totally surprising opportunity came knocking at his door. Chapter 12. Set it off. Seven stories above the pavement, the inky black shadows of Chris Cornell watches a Chevy CK truck motoring his way. He hardly moves a muscle as a row of floodlights guide the pickup toward the immense scaffolded structure that is his domain. Three men hop out of the vehicle. The first is shirtless, his long dark hair just touching his shoulders. Brad Wilk. The second is also shirtless, an immense black tattoo plastered across his back. His blonde hair twisted into a pair of pippy long stocking braids. Timothy Comerford. The third figure is decked out in a green jacket, his head covered by a black brimmed hat. Tom Morello. Together, the trio piles into an industrial elevator, smashes a button, and begins their journey upward. As the cables pull them towards the heavens, one floor flying past another, a spastic, stuttering guitar electrifies the air. The sound mingles with the low rumble of bass and morphs into a tidal wave of noise. High above them, the silhouette of Chris's blonde highlighted hair sways in time to the boom-boom whack of the beat. Volume swells until the elevator clicks into place and the red cage door swings open. The three men rush to their instruments, joining their silent brother who's been patiently awaiting their arrival. Off in the distance is the dark outline of the Sepulveda Dam. On cue, the simmering cacophony detonates into an atomic guitar riff. Chris leaps high into the air before slamming his boots down onto the swaying platform as an explosion of red fireworks rips the sky open behind him. A colorful, unceasing parabola of flame arcs across the stars as the foursome plow into their savage composition. The inferno rages so close that the spent mortar rounds ping off Wilk's cymbals and leave burn marks on the drummer's back. They call this molten tsunami of music Cochise, and it sounds as ferocious as anything Chris Cornell has sung since Jesus Christ pose. Not far from the scene of this controlled mayhem rests one of the most densely clogged freeway arteries in the U.S., the intersection in Los Angeles where Highway 101 meets I-405. Drivers slow to a crawl to gaze at the distant chaos, 
grinding the already molasses-thick sea of cars, trucks, and limousines to a standstill. The local police and news station literally received thousands of calls from people who thought the city was under siege, Morello told MTV, like someone had decided to attack and the target was going to be the San Fernando Valley. Coming just a few weeks after the one-year anniversary of 9-11, the anxiety the spectacle produces among the locals is all too real. Epic Records didn't spare a cent for this music video. It was critical to give their new act the most explosive coming-out party they could conceive. To the powers that be, these four guys were primed to take over the genre. The $700,000 it cost to shoot them over two nights was a drop in the bucket, compared to what they stood to recoup. It was never a given that Chris Cornell would make it to this moment. In fact, the odds were far greater that he wouldn't. So much had gone down since the first time he'd jammed with this ferocious trio. Jam sessions, recording sessions, breakups, makeups, firings, hirings, personal upheaval, and a brush with death. And yet, somehow, here they were, still standing. In Chris's case, standing and screaming with a fevered intensity matched only by the constant shower of fire bellowing at their backs. If the scene seemed surreal to rubberneckers, it was all the more mind-bending to the man at the heart of it all. There was that quick moment where I looked back and see rage against the machine, Chris told David Frick. It's like, whoa, this is like a weird video game. Like I'm playing Guitar Hero. A massive detonation brings the song to a close. Even though his soul power Stratocaster is dangling around Tom Morello's waist, Chris wraps the guitarist up in a bear hug. Wilk and Comerford amble over and join the embrace. They are no longer three-fourths of Rage Against the Machine and the singer from Soundgarden. They are a band, as super a super group as it gets in the new millennium. They call themselves Audio Slave. The person who deserves the lion's share of the credit for sensing Audio Slave's potential was Rick Rubin. The legendary Zen producer had the foresight to understand that if you matched Tom Morello's riffs and the locked-in rhythm of Brad Wilk and Timothy Comerford, with the pen, face, and voice of Christopher John Cornell, you could make some especially devastating rock music. The genesis of Audio Slave began with the demise of Rage Against the Machine in 2000. After nine years of making some of the most innovative, lacerating, and loud albums of the decade, multi-platinum masterstrokes like Evil Empire and The Battle of Los Angeles, The politically conscious rap metal hybrid imploded amid a litany of personal resentments and a seemingly impossible to navigate decision-making process. Frontman Zach De La Rocha had had enough. A little over a month before their split, Timothy Comerford made headlines by scaling a gigantic set piece during the MTV Video Music Awards after Rage lost the Best Rock Video Award to Limp Bizkit. The stunt landed the bassist in jail, but he remained unrepentant. We were up against Limp Biscuit, one of the dumbest bands in the history of music, he told radio host Dan LeBatard years later. Comerford couldn't stand the thought of losing to a video director by that band's leader, Fred Durst, when he felt that their own clip for Sleep Now in the Fire, directed by esteemed documentarian Michael Moore, was artistically superior. He noticed that MTV's cameras gravitated toward the winners before they were announced, and so he turned to Moore and said, Hey man, if that camera doesn't come over here, I'm climbing up that structure and I'm going to sit there like a fucking gargoyle and throw a wrench in this show. And he's like, Tim, follow your heart. On October 18th, De La Rocha put out a statement announcing his decision to leave Rage Against the Machine. It is no longer meeting the aspirations of all four of us collectively as a band. And from my perspective, has undermined our artistic and political ideal. The remaining members quickly followed with a statement of their own. We are committed to continuing with our efforts to affect change in the social and political arena and look forward to creating more groundbreaking music for our fans, they declared. We'll keep it loud, keep it funky, and most definitely, rock on. The United Trio was an eclectic group. Brad Wilk and guitarist Tom Morello grew up around Chicago and had known each other a long time. The pair had played together early on when the drummer tried out for Morello's band, Lockup. 
Morello ended up picking someone else. But when Rage was getting off the ground and in need of a drummer, Morello pulled Wilk into the project. Born in Harlem, New York on May 30th, 1964, barely two months before Cornell, Tom Morello spent his adolescence in Libertyville, Illinois, about 90 minutes north up I-294 from where Kim Thile and Hiro Yamamoto attended high school in Park Forest. His mother, Mary Morello, was a schoolteacher with a master's degree from Loyola University, while his father, Ngete Niharohe, was Kenya's first ambassador to the United Nations. From a young age, Morello was politically engaged, advocating for a variety of anarchist and progressive causes. After graduating high school, he attended Harvard, where he earned a bachelor's degree in political science in 1986. After that, he moved to Los Angeles and attempted to realize his musical dreams while working a variety of menial jobs, including a brief stint as a male stripper. Like Thile, Morello was inspired to start playing guitar after hearing Kiss and Black Sabbath. Though he also mixed in a lot of Public Enemy and Iron Maiden, one of the first bands he formed was called The Electric Sheep and featured his old friend and high school classmate Adam Jones on bass. Jones later abandoned the bass in favor of the guitar and formed the legendary prog metal band Tool. In 1991, Morello met Zach De La Rocha. Shortly thereafter, they formed Rage Against the Machine. Tim Comerford came in to play bass through his connection to his old buddy Zach. Comerford was four years younger than Morello and had grown up around Southern California. He had met De La Rocha in elementary school. Like Chris, he enjoyed the outdoors and had an affinity for mountain biking. His father was an aerospace engineer who worked on NASA's space shuttle program and on the Apollo missions. Years later, Comerford actually got into it with Buzz Aldrin at a movie premiere, where he peppered the second man to land on the moon with questions about the veracity of the mission's existence. He came away from their debate, unconvinced. Over the next decade, Rage Against the Machine burnished their reputation as one of the most passionate and unpredictable bands on the planet. Songs like Killing in the Name, Bulls on Parade, and Guerrilla Radio became anthems to a generation eagerly seeking an avatar to express their own fury at the gilded hands guiding the ship of capitalism. Their chaotic live shows became legend, sometimes for the wrong reasons like the quickly scuttled tour with Wu-Tang Clan in 1997, or the riot-marred disaster that was Woodstock 99. Mayhem seemed to follow the band wherever they went. Following De La Roche's departure, Morello, Wilk, and Comerford gathered together at Rubin's home to consider who on earth had the skills and charisma to front them. Rubin had just produced the band's most recent album, a covers project titled Renegades, and was invested in figuring out a way forward. The four men ran through dozens of names, singers, and rappers alike, quickly dismissing them one by one. Then came Ruben's light bulb moment. While they were hashing things out, the producer threw on Soundgarden's monolithic stomper, Slaves and Bulldozers. Chris's signature wail filled the room. We all looked at each other and unanimously exclaimed, That's the fucking guy! Morello remembered. When Rage Against the Machine was first starting out, there were two albums used as aesthetic guideposts. The first was Cypress Hill's 1991 self-titled debut. The other was Soundgarden's Bad Motorfinger. Who better to bring in than the guy who helped influence their sound? Chris had crossed paths with Rage a few times. They met on the Lollapalooza tour in 1996, and at one point Chris and Morello talked about working on some things together. Nothing came of it, but now the guitarist was riding alongside Rick Rubin, driving the hour and a half north from Hollywood to Chris's house in Ojai to make their pitch. They reached the singer's Spanish-style abode around dusk, walked past several motorcycles parked out front, and toward the gilded front door. As they approached, the door seemed to open by itself. Rubin was at once freaked and suggested they bail. But before they could leave, Chris glided into view and cordially invited them inside. Chris was reluctant upon hearing their idea. He'd been a part of a group for a dozen years and was more than familiar with how dysfunctional the inner workings of a band could be. Euphoria Morning hadn't set the charts on fire, 
but there was something rewarding about releasing music under his own name. And it wasn't like he'd be joining up with any old band here either. Rage Against the Machine was infamous for sparking chaos wherever they went. This was the band that tried to invade the New York Stock Exchange in January 2000, then sparked a riot outside of the Democratic National Convention just eight months later. This was a band who palled around with honest-to-God guerrilla warriors, the Zapatista Army of National Liberation in Chiapas, Mexico. The prospects of jumping into any regular old band were already fraught. The chances for calamity that came from fronting rage against the machine were incalculable. Chris was also aware that if he signed up, he'd be the new guy entering a long-established power dynamic. That's not to mention the army of rage and Soundgarden fans who might immediately be inclined to resent their new musical partnership merely by dint of the fact that it didn't look or sound like the groups they had fallen in love with. Or the fact that rock audiences and critics alike have a long history of expressing disdain for seemingly manufactured supergroups looking to cash in on their collective fame without offering much in the way of musical substance. To go along in this particular ride could be a career-killing decision. Then again, it could also be extremely creatively and commercially fulfilling, too. There was much to consider. What the Rage Against the Machine guys didn't realize as their excitement built over the mere possibility of making music with Chris Cornell was that the singer was in the midst of one of the lowest points of his life, made especially dire by a burgeoning addiction to prescription opioids, specifically the painkiller OxyContin. It was mentally, physically, and spiritually a fucked up point in my life, Chris told Spin. I was waking up and drinking a glass of vodka just to get a dial tone. My marriage wasn't working at all, and rather than face that, I turned to constant inebriation and then drugs. With not a whole lot to do after the end of the Euphoria morning tour, Chris started consuming more and more OxyContin. He also dabbled with Valium, cocaine, and, on at least one occasion, crystal meth. The thing is, when you pick up the pipe for the first time, you don't know that that's your fate, he said years later. And then that was it. I didn't want to care anymore. As the 21st century began, Chris was still trying to figure out what to do next. He was writing songs, presumably for another solo album. But the more he thought about working with Morello, Comerford, and Wilk, the more attractive the idea seemed. By April 2001, he decided they should get in a room together to see if there was any chemistry between the four of them. They met in a space in Hollywood, chatted for a bit, then picked up their instruments and played. Right off the bat, I felt like the missing spark plug was put in, and suddenly we were firing on all pistons, Brad Wilk told Modern Drummer. Chris is one of my favorite vocalists, and all of a sudden he was in the room. It was an awesome feeling. The funky, bombastic riffs cooked up by Morello, paired with the propulsive rhythm produced by Wilk and Comerford blended perfectly with Chris's sometimes savage, sometimes menacing voice. I think I was actually kind of cocky, Chris recalled of that first jam session. Not cocky like I'm better than you, but just very confident in the fact that I could stand in front of a microphone and sing and people in the room were going to think it's good. Before long, they had the seeds of their first song. It was eventually titled Light My Way, a hard-hitting wah-wah-painted pile driver where Chris alternates between smoldering crooner and maniacal screamer, slicing through the sonic torrent that serves as the track's atomic chorus. Over the next 19 days, the foursome reassembled multiple times to feel each other out, test their limits, and share ideas. For Chris, the sheer amount of creativity exploding all around him was gobsmacking. We wrote songs so fast that sometimes we'd have to go back to like a rehearsal tape from a week before to remember what it was. By the end of their three-week testing period, they had 21 songs stitched together. For the former members of Rage Against the Machine, the prolific clip of creation was a welcome breath of fresh air after so many years struggling with their former frontman to scrounge together enough material to fill a single album. Every day was really pretty thrilling just to drive down to rehearsal, Morello said. It was the newest, greatest thing we'd ever done and it also felt like we'd been playing together for ten years. 
Light My Way was just the tip of the iceberg. Almost immediately after putting that track together, they cooked up another pair of winners. The first, titled Exploder, boils over with as much fury as its name suggests, while another, Bring Em Back Alive, chugs along like a 40,000-ton freight train barreling straight to hell. It was clear to Chris that whatever this was, he was excited enough to throw himself into it with everything he had. His plans for a second solo record were dropped as he pushed all his chips in to record with the remaining Rage Triumvirate. He did have some conditions, however, before they made their union official. First, he didn't want to write political lyrics. Throughout his career, Chris had largely written intensely self-reflective and sometimes esoteric words for his varied soundscapes. He had no intention of changing that now, especially seeing as how doing so would invite unwelcome comparisons to Zack De La Rocha. Second, he wanted to leave most, if not all, of the guitar duties to Tom Morello. I refused to play guitar in Audio Slave because that didn't make sense to me, he said. Singing to somebody else's music would, to me, would make it easier for it to be further away from anything that would sound like Soundgarden. Finally, he didn't want this new project to be Chris Cornell Front's Rage Against the Machine. If they were going to be a band, they were going to be an entirely new thing, a complete break away from their collective pasts. The other three readily agreed. Near the beginning of June 2001, the new group met with Rick Rubin at Cello Studios, just off Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, to begin work on their first album. Over the next two months, the band locked themselves inside the large wood-adorned room in Studio Two and carefully honed their abrasive collection of material. Among the immortal albums that had been created within those walls are the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds, Crosby, Stills & Nash's self-titled debut, The Stooges' Raw Power, and Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On. Chris and his new band wanted to leave their own mark. Reuben wasn't an unrelenting taskmaster, but he did like to explore every possibility before committing to a specific direction. Sometimes they worked through 30 or 40 takes of a song, making slight adjustments along the way. No idea was too absurd to attempt. Whether that meant playing the verse as a chorus, reformatting the bridge into a verse, or playing in a different key... The first piece they tackled was the slow, simmering ballad ultimately called Getaway Car. The band set up in the large room while Chris was ensconced in an isolation booth. All the hair stood up on the back of my neck when he started to sing, engineer Dave Schiffman recalled. He was still tinkering with lyrics at that point because there were times where it was just him mumbling or rambling and the lyrics weren't quite there yet. But it still sounded great. He'd have the melody nailed. It was just a matter of getting the words to fit. Chris's house in Ojai was an hour and a half drive from the studio, which meant three hours of his day was spent in Los Angeles traffic. It's no wonder so many of the songs on Audio Slave's debut have automotive motifs. Getaway car, certainly. But also the apocalyptic barn burner gasoline. And most notable of all, I Am the Highway. Opening with a quick reference to the pearls and swine from Jesus Christ's sermon on the mount from Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Chris reflects on his decision to move forward by setting fire to his past and getting on by himself. I am not your carpet ride, he cries. I am the sky. The song is a clarion call for anyone chasing freedom. A breathtaking meditation made all the more poignant by Tom Morello's pristine chords and a twinkling solo that feels like the sonic equivalent of hope. That song's genesis was indicative of the creative electricity flowing between Morello and Cornell during those early rehearsals. The guitarist already had the progression for I Am The Highway, but was worried that it sounded too gentle given the heavy territory they were treading. During one rehearsal, he strummed the chords, hoping that somebody would be inspired by them. Chris ambled over to get a better sense of what Morella was playing. The next day, they returned to the studio and fleshed the song out as a band. I Am the Highway was far from the first or last time Chris invoked shades of religious imagery into his music. It wasn't even the most acute example on this project. Like a Stone takes the cake on that account. 
opening with a simple drum pattern and some delayed single notes from Morello. Chris slinks his way into the song, sedately singing about cobwebs, freeways, and a book full of death. There's a creepy vibe to the intro that's shattered the instant he breaks into the chorus, soaring over Morello's crashing chords, then diving headlong into the morass of the instrumental. In the next verse, he's on his deathbed, praying to gods and angels, waiting to be taken to heaven. The sky was bruised, he observes. The wine was bled, and there you led me on. It's a song about concentrating on the afterlife you would hope for, rather than the normal monotheistic approach, he said. You work really hard all your life to be a good person and a moral person, and fair and generous, and then you go to hell anyway. The openness, the inner turmoil, and the darkness that lies at its heart, along with the stunning arrangement, featuring one of the more touching and melodic solos Morello ever conjured out of his Telecaster, made it the most emotionally impactful song on the record. On the other hand, Cochise works a blissfully unnuanced sledgehammer to the solar plexus. The origins of the song date back to the mid-90s, to Tom Morello's side project, The Weatherman, a duo that he put together with Chicago punk rocker Vic Bondi. You can hear an embryonic version of the distinctive Cochise riff throughout the frenetic lo-fi punk track that the pair cooked up called Anola Gay. Once Chris and the rest of the Rage guys got their hands on Morello's riff, however, they transformed it into one of the most awe-inspiring rock songs of the decade. Incredibly, Chris recorded his speaker-shredding vocals on Cochise, along with most of the songs on this record, while sitting in a chair. He often sang along with the band while they were tracking songs in the studio together. But most of the finished vocal takes were completed later in Seattle, with the help of another engineer, the legendary Andrew Sheps. It was astonishing because the thing about Chris is that it sounds like he's yelling at the top of his lungs all the time, but he's actually a quiet singer, the engineer remembered. He didn't have to stand up and belt, which is why I think he could sing all day. Even for someone like Sheps, who has worked with some of the most widely heralded vocalists of all time, including Adele, Beyonce, Michael Jackson, and Bono, there was something astounding about the way Chris approached singing. You'd realize he was in a zone, he said. When he was singing, he'd be inside it, super inside of it. It wasn't like he'd sing a sad song and then at the end make a joke and go, all right, let's do it again. He would stay in it. Chris was also a harsh critic, mostly of himself. He was always paying attention, Sheps added, and he would never let anything go that he wasn't into. There was never a moment where you thought, well, maybe that's good enough. There was no such thing as good enough. Cochise went by a couple of different names before it received its final moniker. While they were working on it in the studio, it was referred to as Shifty's Revenge, an inside joke referring to their engineer, Dave Schiffman. For a while, they considered calling it Save Yourself, a straightaway grab from the song's chorus. Finally, they decided to name it after the Apache War Chief Cochise, who frequently attacked U.S. forces throughout the Southwest in the 1860s. The name matched the song perfectly, defiant, angry, and unrepentant. While the atmosphere in the studio remained congenial, especially in those early weeks. The four musicians had yet to coalesce into a real band. Chris really kind of kept it to himself, Schiffman remembered. There was a refrigerator filled with Mickey's largemouth beers, and he'd sit in the lounge and have a beer or two. He'd be more quiet some days than others. He'd come in, and you could tell he was in a good mood, and he was friendly, and he'd joke around with everybody. He was present. And then there were days where he wasn't. He was a little off and kind of distant. Everybody kind of gave him his space. Nobody would go, hey, come on, Chris, what the fuck? He was just like, all right, let him do his thing. There would be some days where he'd be like, you know what, I'm just not feeling it today. And he'd leave. He'd go wherever he went, and we'd just keep working. The biggest divide that still remained between Chris and the other three guys was the fact that they had different management teams. Chris was still represented by Jim Guerno, while the Rage guys were managed by Peter Mensch and Cliff Bernstein at Q Prime. 
Over the next several months, the arrangement made it increasingly difficult to reach a consensus on seemingly anything, and was made all the more complicated by the fact that they were beholden to two different record labels, Epic and Interscope. For the most part, though, the four guys didn't let these concerns affect their daily interactions. There was still important work to be done and songs to finish. Most of the album was filled with scorching rock tracks, like Show Me How to Live, Light My Way, What You Are, and Set It Off, which was inspired by a riot that Chris envisioned in his mind after hearing their ferocious, jittery music for the first time. One of the album's underrated gems, a song that was surprisingly never released as a single, is the cinematic Shadow on the Sun. The riff was inspired by the chorus on the Commodore's Motown classic, Brick House. Shadow on the Sun is the kind of song that demands to be listened to at a decibel level commensurate with a jet taking off, and features one of the most blood-curdling screams that Chris ever committed to tape. Somehow he managed to summon forth a guttural wall of noise that sounds more animal than human. The song was used later to incredible effect in a pivotal scene in Michael Mann's L.A. Noir Collateral, starring Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx. The album wasn't all martial stacks and vicious screaming. There was a tender side as well. The aforementioned getaway car allowed the group to show off their bluesier sensibilities, while the final track on the album, The Last Remaining Light, stands as a monument of pent-up, slow-boiling fury. It's an intricate arrangement, touched up with jazzy guitar lines and sparse, snare-packed silences, before erupting into an avalanche of buzzing bass notes and emotional screaming. As the song came to its conclusion, Chris repeatedly cries out to the world, Light, until the album fades out. Chris didn't always have the clearest sense of what he wanted to sing, but still found ways to fill in the melody, usually by employing stand-in lyrics or nonsensical words. In the meantime, he continued to hone in on each song's central message, constantly scribbling words and lines in a notebook that he carried with him. He would get ideas together and be like, hey, I want to try this verse out. Could you throw me in to record? Schiffman remembered. While we were taking a lunch break, he'd be like, hey, I want to try this verse out. Then he'd run down the verse a couple times and I'd be like, oh, wow, that's great. And he's like, eh, I'm not sure about that last line. I got to work on that last line. He was always batting around ideas. And as we were tracking, he'd try out different approaches. While they had all the songs they needed to make a mark on the world, one thing they didn't have was a name. No one seemed to be taking the task seriously. At one point, they thought about calling themselves Shitstorm. At another, they considered going with Plato's surprise after Tom Morello drew a picture of the ancient philosopher exposing himself. Then there was the brief moment they thought about calling themselves After School Special, or ASS, in all caps, like KISS. Finally, Morello brought the name Civilian to the table, and everyone agreed it was a winner, until they discovered there was already another group out there by that name, so it was back to the drawing board. It was Chris who came up with Audio Slave. He said it popped into his head while poring over lists of names he'd put together. He pitched the moniker to everyone over their two-way beepers and got the thumbs up. Then they learned that a group in Liverpool, England was already performing as Audio Slave. Rather than try to come up with an alternative, they cut the UK band a check for $30,000 to assume the rights to the name. Audio Slave still hadn't announced their union to the public, but as they finished up in the studio, word of their collaboration became one of the music industry's worst-kept secrets. The group became official on March 20th, 2002, when the still-unnamed band was announced as one of the acts on the upcoming OzFest. The live run would keep them on the road from the beginning of July through September, joined by the likes of System of a Down, P.O.D., Rob Zombie, and the Prince of Darkness himself, Ozzy Osbourne. Their record wasn't even out yet, but heavy anticipation to hear what this unexpected alliance would sound like was growing. Then a few days after the tour announcement... Chris decided he wanted out. At the heart of his frustration was the double-headed managerial setup. I had a lot of personal crisis stuff going on, 
he told Classic Rock magazine. And a lot of what we talked about in terms of this being fun and uncomplicated started to become unfun and very much complicated by the two separate management camps. Chris returned to Seattle to collect himself and figure out what to do next. Just a few weeks later, however, Susan Silver received a dreadful phone call that put everything on hold. Silver had stepped back from managing Alice in Chains back in 1998 while she and Chris started a family, but she remained close with the band. On this day, she received a call informing her that no one could get in touch with Lane Staley. Silver called Staley's mother, who subsequently phoned the police. The authorities went out to the singer's apartment in the university district to do a welfare check. When no one answered the door, the cops kicked it in and found Staley's decomposing body on the couch. He'd been dead for two weeks, having overdosed on a heroin-cocaine concoction known as a speedball. By some cosmically macabre coincidence, Staley had passed on April 5th, eight years to the day Kurt Cobain had taken his own life. After receiving the devastating news, the remaining members of Alice in Chains, along with Susan and a bleached blonde Chris, gathered with dozens of friends and fans near the large international fountain, just under the Space Needle, to mourn his loss. Someone in attendance left a note scrawled on a paper bag near the fountain, echoing Chris's lyrics. There is only one thing left to say, the note read, say hello to heaven. A more formal service was held for Staley on April 28th on Bainbridge Island. Susan Silver delivered a speech, as did Jerry Cantrell. Barrett Martin, Staley's bandmate in Mad Season, delivered the eulogy, while Chris joined Anne and Nancy Wilson in a touching performance of the Rolling Stones' Wild Horses. While Chris continued to try to come to terms with Staley's passing, his audio slave bandmates were doing everything they could to stay in touch and offer support. Finally, about six weeks after he bailed, Chris decided to give the band another shot. The only catch was that he had to fire his manager, Jim Garano, and come to an agreement with the other three guys on who should represent them together going forward. It was hard business and a tough series of phone calls, but Chris went through with the move, parting ways with his longtime friend, when the dust settled, Audio Slave signed up with The Firm, headed by Jeff Quatinitz. The person who would handle their day-to-day -day affairs was a guy named Daniel Field, who had cut his teeth managing ministry. He had first met Chris on the Lollapalooza tour in 1992. Field had his work cut out for him. On May 17th, the raw files of Audio Slave's album leaked on the internet a full six months before the band was planning to release them. Tom Morello described the material that made it onto file-sharing spaces like LimeWire and Kazaa to MTV as inferior sketches of works in progress, which we had sent to a studio up in Seattle for Chris to listen to and work on. Someone at that studio helped themselves to a copy, and it then took about eight months to make its way to an Italian website. It was a disaster. The songs weren't anywhere near up to snuff. Brad Wilk could be heard counting everyone in with his sticks, and many of Chris's vocals were unfinished scratch takes. Even the names were wrong. Cochise was labeled Save Yourself. Like a Stone was called I'll Wait. I Am the Highway was called I Am Not. And Getaway Car was called Drive. The leak also included a brash rock track featuring a truly unhinged Morello solo, tentatively titled Turn to Gold, which never made it onto the official album and remains in the vaults. This was hardly the introduction that Chris and the rest of the band had hoped to make. There was nothing Audio Slave could do about the leak, other than to keep moving forward. Once their managerial issues were sorted, they had to then figure out a way to align their separate record deals. They worked out an arrangement where the band's first album would be released on Epic, while the second would go to Interscope. After that problem was dispatched, they moved on to the promotional stage. Field lined up a photo shoot with veteran rock photographer Danny Clinch to get some press pictures for the all-out media assault to come. When the day came for the shoot, the four guys convened at a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. It was clear to everyone that Chris wasn't in great shape. He kept nodding off. 
It was so bad that Chris would have his eyes closed, and Danny Clinch would go, one, two, three, and he'd open his eyes for a second, and Danny would take the photo. Field recalled. Despite their singer's alarming state, the group managed to grab some pictures in the hotel's old ballroom before moving to rooms on an upper floor to get some more intimate shots. Chris was so out of it, and then he sat in the window, and it looked like he was about to fall out. It was just super scary. I remember Tom Morello praying out loud because he was so worried that Chris was going to fall out the window, said Field. It was a total visual metaphor for what was going on. Chris's addiction to OxyContin had grown more severe over the previous several months. There were days when he didn't eat. His muscular frame grew wiry, and he claimed that his weight plummeted to a meager 145 pounds. Those closest to him grew concerned about his physical and mental state, but he didn't care. I was doubling and tripling up on depressants, Chris told Howard Stern. You don't know what's going on. You don't feel anything. Something needed to be done, and fast. Those three guys have really big hearts, and they were concerned about Chris, Field said about the others. I think beyond anything, they wanted him to be healthy and get better, even at the risk of losing a band they loved and music they'd worked hard on. They're like, let's figure out the right way to do it. The band got in touch with Bob Timmons, a well-respected addiction specialist who had a history of working with other high-profile rock bands like Aerosmith and Motley Crue. They decided to stage an intervention. The night before the intervention, however, Chris, who was staying at the Mondrian on Sunset, went missing. The reports we were getting were pretty bad, Field said. Owen Wilson saw him at some bar and texted like, Chris is out here and not looking good. Fortunately, Chris showed up the next day and met with Morello, Wilk, Comerford, Timmons, and Susan Silver who convinced him that it would be a good idea to spend some time in a rehabilitation facility. Chris agreed and checked into passages. Realizing how I was affecting people I cared about made a big difference, Chris said to Spin. The other three members of Audio Slave didn't know me that well, and when we started making the first record, I was pretty much at my worst. I felt a sense of sadness and fear in them that made me wake up. Passages had been founded the year before by a father and son duo named Chris and Pax Prentice. The former real estate investors spared little expense constructing their opulent seaside facility in Malibu. Featuring gorgeous vistas on the Pacific Ocean, rich mahogany doors, and a marble-adorned atrium, the environment was designed to be as relaxing and private as possible. It was me, a 35-year-old Seattle musician, and a bunch of billionaires' kids, he said. Billionaires are too smart to end up in rehab, but it's full of their kids. Passages eschewed the traditional 12-step process of recovery and relied on an intensive program of one-to-one -one counseling instead. At first, it was terrifying, Chris said. It was like being in 100-degree heat and diving into an ice-cold pool from a great height. I had a lot of fears about being around people I didn't know and talking about personal things in front of people who I wasn't sure if I could trust or not. Getting that all out of the way was a great thing for me. I treated it like someone might treat going to a health camp or a spiritual retreat. Because it was that for me. Shortly after Chris entered Passages, Richard Patrick, frontman for the band Filter, checked in. After spending the first couple of days getting clear and seeking therapy, Patrick, a staunch atheist, decided he'd had enough of the religious undertones that proliferated the program and decided he wanted to bail. Chris convinced him to stick it out. I was literally getting up to leave and he goes, listen, stay here, stay with me. Though he didn't know him on a personal level, Chris talked to Patrick about giving himself up to a higher power. Not God, necessarily but the power of a group of people urging him on to achieve sobriety. G.O.D., Patrick said. Group of drunks. Spurred by Chris's pep talk, he stayed in the program. My sense of ego was being told by an even bigger, stronger, more amazing, real legitimate rock star that wrote number one songs and played arenas. A real rock star was saying, this is the only deal in town that works. 
I've only got five days, and if you leave, it's really going to bum me out. I'm supposed to help the guy with four days. I heard him and said, I'm here for you? And he said, yeah. And I go, all right. Patrick has remained sober ever since. Chris remained in rehab for the full 30-day treatment. When his time was up, he decided to re-up for another 30. He was determined to stay sober. Outside the walls of passages, Audio Slave continued moving full steam ahead with hardly anyone the wiser about Chris's addiction troubles. The release date for the album was pushed to November, but there was still a lot of work to be done. Field even temporarily checked Chris out of rehab to film the band's video for Cochise and brought him back to the facility when it was over. The singer did press from inside passages, infamously revealing his whereabouts to a reporter from Metal Hammer while chatting on the facility's payphone. Simultaneously, Chris arrived at a monumental personal decision. After 17 years of partnership and 12 years of marriage, he no longer wanted to be with Susan Silver. A counselor at the facility convinced him it was necessary to maintain his sobriety once he returned to the outside world. He let Susan know his decision in late October. The split wasn't without acrimony, but by March 2004, their divorce was officially signed off on by a judge. After leaving rehab, Chris stayed at a variety of places around Los Angeles while focusing on his sobriety and the launch of Audio Slave's debut. Most of the time coming out of rehab, people have a destroyed life and struggle to just work again and get a job, he told the Mirror. I sort of had an identity sitting there waiting to be embraced. I was very lucky I was able to see that and not take it for granted. It helped me climb out of the mire. The project had ground on for over a year, and he and the rest of the band were more than ready to share the fruits of their labor. Cochise was released as a single on October 11th and was immediately embraced by FM Rock Radio. By the end of the year, the song had climbed all the way to number two on Billboard's mainstream rock chart. Before the band could sell their CD, however, they needed a cover photo. For the crucial task, they turned to one of the greatest album designers of all time, the Englishman named Storm Thorgerson, who gained fame for his covers of albums like Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon, Led Zeppelin's Houses of the Holy, and Paul McCartney and Wing's Band on the Run. For audio slave Thorgerson, with Peter Curzon and Rupert Truman, ventured out to Lazarote, in the distant Canary Islands, just off the coast of Morocco. Once there, they trained their cameras on the desolate, alien-looking landscape of Volcan El Cuervo, or the Crow's Volcano. A volcano, the artist thought, perfectly represented the menace that streaked across Audio Slave's music. In the middle of the finished cover sits a gigantic metal sculpture of a five-fingered flame with a rounded bottom, the eternal flame. To the left, seemingly for scale, a small finger in a red shirt gazes up at the towering golden statue. In an alternate version, the man was nude. On November 19, 2002, Audio Slave was released. Critics largely hated it. In his three-star review for Rolling Stone, writer Pat Blashill lambasted the band's efforts. Do Audio Slave rock? He asked. Sure. Is that enough? Well, no. Audio Slave just seems sort of engorged. A new upstart online publication called Pitchfork was even harsher, assigning the record a score of 1.7 out of 10. They savaged Chris's lyrics, and at one point called him an embarrassment. Their piece culminated with the line, Duck, because America's gonna vomit. At least Pitchfork didn't simply run a video of a monkey peeing into its own mouth, like they did in lieu of a written review of Jet's second album, Shine On. Fans disagreed with the critics and signaled their approval with their wallets. In its first week, Audio Slave sold 162,000 copies and debuted at number seven on the Billboard Top 200. The top three spots that week were taken by Shania Twain's pop country megaseller Up, the 11th entry into the Now That's What I Call Music compilation series, and Eminem's 8 Mile soundtrack. Later, when the Grammys rolled around, Audio Slave received a nomination for Best Rock Album, 
while Like a Stone got nominated for Best Hard Rock Performance. The band lost out on both prizes to Foo Fighters and Evanescence, respectively. Despite failing to crack the top five, Audio Slave had incredible staying power. And as the band rolled out new singles over the next five months, thousands of copies flew off the shelves each week. A CD-ROM version included a downloadable bonus track called Give, a rare political statement by Chris, castigating the rich who've got enough food on your table to give to those in need. The record was eventually certified as triple platinum for selling over three million copies. Just ten days after releasing Audio Slave, Chris and the band flew to New York to make their live debut in front of a televised audience. They were scheduled to appear on The Late Show with David Letterman. But as this was their first ever live performance, they were eager to do something special. Instead of performing inside of the Ed Sullivan Theater like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and Elvis Presley had, they would play their new songs on top of the building's marquee overlooking Broadway, one of Manhattan's busiest streets. For all the decades of music that had been showcased within the theater, Audio Slave would be the first band to play atop the marquee. The large platform overhanging the entryway was never intended to host a rock band. In order to get out onto it, Chris and the band had to crawl through a window, up a ladder, and onto the makeshift stage. Despite the chill in the late autumn air, when the time came to kick into their set, Chris stripped off his sweater, revealing a white tank top underneath. His formerly blonde hair was back to its natural shade of dark brown, and from his ears dangled two matching hoop earrings. They began with the explosive set it off, and then kicked into gasoline. The street below was clogged with police, firefighters, and rock fans. From the windows of the offices ringing the theater, business people set aside their pursuits and gazed in wonder at the display as well. Like a stone followed before the band hit passerby with the only song that made it to air, Cochise. If Soundgarden and Rage Against the Machine got into a fight, who do you think would win? David Letterman asked his band leader Paul Schaefer after returning from commercial break during the broadcast. Definitely Rage Against the Machine, the keyboardist answered. The bemused host concurred, then held up a vinyl copy of Audio Slave's debut before announcing their performance. Cameras swooped in from all directions to get cinematic shots of the band as they shook the foundations of the nearby skyscrapers with their vicious sound. If there were any lingering doubts about Chris's ability to rise to the occasion after months of personal turmoil, they were erased the second he opened his mouth and screamed out the song's twisted opening. Still some rage there, I think, Letterman quipped afterwards. Less than two weeks after the Letterman gig, Audio Slave was preparing for their next live appearance in Los Angeles, K-Rock's almost acoustic Christmas show at the Universal Amphitheater. Before they got there, however, they staged a secret gig at the Roxy on Sunset to work out kinks and calm their nerves. Their name wasn't even on the marquee, but people showed up anyway. The only giveaway of the evening's entertainment was the red rage against the machine star painted all over the various equipment cases. The Roxy gig went off like gangbusters. The band played half a dozen songs from their new album, culminating with Like a Stone, and seemed poised to rip the proverbial roof off the Universal Amphitheater the following evening. The almost acoustic lineup was an eclectic mix of artists Chris had known for years, like Billy Corgan's Swan and Queens of the Stone Age, as well as relative newcomers like Sum 41 and The Used. Opening with Light My Way, the group ripped through six songs during their half hour on stage. Just after hitting the amped audience with gasoline, Chris decided to introduce the band while making a stunning personal statement. This is Tom, this is Brad, this is Tim, I'm Chris, he said. These three guys saved my life this year. No one outside his inner circle knew how close to the brink Chris Cornell had come, but here he was now, still standing and still screaming in the way that only he could. At the end of the set, just like he did at the culmination of the Cochise video, Chris wrapped his bandmates in a gigantic hug. Chapter 13. Out of Exile the cabin of the private jet rocked gently as the rubber tires touched the tarmac. The few dozen people on board, 
an opulent loner from the NBA's Miami Heat that for the purposes of this trip was designated Audio Slave One, peered out of their windows and gazed out at the foreign landscape as they taxied toward the modest blue terminal. The flight had only taken about an hour and traversed just 228 miles, but the amount of effort and time it had taken to make it possible was Herculean. More than a million dollars had been spent to stage this single show. The pressure was on. No American rock band had ever performed on the isolated island of Cuba. The communist Caribbean country had been largely cut off from the rest of the world for decades, thanks to a strictly enforced commercial embargo put in place by the United States, shortly after Fidel Castro came to power in 1960. Though Cuba had hosted other American musical acts before, like Billy Joel and Chris Christofferson in 1979, the kind of performance that Chris Cornell and his band had planned was far beyond the scale, scope, and volume of those intimate musical gatherings. The logistics of securing the necessary equipment and getting it across the Caribbean presented its own degree of difficulty. Getting the green light from two adversarial governments to put on the performance was an entirely different ballgame. Before they went over, there was all this bullshit, like, weird word that would come to the band, like, you're not allowed to bring any recording devices. Audio Slave's manager, Daniel Field, said, Don't talk in your room because your rooms are going to be bugged. Don't wander off. You might get hijacked. All this bullshit, that wasn't true at all. Once they got there, people couldn't have been nicer. Audio Slave and their entourage which included their wives, tour managers, publicists, bodyguards, camera crew members, and Tom Morello's mother, Mary, debarked the plane just after noon and were greeted by a coterie of Cuban officials, eager to extend the hand of friendship and guide them around the island. The three former members of Rage Against the Machine had long hoped to perform here, but Zach de la Rocha had nixed the idea. Chris had been more receptive. Shortly after landing, the band was ushered into white vans and whisked around Havana. They visited Plaza de la Revolución, where the Cuban national flag had been hoisted for the first time in 1902. They listened to a local stand-up bass and piano combo at Cuba's National School of Arts and marveled at the centuries-old Havana Cathedral. They snapped pictures of the large omnipresent murals of Che Guevara that dotted the different buildings. Tim Comerford even busted out his mountain bike and carved up the walls of the Castillo de los Tres Reyes del Moro, the fort guarding the entrance to Havana Bay. One of Chris's favorite stops was John Lennon Park, which had been dedicated by Fidel Castro just five years earlier to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Lennon's death. For an unveiling like that to be done by Castro himself, that was something that made me feel more welcome as I sat next to the statue, he said. I thought, okay, well, a rock band coming here and playing is going to be endorsed and appreciated. During sound check, Chris busted out a cover of Lennon's Beatles classic, You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, for the 100 or so people craning their necks to get a better view. Audio Slave was determined to treat their gracious hosts to a spectacle they would never forget. After fixing a bomb monitor system that crapped out just after they hit the stage around 8 o'clock, the band launched into the longest set of their career, playing 26 songs over the course of two and a half hours. They milked almost their entire arsenal of music, pulling out songs from their first record, songs from their upcoming album Out of Exile, even songs from their previous bands. The Rage Guys hit the crowd with an instrumental version of Bulls on Parade, while Chris regaled them with a solo acoustic rendition of Black Hole Sun. Around 70,000 people flooded La Tribuna Anti-Imperialista Plaza to watch, listen, and bang their heads. American culture was slow to seep its way across the Atlantic. Residents on the island were largely cut off from the Internet then, and it was difficult for rock fans to keep up with what was cutting edge in the States. Despite the fact that many people who showed up for the free gig were largely unfamiliar with Audio Slave, there was a large contingent familiar with Chris and his work in Soundgarden. Out in the crowd, someone held up a gigantic white sign that read, Hello Seattle, welcome audio slave. Even those who had no idea who Soundgarden, Rage Against the Machine, or audio slave were, lost themselves in the celebratory spirit of the evening. They danced, they sang, 
They chanted the band's name. Odio slave, odio slave, odio slave. Chris couldn't have been happier. They were not only seeing a rock concert for the first time, they were seeing a huge rock concert for the first time, he said. As I looked to the audience, there was a vast appreciation, but of a different kind that could be deeply felt, even if it was only from their eyes. It was a watershed moment for the band. By the time they finished playing Shadow on the Sun, Chris hoisted the Cuban national flag high over his sweat-soaked hair and boisterously waved it before the sea of screaming faces. The show reaffirmed his belief in the power of music to unite people, while also bringing him closer to his bandmates. I really didn't think the same after I left, he said. I really understood what music is and how it's that language that everybody speaks, no matter what other audible language you speak. Not long after the band left the stage, cable news channels ran myriad stories about their groundbreaking performance. It was covered in newspapers, magazines and an army of online outlets. While the U.S. was still mired in a war in Iraq, a war they were slowly losing, this small piece of news about a rock band crossing hard borders to bridge seemingly impossible political divides and give some people a night of fun resonated. While Chris never made it back to Cuba, Audio Slave had put a crack in the invisible wall that separated the two countries. In the years that followed, Beyoncé and Jay-Z both visited the island as tourists, as did Roots drummer Questlove, Cool in the Gang, and EDM duo Major Lazer. And just five days after President Barack Obama normalized relations with Cuba and became the first sitting president to visit the country on March 20th, 2016, the Rolling Stones cemented Cuba's bona fides as a rock-loving mecca by staging their own free show in front of 500,000 people at a sports complex in Havana. Maybe it was all inevitable. Maybe time truly was the medicine that both the U.S. and Cuba needed to heal old wounds. But then, perhaps, the unlikely salve of Cochise, delivered with as much fury as its creators could conjure, helped speed the process along. A little over a month after Audio Slave rocked the almost acoustic Christmas show in Los Angeles, the foursome jetted across the Atlantic to embark on their first tour. The whole thing was planned as a 10-day, quick-hitting promotional campaign, with the band playing some of the continent's most important markets, like London, Berlin, and Milan. After that, they hopped on another plane for a standalone gig at the Zep Tokyo in Japan, before kicking off an extensive theater run through North America. The band landed in Paris on January 13th, 2003, checked into the Hotel Plaza Athene and started preparing for the performance the next evening at L'Olympia, an historic venue opened in 1888 by the co-founders of the Moulin Rouge. One of the pre-show tasks that needed to be handled were the preparations for the party Audio Slave planned to throw after the gig. One of the people tasked with making the event happen was a young woman named Vicky Carianis. Carianus was of Greek heritage, strikingly beautiful with long brown hair, large almond-shaped eyes, and bronze skin. As she was introduced to Chris, she couldn't help but notice his eyes, those brilliant blue orbs, eyes like a husky, that pierced right through her. She didn't attend the show the next night, but at the after-party at L'Avenue, their paths crossed again. Well, where were you, out having a sandwich? Chris playfully asked. Over the course of that first evening together in the City of Lights, they made a connection. They talked until the sun came up, then agreed to stay in touch to talk some more. With his commitments and friends completed, Chris jetted across the channel to London for another round of interviews, radio glad-handing, and a show at the Astoria Theatre. But he just couldn't get the incredible woman he'd met in Paris out of his head. He called her as soon as he was settled in England, a few days later, she jumped the channel herself to join him. In the coming months, their bond only grew stronger and deeper. Despite the draining work of getting a new band off the ground and the punishing schedule he was on, Chris always seemed to find a spare chunk of time to book a lengthy flight back to Paris, just to be close to Vicky. In the meantime, Audio Slave was taking America by storm. 
Like a Stone was released as a single in January and performed even better than Cochise had just a few months earlier. The song was an omnipresent force on commercial rock radio and ultimately hit number one on two different Billboard singles charts, alternative and mainstream rock. One reason for the success of Like a Stone was the captivating video directed by Meyert Avis, which featured the band miming a performance of the song inside an opulent Spanish-style mansion that had once been owned by Jimi Hendrix. As of the printing of this book, the video has well over 600 million views on YouTube. Then there were the concerts, beginning with a full month-long tour that kicked off in Denver on February 21, 2003, at the Fillmore Auditorium. Midway through, Chris grabbed a bottle of water and grabbed a sip, joking at his own expense that, this is about all I can drink anymore. An inebriated heckler held his beer aloft in protest, and Chris quickly replied, tell me about it in a few years, tough guy. In a more somber moment, he dedicated his performance of I Am the Highway to the victims of a terrible recent fire in a club in Rhode Island that had broken out during a Great White concert and claimed 100 lives. After that, they hit a wide range of intimate venues, like First Avenue in Minneapolis, the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York, and the Bronco Bowl in Dallas. Every night, they played almost every single song off their debut album, along with a cover of Funkadelic's Maggot Brain Deep Cut, Super Stupid. What they refused to do was perform anything from the catalogs of their previous bands. That run ended a month later, with a show at the Paramount Theater in Seattle, where the band diversified the set list a bit, throwing in renditions of Elvis Costello's What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, along with Rush's Working Man. After that, they did a quick swing through Australia and New Zealand, before hitting a myriad of different festivals in Europe, like Super Rock in Lisbon, Portugal, Donington in the UK, and Rock Am Ring in Germany. These fans were treated to a true rarity when the band busted out a funky track called Techno Ted, an unfinished outtake from the album. The title was a reference to Detroit rocker Ted Nugent because it sounded a little bit like his song Great White Buffalo if played by a techno act. Audio Slave was boisterously received almost everywhere they went, but these preliminary shows were just a prologue to their biggest and most lucrative commitment of the summer. Lollapalooza had been on ice for six years before 2003. Perry Farrell's alternative showcase had managed to stage only one more nationwide tour after Chris and Soundgarden's run with Metallica in 1996. As Y2K had loomed, it seemed the enthusiasm and willingness to keep the festival going had simply burned out. Other traveling showcases like Ozfest and Warped sprung up in Lollapalooza's wake, vying for the dollars in the pockets of America's youth. But Farrell was determined to resuscitate his dormant festival. With help from Microsoft, the tour was presented by Xbox, Lollapalooza was ready to make its comeback. Jane's Addiction was on board to headline. They added Incubus, Queens of the Stone Age, A Perfect Circle, Jurassic Five, The Distillers, and The Donnas to the lineup. Farrell even brought along DIY stuntman and jackass star Steve-O, who fulfilled the Jim Rose Circus sideshow role with his Don't Try This at Home showcase. But for the second spot on the poster, the organizers knew they needed a dynamic name that would create a buzz in the alt-rock community. Audio Slave was the answer. The plan going in was to play 33 shows from Sea to Shining Sea, beginning on July 3rd. Ultimately, due to sluggish ticket sales, several dates had to either be rescheduled or canceled, including the first gig on the docket. Lollapalooza instead kicked off on July 5th at the Verizon Wireless Amphitheater in Noblesville, Indiana. It wasn't exactly a banner day at the office. Roughly 12,000 people showed up to the 24,000-seat venue. Even worse, during the middle of the day, a massive downpour turned the farthest lawn area into a mud-soaked slip-and-slide. The second stage was canceled, while the main stage schedule was pushed back an hour so that the rain could dissipate. Despite the many environmental and logistical travails and the less-than-enthusiastic response other bands on the bill garnered, Audio Slave remained a constant bright spot each day of the tour. 
Thousands of people screamed along with Chris, clad in a gray tank top and camouflage shorts. Not only during the songs, but between them as well. The band fed not only off the energy from the crowd, but also the meteorological events that threw a wrench into so many of Farrell's best laid plans. I like the fireworks with all the thunder and lightning and the god shit, Chris said, while lightning flashed in the distance. Jane's addiction, who had to follow Audio Slave's maniacal high energy set, never stood a chance. I just remember how powerful and amazing the shows were, Daniel Field said. The band was all getting along and everyone was having fun. It was sort of like an environment Chris was used to because he'd done two Lollapaloozas before that. In Milwaukee, they got one hell of an introduction from Tom Morello's mother, Mary, who declared, I was a fan of Soundgarden and I was a fan of Rage Against the Machine, but the next band on is the most kick-ass band I've ever heard. They still weren't playing songs from their previous careers, but they added a bombastic cover of the White Stripes' recently released anthem, Seven Nation Army, into the back half of the set, which kept the mosh pit churning. And when they made it back to the Seattle area at the White River Amphitheater, the band invited a perfect circle frontman, Maynard James Keenan, out for an arm-raising take on Elvis Costello's What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding. After plowing through the Midwest, Lollapalooza shifted to the East Coast near the end of July. Vicky flew over from Europe to join Chris on tour while the band was based in New York and threw him a 39th birthday party at the deck at Pier 59. The celebration was briefly invaded when a Secret Service member strolled over to their table and asked if George W. Bush's twin daughters could say hello to Chris. The singer agreed and gamely engaged in the generic chit-chat, smile-and-take-picture routine he'd done for thousands of other fans over the years before sending them on their way. Little did the Bush twins know how much the singer disdained their father. I don't like bombing people in the name of people who pay taxes, he told a crowd at the war field in San Francisco a few months earlier. It pisses me off. Years later, he got to face down the 43rd president at a Kennedy Center Honors Ceremony for the living members of The Who, where he screamed his heart out over the band's call to revolution, won't get fooled again. Vicky departed to Mykonos shortly thereafter, but the phone calls between them continued. Chris had recently written a song that he was eager to sing to her over the phone. It was a touching acoustic ballad in which he declared that he got every kind of love that you will ever need, dying here on bended knees. As he later told Cameron Crowe, her first indication that I was going to ask her to marry me was that song. He added, she didn't respond enough in a way that I could draw any conclusions from her reaction. Now she says, God, I couldn't believe when you were singing that to me, that you didn't show up the next day with a ring. While he used the name Vicky in the original version that he sang to her, he ultimately changed the name to Josephine as an homage to Napoleon Bonaparte's wife and a subtle tip of the cap to their courtship in Paris. When she visited L.A. ahead of her own birthday in August, Chris surprised her with a room full of flowers, balloons, and wrapped gifts of all shapes and sizes. And when Lollapalooza finally finished with a performance in St. Helens, Oregon, he practically moved into the Beverly Hills Hotel just to be with her. One morning while they were still waking up in bed, Chris asked Vicky for the necklace he had given her with a ring on it. She was reluctant, but handed it over anyway. He proceeded to cut the chain and said, I woke up and I had the strangest vision of doing this. I'm not prepared with the real ring, but I want to marry you. She was taken aback, but quickly said yes, and he slid the ring on her finger. Several months later, the couple received the news that Vicky was pregnant. Chris and Vicky were married in a civil proceeding in Los Angeles not long after. They followed that up with a more opulent ceremony a couple of months later inside a Greek Orthodox church in front of all their friends and family. Jeff Quatnitz stood as Chris's best man, at the reception at the Plaza Athene afterwards, while everyone feasted on the six-foot-tall multi-tiered wedding cake, Chris sang a song he'd recently written for his new bride. Finally Forever recounts the way she caught his eye and the patience it took to win her heart. 
There's no hill I would not climb for you, he promised. No bridge I wouldn't cross. On September 18th, 2004, Chris became a father again when Vicky gave birth to their daughter, Tony, named after Vicky's mother. Then, just a shade over a year later, on December 5th, 2005, the pair welcomed their second child, a boy named Christopher Nicholas. With his family growing, Chris bought an apartment in Paris and began splitting time between France and Los Angeles, walking up and down the posh city's ancient streets, taking in the culture while surrounded by centuries-old, finely crafted art and architecture, had a tremendous impact on him. The City of Lights made the emerald city of his youth look like a frontier town. He immersed himself in Parisian culture, learning a little bit of French while dining out at the city's finest bistros. He eventually made a more concrete mark on his adoptive city by opening a restaurant with Vicky's brother, Nick Carianis. It was a posh spot, located in the 8th arrondissement, across the street from the Four Seasons Hotel Georges Sanc, and was designed by Victoria's secret fashion show producer, Alexandre de Bedoc. It was the Christian Dior designer John Galliano, however, who suggested that the interior should be all black, hence the eatery's name, Black Calavados. The caramel quail was reportedly to die for. Chris also dipped his toes into the world of fashion, appearing as the face of designer John Varvado's spring campaign in 2006. For the spread, Chris was photographed by Danny Clinch, wearing a variety of trendy coats and semi-formal wear. The shots caused a stir among the self-proclaimed grunge-loving authenticity police, who clutched their pearls wondering whither their flannel-clad god had gone. Chris himself didn't give much thought to their gnashing, I remember getting a little bit of shit for that, he said. Then the next person who did it after me was Iggy Pop, and that it made it seem like proof. He can kind of legitimize anything because, credibility-wise, he is untouchable. While his new wife and young children were rightfully taking up a majority of Chris's time and attention, he didn't lose focus on the demands from his band. The singer continued to write and demo new material for the next Audio Slave album, he also reached back into his own personal archives to a song called Ferry Boat No. 3 that he'd written in 1991 for singles. The song hadn't yet been commercially released, and he thought Comerford, Wilk, and Morello might help him bring it to life in the explosive way that only they could. His instincts proved right, and the sparse, melancholic demo was transformed into a full-fledged rock and roll anthem. They ultimately tucked the song at the end of their second record, retitling it The Curse. After sharing so many stages, hotels, planes, and green rooms around the world over the preceding months, the members of Audio Slave had gained a far better collective understanding of what their individual talents and weaknesses were. They'd also forged a stronger bond of trust, which made for an exceedingly more efficient communication system. Unlike their first album, where they rode in a rehearsal space and then headed into the studio, this time around, they decided to do things differently. Rick Rubin was at the helm again, but before they entered cello recording studios, the band spent about two weeks in pre-production. Under the watchful eye of their Zen master, Audio Slave finally honed the shapes of the different songs they hoped would make up the bulk of their next record. After that process was finished, Rubin took off and the band spent another two weeks together playing and getting even more familiar with the material. Just as they had on Audio Slave, the songs on Out of Exile came together at an astonishing clip. Doesn't Remind Me, which opens as a relatively sparse ballad before detonating into a fury of guitar and drums, coalesced in a matter of minutes. I was out of town and these guys recorded that and a bunch of other stuff on a tape. And when I returned, we were working on different things on the tape and then started playing that one and I thought, wow. I'm surprised we're working on this. Like somebody wanted to do such a simple chord progression in a song, Chris told MTV. Personally, I would not have chosen that, which is part of the reason I love being in a band and collaborating with other people. The general vibe across the album was far sunnier than anything Chris had been a part of before. Songs like Dandelion, in which he rhapsodizes about hummingbirds and yellow flowers, or Yesterday to Tomorrow, 
where he evokes images of a world of diamond and gold, were nearly inconceivable to Soundgarden fans. Chris wrote most of his contributions while Vicky was pregnant with Tony, and across many of the album's dozen tracks, he sounds like a man with a new lease on life. The title track offers the clearest window into his state of mind at that moment. Crooning over Morello's twitchy guitar, Chris gives the listener a small peek into his redemption as a man isolated on an island with its own fortress, until he found Vicky. And inside her shone a young light. From her labor, I was saved. I was already trying to dig myself out, and then that relationship challenged me on every level that way, and all in positive ways. He told Yahoo Music, I've heard about living in the moment, and I've lived a lot of my life not really knowing what the fuck that's supposed to mean. But having a baby kind of pointed that out to me. When I'm with her, I'm not thinking about anything else. It's just a huge positive thing. That didn't mean Out of Exile was entirely upbeat. He also shed some light on the darkest depths he'd sunk to in the preceding years. In Heaven's Dead, he laments the dismal fate of the great beyond when you fall into a depression. In Drown Me Slowly, he alludes to a sickness. I can't fix it, not all at once. And in The Worm, he goes even further, back to his early adolescence, when I hated everything and took advice from the wrong shoulder. In Your Time Has Come, Chris reflects on the tragic too early deaths of a number of friends. It's a bunch of references to people that I knew that were younger than me who've been dead for years and years, up to a couple of years ago. Chris told MTV in 2005. Chris didn't limit his grief in Your Time Has Come to people he personally knew. A recent visit to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. resonated deeply with him. As he gazed at the black granite, he looked past the 50,000 tiny names engraved so tightly next to one another and considered the real and full lives behind them. In the song, he spares a moment for all of them left brothers and sisters and mothers behind, he sang, and most of their family and friends alive doing time. While he imparted little bits of hard-earned wisdom and insight across the many songs on Out of Exile, Chris managed to distill the greatest lesson he's learned over the past several years down into a single song that Audio Slave chose to release as the album's first single. Over a simple, clean guitar melody and Tom Kick drum beat, he soberly pontificates about the many highs and lows encountered along the journey of life. A bouquet of flowers tossed joyously into the air at a wedding countered in the next stanza by a clutch of white roses solemnly laid at the foot of a grave and the manner in which people handled the challenges thrown their way. Someone finds salvation in everyone, another only pain. Someone tries to hide himself, down inside himself he prays. In the end, he discovered, there's only one thing to do. Be yourself. Be Yourself was a near spontaneous creation. Tom Morello walked into their rehearsal studio and heard Tim Comerford messing around with a four-note bass line. The guitarist jumped in with a little melody he conceived while thinking back to The Cure's expansive 1989 masterpiece, Disintegration. And Chris over that just sang that melody in the first half hour or so, Morello recalled. He sits there smoking a cigarette, listening to the groove, and steps to the microphone and sings the damn song. Three months before Out of Exile went on sale, the band released Be Yourself. The song was another winner on FM radio, and before long hit number one on both Billboard's mainstream rock and alternative song charts. It was later used as the theme song to WrestleMania 26 and the sixth season premiere of the popular NBC sitcom Scrubs. For the video, which features numerous opaque close-ups of Chris and the band performing the song in a high-ceiling department, the singer looked back to his biggest artistic inspiration, the Beatles, for guidance. If you watch Let It Be, the look of the film makes the band look like it's an important happening, he said. I just wanted to look important, like things looked when I was a child. Critics were far more kind to Out of Exile when the album finally dropped on May 23, 2005, than they had been to Audio Slave's debut. 
David Frick and Rolling Stone praised the way Chris arcs and plunges through notes with the growling imprecision of a cornered animal, while Pitchfork gave the album a score of 6.8. Not a glowing endorsement, but a massive upgrade over the abysmal 1.7 they awarded to Audio Slave. Once again, however, Audio Slave proved themselves beyond critical reproach with their burgeoning fan base. In its first week, Out of Exile sold 263,000 copies in the U.S., enough to bump their friends System of a Down and their album Mesmerize from the top spot on the charts, giving the band their first number one album. It was also the first time that Chris had scored a number one record since Super Unknown over a decade ago. Shortly before Out of Exile dropped, the band embarked on a small-scale theater tour of North America, hitting places like the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago, Roseland Ballroom in New York, the Agora in Cleveland, and the Wiltern in Los Angeles. In the midst of this, they also took off for their groundbreaking free concert in Cuba, followed shortly thereafter by a 20,000-seat arena gig in Mexico City. It was during this run that they decided to throw aside their rule of not playing songs from their earlier bands, and the set lists regularly featured appearances of Soundgarden songs like Spoon Man, Outshined, and Black Hole Sun. Sometimes they even busted out the Temple of the Dog fan favorite, Call Me a Dog. Along the way, Audio Slave taped an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live. An entire stretch of bustling Hollywood Boulevard was shut down for the performance, but entrance was free to those willing to wait to get in. The LAPD riot squad was called in after the crowd got carried away and started breaking down the metal barricades meant to contain them when the band launched into the rage against the machine cut, killing in the name. As the show's host later joked, only two times in the almost 17 years we'd been on the air has the LAPD riot police had to be called in. One was for Lionel Richie, obviously. The other was for this band and their fans. Audio Slave stuck around Southern California for another few days to play the K-Rock Weenie Roast at the Irvine Meadows Amphitheater, performing ahead of Foo Fighters and the recently reunited Motley Crue. After that, they took off on an extensive festival circuit swing through Europe, while the shows at the Roskilde Festival in Denmark and the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland were well-received. The most prominent booking on the calendar was a scheduled appearance in Berlin for the Live 8 Mega Concerts. Live 8 was the brainchild of Bob Geldof, who shook the world 20 years earlier by staging one of the grandest single-day concerts of all time, Live Aid, that was broadcast from Philadelphia and London simultaneously. During that seminal show in 1985, Led Zeppelin reunited. Queen put on a spectacle the likes of which may never be seen again. And Phil Collins hopped a private jet so that he could perform at both locales. This time around... Geldof upped the ante and staged ten concerts around the globe, from Rome to Paris, Moscow to South Africa, Ontario to Japan, and, of course, London to Philadelphia. The list of acts the producers managed to book for their event reads like a who's who of the biggest names in the music industry over the last five decades. Neil Young, Snoop Dogg, Stevie Wonder, Simon and Garfunkel, Jay-Z, Destiny's Child... The Eagles, Kanye West, U2, The Who, R.E.M., Linkin Park, Elton John, and Paul McCartney, to name just a few. Geldof and the event's organizers even managed to pull off the seemingly impossible and got Pink Floyd to reunite for one last performance. The magnitude of the event cannot be overstated. At the Berlin show, Audio Slave was joined on the bill by fellow American acts like Green Day and Beach Boys mastermind Brian Wilson. The band kicked off their truncated set in front of 150,000 people or so, spread out in a long line in front of them. And at least another billion watching at home with their latest single, Doesn't Remind Me, before lighting into an abbreviated solo acoustic rendition of Black Hole Sun that segued immediately into their monster hit, Like a Stone then finishing with Killing in the Name. By the end, Chris had leapt off the stage and was passing around the mic to those in front, imploring them to scream, Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. The size of the crowd, the general strangeness of the setup in Tiergarten Park, 
and most importantly of all, the feeling that he was actually helping to affect positive change in the world impacted Chris profoundly. There was a really good feeling in the little tense city that was backstage during the two or three hours that we were there that something was happening that had never happened before. And it was a good thing and an important thing, and we were a part of it, he told journalist John W. Ennis. For us to make any kind of a difference, to show up somewhere and play five songs, it's great. It'd be like a plumber fixing somebody's sink to help stamp out world poverty or some of these problems these countries have with devastating starvation. After finishing their latest European jaunt, the band returned to America and read through treatments for a video for Doesn't Remind Me. After that, they largely stayed out of the public eye for the bulk of August and September to begin the pre-production process for their next album. Then it was time to hit the road again for their first-ever U.S. headlining arena tour. One of the most exhilarating moments of their newly designed arena show came early on when a large banner displaying the Bad Motorfinger cover dropped from the ceiling and the band launched into bracing Soundgarden favorites like Rusty Cage, Loud Love, and Spoon Man. During the Pacific Northwest portion of the tour, like the gig in Vancouver, British Columbia, Chris even invited his old friend Artis out to the delight of the many Soundgarden fans dotting the crowd. To spice things up, they tossed a variety of covers into the set, such as Bruce Springsteen's Atlantic City at the Borgata Event Center in Atlantic City. By October, they had landed in New York City for a pair of performances at the crown jewel of concert arenas, Madison Square Garden. During the first show, Chris electrified the Big Apple crowd by revealing that the band had finished writing most of their next album. Then he gave the cue, and Audio Slave debuted a new song, eventually titled Sound of a Gun. Chris had only penned the lyrics the week before and had to read off a piece of paper to make sure he didn't mess them up. Along the tour, they also debuted another song, a funky rager titled One and the Same. The tour ended with a performance at the Long Beach Arena on November 18, 2005. Nearly as soon as Audio Slave came off the road, but not before Chris grabbed some time off to be with his family, after Vicky gave birth to their son Christopher in December. The band began work on their next album. It was a quick turnaround from Out of Exile, but Chris liked it that way. In Soundgarden, it felt like the industry put too much importance into each new release. It had to be the second coming and some epic thing every time. It created tension and pressure on the band, he told the Pioneer Press in 2005. I liked the days when a band like the Rolling Stones could put out a record that I didn't like, but it didn't matter. Husker Du could put out a record I didn't like, but I'd still buy the next one. When you're waiting two or three years for a follow-up, though, chances are you're not going to be so patient. Like their previous albums, the band studiously prepared by writing a wealth of new material ahead of time and had about 20 tracks in which they were confident. Four or five of them were holdovers from Out of Exile, including the song Revelations, which ended up becoming the title of their latest work. Despite its affiliation to the apocalypse as described in the Old Testament, the song is more about hypocrites living messed up lives, being too willing to tell others how they should live. You know what to do, you know what I did. Since you know everything, just clue me in. Chris sarcastically sings in the intro. When it came time to work on the next record, it sort of felt like, well, it was super fun and easy to work with Brendan. Let's do that again, Audio Slave's manager said. The band wanted to put out music at a faster pace, and with memories of how long it had taken Rick Rubin to pull usable vocals out of Chris on Out of Exile, a process that stretched out to six months, they decided to make a change. The choice of producer was obvious. It had to be Brendan O'Brien. Audio Slave could have hardly picked a better musical partner to help them put together their latest collection of lacerating rock tracks. The band loved the job he had done mixing out of Exile. He had also worked extensively with Rage Against the Machine, producing both Evil Empire and Battle of Los Angeles. And of course, he had helped save Super Unknown when the mixing process began to go off the rails. Immediately, the move played dividends. He did all the vocals for the revelations in like five or six days, Fields said. 
Chris was in love with Brendan. He was like, that was amazing. He got the best vocals out of me so fast. I love working with him. For the first time since the earliest recording sessions for Super Unknown, Chris allowed himself to be produced while recording his vocals instead of secluding himself in a separate studio to do them by himself. It was a jarring shift after a decade of doing things his own way, but Chris went along with it because he respected O'Brien's ear and musical ability. He was one of the only people on the planet capable of chiming in with an idea, question, or request from another take with which Chris felt comfortable. In many ways, Audio Slave's third album stands as the band's most cohesive sounding and consistent work. It doesn't contain the searing Cochise reminiscent highs of their debut, but the flow from song to song represents a fulfilling artistic culmination of their three years together. It's also their funkiest, most pointed release. One of the biggest sticking points for Chris prior to joining Audio Slave was that he didn't want to write political songs. While he'd touched on societal ills while in Soundgarden, especially environmentalism, he didn't care to step into the large arena that rage against the machine had occupied. Along the way, he'd made statements on stage from time to time and encouraged Tom Morello in his own political endeavors. Playing in Cuba was a political act, but he still wasn't comfortable merging his artistic life with his political beliefs. Some of those concerns fell by the wayside during the writing and recording of Revelations. The song Wide Awake was a direct shot at the Bush administration's lackluster response to Hurricane Katrina, which resulted in the deaths of more than 1,200 people in and around New Orleans. Follow the leaders. We're in an eye for an eye. We'll all be blind. Death for murder. This I'm sure in this uncertain time. As a father... He worried more about the world that was being left to his children and channeled his concerns into his music. Like the rest of the country, Chris was shocked by the vastness of the tragedy. Watching the footage of the Crescent City left him aghast. How could something so terrible happen in America? How could our leaders seem to care so very little to do anything about it? Audio Slave had the music for Wide Awake complete before hitting the road but Chris wrote the words while traveling to a show. You don't think of America as provinces where one part of the country can be ignored over another part of the country because it's a depressed area, he said. I felt like it was something I wanted to say and could be done in a way that was poetic and could fit inside the song and not draw undue attention to the topic that kind of detracts from the song but coexists with the music in a powerful way. Chris had always written with certain motifs in mind. Dogs and the sun pervaded the music of Soundgarden, and the open highway dominated the first Audio Slave album. Among the major themes he tackled across Revelations were war, violence, and urban decay. The song Broken City, for instance, was written about Detroit and the struggles the city has endured in the years since industry fled for cheaper labor in China and Mexico. Chris wrote the lyrics while on the road after rolling into Motown and gazing at all the abandoned buildings that once served as the beating heart of America's superpower-crowning manufacturing apparatus. No one cares about climbing stairs. Nothing at the top no more. The third track on the record, Sound of a Gun, centers around the experience of growing up in a city transformed from a playground to a battleground, between the wrong and the right. He could easily have name-checked Baghdad, Fallujah, or Mosul. Sound of a Gun was another holdover from Out of Exile that got reworked and rewritten under O'Brien's watch. Chris had always loved the way the song was arranged, but Rubin started tinkering with it, offering different notes and directions to Chris's chagrin. He hadn't even bothered with singing on it during those sessions, electing to leave it on the cutting room floor. Just before the Revelations sessions began, he returned to it, inspired enough to pen some new lyrics before debuting it to a receptive audience at Madison Square Garden. By March 2006, the band's third album was mostly finished. They'd notched 11 tracks, but O'Brien asked if they had one more in them. He felt the record could benefit from another up-tempo rock song, a last smack across the face to leave the listeners feeling a sting when silence signaled the record's end. The next day, their last in the studio, 
the band came together and wrote and recorded the entirety of Moth. Chris went home that night, wrote lyrics, came back the next day, laid down the vocals, and they were done. Moth is a dynamic piece of music that alternates between quiet contemplative verse sections and cranked to 11 choruses. Over the top, Chris swears in a searing voice that he doesn't fly around your fire anymore. It was the last word on Chris's creative partnership with Audioslave. Chapter 14. You Know My Name. November 14th, 2006. Thousands of people lining the streets behind the barricades in Leicester Square crane their necks as the silver Mercedes slowly rolls to a stop. This is the very heart of London's posh West End, a mere mile down the road from Buckingham Palace, and less than a ten-minute walk from the Beatles' one-time Apple Music headquarters on Carnaby Street. Flashbulbs explode as Chris and Vicky Cornell exit the rear of the vehicle. He looks fantastically sharp in his expensive black suit, with his impeccably manicured hair and mustache. Instead of a bow tie, he's left his collar flared out and wrapped a scarf around his neck. A rock star among royalty. Photographers and fans scream his name, hoping for a nod of recognition. He smiles and waves before slowly strolling toward the red carpet. Chris is no stranger to star-studded events. He's attended more than his fair share of galas and award shows over the years. But this particular event is different. It is the world premiere of the new James Bond film, Casino Royale, one of the most hotly anticipated movies of the decade. The list of luminaries on hand to catch actor Daniel Craig's initial spin as the immortal British spy is too numerous to count. Elton John, Richard Attenborough, Paris Hilton, Richard Branson... Even the Queen, Elizabeth II, is in attendance to lend her special weight of gravitas to the occasion. Chris and Vicky make their way up the stairs leading to the entrance of the Leicester Square Odeon Theatre, eager to see the film for the first time. Along the way, they're intercepted by interviewers, eager to hear Chris's thoughts on the film and the effort he put into crafting You Know My Name, the theme song he contributed. I had the big Paul McCartney anchor around my neck, he admits to one microphone-wielding presenter, referencing the latter's explosive title track to the 1973 entry in the series Live and Let Die. I'm a huge fan, a huge Beatles fan, a huge fan of British music, really. And so I did feel that. After chatting with the press, the pair enters the theater and are escorted into a line to meet the Queen herself. Just beforehand, a person hands out mints to everyone, so as not to offend the royal nostrils with any unpleasant breath. Chris stands between one of the film's screenwriters, Neil Purvis, and his musical collaborator, David Arnold, who helped him create the song. When his moment arrives, he uncrosses his arms, gently takes the queen's gloved hand into his own, flashes her a slight smile, and subtly nods his head. They exchange brief pleasantries, just as she has with everyone else in the receiving line. Her charming demeanor catches him off guard. She's the Queen of England, he thinks. She doesn't have to say anything, but to work that hard at her age and just to be that polite to everybody, I thought was amazing. It was the first time it kind of made sense to me, the monarchy in England still existing, he said later to the examiner. He and Vicky leave to find their seats. As the lights go down, the screen fills with the cold, dark visage of an office building somewhere in Prague. A man in a fur hat enters the darkened office, and he is greeted by James Bond on the cusp of earning his double-O designation to kill on behalf of God and country. Bond dispatches the bad guy, and then, after a bathroom brawl, the sound of horns blast out of the theater's speakers, and Chris's voice fills the room. If you take a life, do you know what you'll get? He asks the luminaries pinned to the back of their seats. A kaleidoscope of animated playing card-themed graphics filters across the screen as the song rattles the walls. The opening credits are vintage Bond, with different handguns shooting clubs and hearts. A rifle scope sight morphs into a spinning roulette wheel, and as Chris roars the chorus for the final time, his name flashes across the screen. You know my name, 
Performed by Chris Cornell. Written and produced by Chris Cornell and David Arnold. Chris had worked on songs for films before, but nothing quite to the magnitude and importance of this particular track. As soon as he saw the rough 20-minute snippet of Casino Royale months earlier and watched Craig's unrelenting realistic portrayal, he knew he wanted to be a part of the project. It was a huge risk, but the rewards if it worked out were immeasurable. As he worked on the song with Arnold, he thought about previous Bond themes that he liked. McCartney's for sure, but also Tom Jones's take on Thunderball. He appreciated the way that Jones crooned his way around the song before ending on a bombastic high note and sought to emulate that in his own work. The producers wanted a strong male singer that could match Craig's steely-eyed performance in song. Chris was determined to give them what they were looking for. You Know My Name was almost universally applauded in the press after the film debuted. Billboard called it the best Bond theme since Duran Duran's A View to Kill in 1985. The song earned him a Grammy nomination but was snubbed from the Oscars, shut out by three different cuts from the Beyoncé-led Dreamgirls, a Randy Newman original called Our Town for Pixar's Cars, and the eventual winner, I Need to Wake Up, by Melissa Etheridge for Al Gore's climate crisis documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. You Know My Name gave Chris a crucial jumpstart to the solo career that he was just about to renew. I say almost universally applauded, because there were, of course, the inevitable cries online from rock purists wondering aloud what in the hell the Soundgarden audio slave frontman was doing surrounding himself in lush orchestral arrangements. Chris refused to give his detractors the time of day. I was referred to as the quintessential angry young man, he said. As far as I'm concerned, I can do anything musically. The perception outside of that is none of my business. Revelations wasn't even out yet in the summer of 2006, but word had already leaked that Chris Cornell was preparing his second solo album. Speculation ran rampant that Audio Slave was on the cusp of disintegration. Near the end of July, Chris talked to MTV to try and tamp down the rumors, while also admitting that he was plotting his next step as a solo artist. You would hope that by now, putting out our third record, people wouldn't be thinking that way or be worried about it. But it comes up, Chris said. I always just ignore it. The rumors, however, combined with reports that Rage Against the Machine was entertaining seven-figure offers to reunite, were all pointing towards the end of Audio Slave. Revelations was released a few months later, on September 4th, 2006. Despite the growing chatter about the band's potential split, the record performed well in its first week, selling 150,000 copies and debuting at number two on Billboard's Top 200. Revelations was blocked from repeating Out of Exile's impressive number one showing, however, thanks to the release of Beyoncé's second studio album, B-Day, which sold half a million copies that same week. Audio Slave decided not to tour in support of the album. The band did the necessary press to satisfy their label, but without a big push and the promise of live shows to entice fans to buy into the songs, the album quickly faded from the top 200. And yet the lead single, Original Fire, still managed to break out, hitting number three and four on Billboard's alternative and mainstream rock charts, respectively. Even as a fading concern, Audio Slave remained a commercial success. Before Chris could dig into his own project, he still had to figure out what to do about Casino Royale. It had been nearly two decades since the last time a male singer had recorded a Bond theme. Now with Daniel Craig taking over from Pierce Brosnan and bringing a decidedly more brutal and masculine take on the iconic British spy, Sony Pictures' president of music, Leah Volek, brought Chris in to see if he could create something that mirrored this aesthetic. After talking things over with Volek, Chris flew to Prague to get a sense of what the film was about and came away impressed. While in Eastern Europe, he met David Arnold, Casino Royale's composer, and they discussed the different approaches they had in mind. The pair worked on musical ideas and lyrics separately before coming back together and comparing notes. I went up to his apartment in Paris and he played me his idea and I played him my ideas, Arnold said. 
We'd kind of written parts of the same song simultaneously and it all came together amazingly well. One thing they agreed on from the jump was that they didn't want to write a song using the name of the movie. Chris couldn't see a way into the music using Casino Royale without sounding corny. Instead, he focused on Bond's journey and the grueling toll saving the world takes on a human being. There was a bit of himself in the song, too. It is partially inspired by the story, as acted by him, and partially from personal feelings and experience. After marrying music to words, Arnold and Cornell made a quick demo to show to the film's producers and got their approval to proceed. They rented time at the legendary Beatles producer George Martin's Air Studios in London and recorded the basic guitar, vocal, bass tracks themselves, while bringing in a studio drummer to lay down the beat. By November, he was walking red carpets and chatting with the Queen. At the same time, Chris was writing songs for his second foray as a solo artist. Of all the records that Chris made in his life, Carry On is far and away the most sentimental. The vibe across its 14 tracks hovers somewhere between adult contemporary and modern pop. The project reflected his desire to turn away from the searing sounds of Audio Slave into a more mature direction. The heaviest song on the record, No Such Thing, was written late in the process after the suits at Interscope worried that there was a dearth of guitar-slathered rock songs for longtime fans to latch onto. After years of lacerating his vocal cords, Chris craved a more tender sound. Carry On is a record about love, written by a guy deep in the throes of it. In Disappearing Act, he rhapsodizes about a beautiful girl covered cinnamon while preaching patience in the quest for love on Finally Forever. Arms Around Your Love is about a woman who leaves her man for another man because he's such a loser. That song should really be called You're an Idiot, he joked. She'll Never Be Your Man is about a woman who leaves her man for another woman. Safe and Sound is about an innate desire to live in a world that's safe and sound. A place where you walk safely no matter your color or age. To produce Carry On, Chris tapped celebrated producer Steve Lillywhite. Lillywhite was an esteemed pop rock music veteran by 2006, who cut his teeth early in the 80s working with the likes of Peter Gabriel, The Rolling Stones, and Rush. He's best known for his work with U2, a partnership that dates back to the Irish band's beginnings when he produced their debut album, Boy. Since then, he'd helped oversee some portions of eight of the group's subsequent records, including The Joshua Tree, Octoon Baby, and How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. I heard the demos, but it was more about hearing the voice, Lily White said. He had a great falsetto and a great tenor. Not all singers can tick all the boxes and sing all the octaves, but he really could. Bono has that, but Chris has it even better. The pair entered NRG Recording Studios in North Hollywood in October. The first thing that struck Lily White after meeting Chris was how blissfully unpretentious he was. The producer had logged countless hours with some major prima donnas in his time, but Chris was free of the trappings of being a rock star. He carried his own equipment, didn't have a personal assistant, and kept things low-key. I would sometimes walk through the green room and he was constantly on his Blackberry, Lily White said. I was thinking he's running this whole empire from just his Blackberry. He's doing it all himself. Then one time I walked past him and I happened to look over his shoulder and he was playing the Brick Breaker video game. The recording process for Carry On went smoothly. Maybe too much so. Outside of their request to add a few guitar-heavy songs, the label largely stayed out of their way. To help with guitar, Chris tapped Gary Lucas, who had worked with his old friend Jeff Buckley on the singer's lone studio album Grace, while a collection of studio musicians filled out the rest of the music. The most notable hiccup came while Chris was riding to the studio one day on his motorcycle a $50,000 exile chopper. He was smashed from behind by a large truck and sent flying 20 feet into the air. As the pavement loomed closer to his face, I was sort of thinking, this is an actual accident. I hope it's not as bad as I feel like it's going to be. Fortunately, he was wearing his helmet and came away scratched up, bruised, 
and with a potentially broken finger, but no lasting major physical damage. Instead of heading home or to a hospital, he simply made his way to the studio and got down to the business at hand. He wasn't the sort of guy to make a big thing out of something, Lily White said. Of all the songs on Carry On, the most unexpected entry was Chris's cover of Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. Most people wouldn't expect a grunge-rocking icon to tackle the king of pop. But that is exactly what made the proposition so appealing. It started as a joke. During Audio Slave's last tour, Chris regularly took over a portion of the set to play a few songs by himself on acoustic guitar. After a while, he decided to mix things up to make the other three guys in the band laugh. I figured they had to stand there and watch me every night. I thought I'd do some songs they'd never expect, he said. Now in the studio with one of those tracks, he couldn't get the bass line to work quite right. So I switched it to kind of a 6-8 gospel time signature. Suddenly it wasn't funny, but it was a great song. It's a lament, really. Slowing the music down gave him more space to croon over the verses, while accentuating the gripping narrative of the song itself. Whereas in the original, Jackson sounds alternately defiant and aggrieved, Chris howls his way through Billie Jean like a wounded animal. We cut that quite late, ten o'clock one night, Lily White remembered, turned all the lights down. That was a live vocal. He never recut the vocal. At the dawn of 2007, Carry On was largely complete. In addition to the twelve original tracks he composed and the Michael Jackson cover, Chris had worked out a deal with Sony to keep You Know My Name off the official Casino Royale soundtrack. He included it as the final track on this album. It was a canny bit of marketing on his part that enhanced the album's commercial prospects. Everything was rolling toward a spring release, but there was one thing he had to do. He had to announce the end of Audio Slave. On January 22, 2007, Coachella revealed their yearly lineup of artists and even judged against their typical eyebrow-raising standards. It was a doozy. Over the past several years, the Southern California-based music festival had drawn loads of attention for helping reunite a breathtaking array of seemingly unreunitable bands like the Stooges, the Pixies, and Bauhaus. That year, they topped themselves by nabbing Rage Against the Machine. Audio Slave's End seemed like a mere formality. Chris made it official just a few weeks later, releasing a curt statement. Due to irresolvable personality conflicts as well as musical differences, I am permanently leaving the band Audio Slave, he wrote. I wish the other three members nothing but the best in all of their future endeavors. The band read about his decision in the press. He hadn't spoken to them directly in months. Shortly after Audio Slave dissolved, Tom Morello suggested that people looking for a definitive answer would be best served watching the satirical mockumentary film Spinal Tap. Bands are either able to get over those hurdles because of friendship or belief in the music or avarice or whatever it is that makes bands stay together, or they're not. The guitarist told Jam Bass, we were unable to kind of get past some of the disagreements that we had. Chris pulled the curtain back on his own motivations while speaking to Rolling Stone shortly after sharing his statement. Getting along as people is one thing. Getting along as a group of people that can work together in a band situation? We weren't particularly getting along well. No, he said. I was tired of what ended up seeming like political negotiations toward how we were going to do audio slave business and getting nowhere with it, he added. We had back and forths about that and... We also, as a band, sat in a room with other people trying to work this out on numerous occasions. And it wasn't really happening. Even with a new solo album on the horizon and the memory of You Know My Name freshly seared into the brains of the millions of fans who bought tickets to see Casino Royale, interviewers couldn't help but ask him the same question over and over again in the wake of Audio Slave's demise. Do you think you'll reunite with Soundgarden? The fact that Rage Against the Machine seemingly beat the odds and found a way back to one another suddenly made the prospect that Chris would call up Kim Thiel, Matt Cameron, and Ben Shepard plausible once again. 
Chris was kind whenever he spoke about his first band and their shared history, but he was also emphatic when the word reunion got brought up. Absolutely not. My heart was telling me that I shouldn't be in a band for a while, he said in 2007. When I quit drinking and doing drugs, I kind of had an anxiety attack. I felt like I'd lost time and should be making up for it. I'm in my early 40s, and I still feel like there's so much more music to make and experiment with before I die, which I hope is a long time from now. I have so much to say, and there's so much more I want from music. More access to touring, writing, keeping my own pace, that I just realized that I had to do the solo thing. It's where my heart is, and I'm really enjoying it. I couldn't afford to let someone else's opinion or vacation time get in the way of it. Carry On dropped on May 28, 2007. The album hit number 17 on the charts in its first week, selling 37,000 copies. It was Chris's lowest charting debut since Louder Than Love. Reviewers were divided. Some praised the father of three for taking his music on a mellower direction. Others openly pined for the maniacal screamer they knew and loved. Despite the mixed reaction and sluggish sales, Chris was determined to forge ahead alone. Just before the album's release, he hit the road for his first solo tour in nearly a decade, backed by a band of hired guns, including Yogi Lonich and Peter Thorne on guitar, Corey McCormick on bass, and Jason Sutter on drums. He was looking for a band that could interpret all the errors of his music and do it justice. And I think we did a really good job of that, Chris's guitarist Peter Thorne said. Usually opening up with Spoon Man and ending with Jesus Christ Pose, the shows were crowd-pleasing retrospectives of his entire career up to that point, with everything from Temple of the Dog, Audio Slave, Euphoria Morning, and Carry On packed into a sprawling two-hour window. He really liked to take chances and live on the edge musically, Thorne said. At one point, he sent us about 10 or 12 songs to learn, many from the Euphoria Morning album. Basically, he wanted us to be able to play the whole album. He maybe gave us a week's notice to try them, and we worked hard on the material, but for whatever reason, maybe I kind of let it go that week and we came to rehearsal at the Ventura Theater in California before a show that night, and I remember scrambling trying to get all the material down by soundcheck. Soundcheck didn't go well. It wasn't a disaster, but it was obvious that they still had work to do to nail the material. I went up to his dressing room maybe an hour before the gig and I said, hey man, I just want to say I'm sorry we weren't a little more together in the rehearsal today, but we'll get it. I'll make sure by tomorrow. He just looked at me and goes, no problem, man, we're cool. I got down to the dressing room, and about 20 minutes before the gig, the set list shows up, and it's all those new tunes. Starting from the beginning of the set, boom, 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 12 songs. I just put my head in my hands, but then, of course, we got up there, and we did it. That's a little bit of his humor there. In that moment, he was being a little bit serious, but also taking the piss out a little bit. Chris seemed to relish messing around with his new band, during a gig at Webster Hall in New York City, much later down the line, the singer brought out a pair of electric clippers and went to town, shearing Yogi Lonish's hair down to a buzz cut on stage in front of a shocked crowd. The guitarist shredded as best he could for nearly three minutes of reach down, busting out every trick at his disposal while Chris played Barber. After completing their quick American run, Chris and his band hopped over to Europe for a quick swing through the continent, highlighted by a massive outdoor gig at Hyde Park in London, where he opened for Aerosmith. He must have made a positive impression on the Boston Rockers because years later, when Steven Tyler was plotting his own solo career and the other members of the band considered going on without him, one of the first calls they made was to Chris. He declined the opportunity and advised them to get their singer back. He passed on fronting Queen as well, when they reached out to inquire about his services. Shortly thereafter, they discovered Adam Lambert and became a touring bonanza once again. The next year of Chris's life was largely dominated by an unceasing string of live shows. He continued his headlining tour of America through the winter. Then the following year, he hooked up with Lincoln Park for their annual Project Revolution tour, which kicked off in Mansfield, Massachusetts, on July 16, 2008. It wasn't quite Lollapalooza 92, 
but the camaraderie was real. That was a great summer, Peter Thorne said. It was like going to summer camp. We'd all hang out between the bands. Chris and Lincoln Park had met the year before when Chris supported the band during a quick-hitting tour of Australia. Chris hit it off immediately with Chester Bennington, who forever earned his respect after the Lincoln Park singer broke his wrist three songs into one of their shows down under. Instead of seeking medical attention, Bennington just kept on singing. Each night during the Project Revolution tour, Bennington made his way out during Chris's set to duet with him on Hunger Strike. Chris returned the favor later on in the evening, guesting on Linkin Park's mournful ballad, Crawling. The regular meetings between two of the most celebrated voices in rock shook the arenas to their foundations and sent the crowds into hysterics. After the tour ended, the two singers remained close. So close, in fact, that Chris named Bennington godfather of his son Christopher. You have inspired me in many ways you could never have known, Bennington wrote about Chris years later. Your talent was pure and unrivaled. Your voice was joy and pain, anger and forgiveness, love and heartache, all wrapped up into one. I suppose that's what we all are. You helped me understand that. After Carry On faded from the charts, Chris was hanging out with his brother-in-law, a Parisian nightclub owner who presented him with an idea to remix some of the album's songs for release. Chris's management team got in touch with Timbaland to see if he might be interested in collaborating and making that happen. By 2009, Timbaland was widely regarded as one of the most reliable hitmakers in hip-hop, having worked with Alaya, Jay-Z, Missy Elliott, and Ludacris, to name a few. Several years earlier, he crossed over into the pop world thanks to his wildly successful collaboration with Justin Timberlake on the star's debut solo album, Justified, and was as in demand as any producer on the planet. Timberland wasn't sold on the idea of remixing songs Chris had already released, but thought it might be cool to work on some new material together instead. It was such an unexpected idea that Chris agreed to get into a studio to see what happened. He knew heading into a project as left field as this one carried tremendous risks. The potential to alienate a dedicated audience he'd worked for over 20 years to cultivate was high. I don't think it's going to be like, it's not bad, he predicted of the reception to the collaboration to Entertainment Weekly. I think it's going to be, this is absolute garbage, or this is genius. Though the press and larger cultural zeitgeist always pegged him as the savage rock screamer, his tastes had always been far more eclectic. He liked trying new things and surprising people with his music. To his mind, working with Timbaland seemed like another unexpected shift on a long creative arc. Chris flew down to Miami and over the next five weeks cooked up 20 songs with Timbaland and the hip-hop producer's host of collaborators at both The Hit Factory and the studio inside the Satai Hotel. I was clearly the odd man out in the group in that room the whole time, but there's also an aspect of that that was the whole reason I wanted to do it and made it exciting, he told the strangers Sean Nelson. There were some anxious moments, and some of what we came up with creatively came out pretty special because of the strange combination. One of his main collaborators was a producer from Philadelphia named Jim Beans who worked closely with Chris throughout the writing and recording process and saw just how willingly the rock god threw himself into the pop world. He loved the process, and he loved being around other talented musicians. A lot of artists are more about themselves, more close-minded about trying other things and other ideas. Granted, Chris knew what he wanted and knew what he liked, but he respected other artistry and other ideas. The recording sessions typically began late, sometime around 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and ended at 7 or 8 o'clock the next morning. While they were working on different ideas, Chris would strum his guitar or play different parts on piano until it was time for him to lay down vocals. He would go into the booth with his pad and his ink pen and shut off to the world. Beans were called. He put his headphones on and shut off the lights. We always had candles, these white candles with a pineapple kind of smell. With the ambience just right, Chris would scream or croon his way over the myriad of tracks, working out different ideas and different deliveries, while also tweaking lyrics on the fly. 
in addition to Timbaland, Beans, and another producer named J-Rock. Chris was assisted on the project by two of the biggest hit makers in pop music, Ryan Tedder of One Republic and Justin Timberlake. Tedder wasn't really around during the recording sessions, and Chris only interacted with him briefly. But his fingerprints are all over the shiny, heavily processed, EDM-flavored tracks like Never Far Away, Long Gone, Enemy, Other Side of Town, and Climbing Up the Walls. Timberlake's contributions were limited to just a single song, a Middle Eastern-flavored cut called Take Me Alive. His voice can only be heard faintly over Chris's vocals, the layers of percussion and the buzzy keyboard melodies. But the former in-sinker shows up midway through to double-track the song's chorus. In almost every respect, the music on Scream was a dramatic departure from any and everything Chris Cornell had ever worked on. In the opening track, Part of Me, for example, he adopts the pose of a nightclub prowling Lothario, looking for some action over a glitchy, sparsely arranged pop instrumental that seems tailor-made for someone like Christina Aguilera. The chorus is jarring. The bitch ain't a part of me, he protests. No, that bitch ain't a part of me. The cover featured a picture of him high in the air just about to smash his guitar into kindling. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to pick up on the subtext. When Scream dropped on March 10th, 2009, Chris's prediction that it would either be received as a genre-altering masterpiece or a dumpster fire turned out to be 100% accurate. Unfortunately for him, critics and longtime fans took the latter view. Of all people, Nine Inch Nails mastermind Trent Reznor took a characteristically sharp jab, tweeting, You know that feeling you get when somebody embarrasses themselves so badly you feel uncomfortable? Heard Chris Cornell's record? Jesus. The shot from one alt-rock icon to another spread like wildfire, with numerous blogs piling on to shit all over the album. In the face of intense public ridicule from his peers and critics alike, Chris held his head high. He didn't flail and launch acerbic counterattacks on his detractors. His response to Reznor was dripping with vintage Seattle sarcasm. What do you think Jesus would Twitter? Chris asked his social media followers. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone, or has anyone seen Judas? He was here a minute ago. Scream debuted at number 10 on the charts, but quickly dropped. Undeterred by the negative response, Chris hit the road for another round of extensive touring, playing in 21 countries along the way, including his first ever stops in Israel and Chile. In a not-so-subtle act of defiance, most of the shows from this run kicked off with Part of Me before segueing into more familiar material. Off the road, Chris established an unlikely friendship with a fan in Texas. Rory De La Rosa was reeling in 2008. His six-year-old daughter, Ainsley, had recently died of cancer. Not long after, he was diagnosed with the same cancer and ended up in hospice care. The pair connected over the phone. It was a courtesy call, but after hanging up, Chris didn't feel right about how it unfolded and phoned Rory back. The two had an even deeper conversation. Over the next several weeks, they maintained contact by phone and by email, Eventually, De La Rosa sent him a poem he'd written titled, I Promise It's Not Goodbye. Chris was so moved by De La Rosa's words that he set them to music. What I read gave me such a sense of relief that Rory had an insight, a strength, and hope that was inspiring beyond measure, he said. It was a pleasure to put it to music and an honor that he asked if I would ever consider it. Opening with a honky harmonica melody, the song quickly morphs into a tender, tear-inducing ballad about life, love, loss, and what awaits us beyond this mortal plane. Now, Daddy, please don't cry, Chris asks on Ainsley De La Rosa's behalf. I'm still here every day. With Rory De La Rosa's consent, Chris released the song in April 2009 on his website as a free download, while encouraging those who listen to it to contribute to the family's enormous medical expenses. Sadly, Rory De La Rosa passed away just a few months after I Promise It's Not Goodbye was released. While Chris continued to promote Scream, he also started looking back on his life and considered all that he had accomplished. That included Soundgarden. One day while he was driving around listening to the radio, Pretty Noose started blasting out of his speakers. 
Frankly, it just crushed the newer songs before it and after it, and had more of a timelessness to it, he thought. For whatever reason, the moment became an epiphany. I realized Soundgarden had become a classic kind of band, the kind that wasn't going to go away. As he considered Soundgarden's role as a crucial force along the long arc of rock and roll history, he thought about how neglected their legacy had become. One day he walked into a store hoping to buy a shirt with his old band on the front for his son, only to discover they didn't have a single Soundgarden item in stock. There was a myriad of Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and Guns N' Roses merch ready to scoop up, but that familiar Bad Motorfinger logo was nowhere to be found. While his contemporaries were bringing in whole generations of new fans by reissuing their catalogs, chock full of unheard gems, Soundgarden's back catalog gathered dust. The band didn't even have an official website. It rubbed him the wrong way, so he reached out to Matt, Kim, and Ben to see if they'd be down to have a meeting to figure out how to maintain their legacy. A lot had happened to his former bandmates since that fateful day in 1997 when Chris visited each of their houses to tell them it was over. Cameron had remained the busiest of the three, touring the world several times over and recording three albums as the full-time drummer in Pearl Jam. He wasn't just a hired hand, either. Cameron regularly wrote and contributed material to their records. You Are on Riot Act is stealthily one of the best deep cuts in Pearl Jam's discography, and the band welcomed his intrinsic understanding of music's more difficult-to-comprehend technical aspects. Matt Cameron writes songs, and we run to find step stools in order to reach his level. Eddie Vedder wrote in the liner notes to the compilation album Lost Dogs, What comes naturally to him leaves us with our heads cocked like the confused dogs that we are. Did we mention he's the greatest drummer on the planet? Though a stream of different musical opportunities had been presented to him after Soundgarden broke up, Thiel largely remained out of the spotlight. He participated in collaborations when his interest was piqued, like the song Blood Swamp on the Boris Sono album Alter. He also played in two short-lived bands with two surviving members of Nirvana. A punk group called the No WTO Combo, with Chris Novoselic and Jello Biafra, that formed to protest the WTO Ministerial Conference in Seattle in 1999, and a heavy metal side project cooked up by Dave Grohl called Probot five years later. Outside of that, he remained persona non grata in the world of rock. Shepard had had perhaps the hardest time of any of them in the intervening years. The end of Soundgarden was a crushing blow. My whole life seemed over, he told Spin. Soundgarden broke up. My other band, Hater, broke up. My fiancé broke up with me. And then I broke three ribs. I got addicted to pain pills, drank a ton, and wound up ODing on morphine. I was laid out in my house for five days, and no one knew it. He still made music, collaborating with the likes of Josh Holm, Mark Lanigan, and Black Sabbath's riff maestro, Tony Iommi. But then Soundgarden sold the building where they housed their stuff, and all of his gear was stolen, including the 72 Fender Jazz bass he bought from Andrew Wood and his brother Kevin that he had used on every Soundgarden record. The thieves also took two different solo records that he'd spent massive amounts of time working on. He was devastated. For a few years, I thought, all right, the world's telling me nobody cares. Fuck it. I won't play. Shepard took up carpentry and figured that his time as a professional musician was over. The initial Soundgarden conclave took place on September 10th, 2008. The four members of the band, along with Pearl Jam's manager Kelly Curtis, got together, strolled down memory lane, and started hashing things out. The meeting went well, and for the first time in well over a decade, there was a sense among them that Soundgarden might not only be a historical concern. It felt really great, Chris recalled. That led to a discussion. Maybe we should get back into a room and play songs. As Chris continued with his solo career, back in Seattle, his three former bandmates hit the stage together for the first time in a dozen years during a show headlined by another one of his former bandmates. Tom Morello was on the road under the guise of his solo project, The Night Watchman, and had a gig lined up at the Crocodile Cafe on March 24, 2009. 
After inviting Kim out to play the MC5 favorite, kick out the jams. Along with Mark Arm and Wayne Kramer, Morello announced to the crowd, I haven't been this fucking excited about something in a long time. It's like I won some type of contest or something. Then he introduced Matt Cameron, Ben Shepard, and Tad Doyle, who ripped into a three-song miniset of Nothing to Say, Spoon Man, and Hunted Down that left Jaws on the floor. It wasn't Soundgarden. The press took to referring to the quasi-reunion as Tad Garden, but it was the clearest indication yet that the tensions had thawed between three-quarters of the band at the very least. I just really thought it was a cool thing for them to do, the singer said when asked about the show by the Washington Post. The only thing I didn't like is that I wasn't there to see it. If I was there, I probably would have gotten up on stage. Over the next several months, the chatter about a potential full-blown Soundgarden reunion intensified. It hit a new crescendo in April, when Chris and his solo band hit Seattle to play the showbox Sodo, just down the street from Safeco Field. Though none of his old bandmates joined him on stage, Kim showed up to watch. Afterwards, Chris posed for a photo with his arms slung around the guitarist and social media blew up with fevered speculation. In the meantime, Chris made a different splashy Seattle reconciliation of his own. When he joined Pearl Jam on stage during their encore at the Gibson Amphitheater on October 6, 2009, for an electrifying duet of Hunger Strike that sent the L.A. crowd into a frenzy. One person's presence can really turn something into a special occasion, Eddie Vedder said. That's the case, and that's what we have for you tonight. Emerging from the shadows in an oversized green coat, Chris hugged or high-fived every member of Temple of the Dog and then proceeded to sing and scream his lungs out in unison with Vetter for the first time in well over a decade. Then on New Year's Eve, a bombshell. After a long spell of careful planning, Chris sent out a tweet ostensibly to give Soundgarden's fans a heads up that their official website was about to go online. But to the fans who read it, the ones who'd long held out hope for the resurgence of their grunge metal gods. The message presented a glimmer of hope that their prayers were about to be answered. The 12-year break is over, and school is back in session, Chris wrote. Knights of the Sound Table ride again. Chapter 15. Been away too long. Thirteen years, two months, and seven days. That's eight years longer than the time it took to construct the tallest building on the planet, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Nearly four years longer than the time it took for the New Horizons space probe to fly the 4.67 billion miles between the Earth and the former planet Pluto, near the outside edge of the solar system. Nearly three years longer than the entire duration of World War I and World War II combined. Thirteen years, two months, and seven days. That's how long it took for Soundgarden to play together again after that disastrous evening in Hawaii when it all fell apart. The long-awaited reunion took place at the Showbox, a dark, open-floored venue across the street from Pike's Place Market on First Avenue in Seattle. Soundgarden had played there just after Bad Motorfinger dropped in 1992, one of the city's greatest artistic entities reborn like a phoenix smack dab in the middle of its own beating heart. It had to happen here. To enhance the mystique surrounding their return, the band performed under a pseudonym, scrambling the letters in Soundgarden to become the more evocatively named Nude Dragons. The moniker emblazoned on the showbox's marquee was a nod back to a similar secret gig the band performed at the Central Tavern near the dawn of the 90s. The subtext behind the moniker was blaringly obvious to those in the know. This was a show for the real Soundgarden heads, those who had been there from the beginning, those who had waited so patiently for this exact night, worrying with each passing month that it might never come to pass. The outside world would get their chance to fawn over Soundgarden and celebrate their return in the coming months, but this show was for their truest believers. From the ferocious opening notes of Spoon Man, it was loudly obvious to the 1,100 people packed into the showbox that this wasn't a band content to coast along on reputation alone. They had something to prove, not only to their fans, 
but to themselves. Matt Cameron was still the powerhouse polyrhythmic guru, driving everything with the force and roar of a V8 engine. Ben Shepard brought the menace-inducing low end, stomping around on stage like a pissed-off Frankenstein. Kim Thiles still ripped into solos like no one else, deploying his wah-wah pedal with psychedelic mayhem. And Chris was still screaming with the vigor of a man half his age, while swinging the microphone stand over his head as the band blasted into an atomic take on Outshined. As incredible and cathartic as the performance was for the four figures on stage, it meant even more for the faces beyond the stage. Scattered among the crowd were some of their oldest friends, those that had helped them take their first steps towards superstardom. Members of Pearl Jam and Mother Love Bone, Sub Pop's Jonathan Poneman, Mark Arm from Mud Honey, and Tad Doyle, to name a few. That was a beautiful show. Their one-time sound guy, Stuart Hallerman, said, one of the best shows I ever saw them play. Calm, happy, Chris was smiling. Flawless-ish. The main set ended like so many Soundgarden concerts before and after, with a seismic slaves and bulldozers. The volume swelled and the ceiling shook as Chris repeatedly asked, what's in it for me, before being consumed by a massive wall of wailing feedback. Thanks, everyone out there that's made all the positive comments and been so supportive about us playing music together again, Chris told the crowd. It's not lost on us. That first meeting between Chris Cornell, Ben Shepard, Matt Cameron, and Kim Thiel, after so many years apart, began with an awkward reticence, but it passed quickly. After five minutes, we're remembering when the roadie was lighting his farts and when someone was in a blackout and swinging from a chandelier, Chris told Revolver. That went on for like an hour and a half, and once that was going on, it felt like you'd just become a band again. The vibe was good, and the four agreed to proceed with plans to negotiate new licensing deals, look into merchandising, and set up a website, among other things. They also decided to dig through their archives with an eye toward reissuing albums with unheard material. The first item in the shoot was a greatest hits package, called Telephantism. The album went platinum right out of the box when it was released on September 23, 2010, thanks to a packaging deal with the makers of guitar hero Warriors of Rock, who bundled a million copies with their latest release. Telephantasm also fulfilled their original contract with A&M Records, making them free agents should they desire to pick up their instruments again. To entice diehards and non-gamers who might scan the track list and see they had all of these songs, Soundgarden included Black Rain, a song that hadn't made it onto Bad Motorfinger. Black Rain still needed some work, so Chris rewrote it and re-recorded some of the vocals. After Kim overdubbed guitar, they salvaged it from the scrap heap of history. The song blossomed into a heavy, despair-riddled behemoth that instantly reminded lapsed listeners why they loved Soundgarden in the first place. As an added bonus, the band allowed Brendan Small, the showrunner behind Metalocalypse, to direct a video for Black Rain featuring incredibly vivid animated scenes of gigantic monsters battling an army of the future. Ultra mega indeed. With Telephantasm complete, the band moved into digging through Adam Casper's dormant recordings of their 1996 West Coast tour for a collection dubbed live on I-5. Chris flew into Seattle and spent a week poring over the mixes inside Bad Animals Studio, now called Studio X, the site of his greatest artistic triumphs during the Super Unknown sessions. It was the Friday of his second week in town that he confronted the other three guys in Soundgarden with the idea to jam. The experience was cathartic for Chris, who was delighted to realize that his old band was maybe even better than he remembered. It was nothing but fun trying to figure out what is the best way to remember some of these songs, he told Consequence of Sound. I was really happy and surprised at how great those arrangements were and how smart we were as record producers and songwriters. What began casually quickly turned into something more serious. Yet, one member remained reluctant. I saw them at Studio X the next day and Chris was like, That was fun last night. I'm gonna fly home, but when I come back, wanna jam again? Stuart Hallerman recalled. Kim was like, no, man. 
The band is not my girlfriend. That was fun, but I don't want this to keep happening. Then we'll do this all the time. But then they did. I think by the end of the week, the Lollapalooza offer was coming, and they talked about it for a while. Lollapalooza wasn't the only entity interested in securing a Soundgarden reunion set. Ever since Chris sent out his Knights of the Sound Table tweet, a deluge of offers from festivals and promoters poured in, hoping to cash in on a big-name return to the spotlight. The eye-popping number of zeros attached to those offers was enticing. Though Lollapalooza had changed a lot, it was no longer a touring festival, existing instead as a three-day musical extravaganza in Chicago's Grant Park and accommodating around 100,000 fans per day. There was something about Soundgarden's shared history with the event that made sense. They accepted the offer and started rehearsing, first at Pearl Jam's Space and then at Hallerman's Avast. They hadn't played together in 13 years, but it was their second rehearsal and they could obviously play, the producer said. Matt's like, yeah, I could play this set tomorrow. Just shy of two years after meeting to deal with their legacy and four months after the showbox gig, Chris Cornell strode out onto the Grant Park stage, Gibson ES-335 in hand, ready to remind the tens of thousands bellowing out in the summer darkness what he and his band could do. His hair, nearly back to its 92-era length, cascaded down his white Grand Canyon T-shirt as he screamed the phrase, To the sky! over and over again throughout the first song, searching with my good eye closed. The dour-looking dudes once derided by some as Frown Garden were in great spirits. This is our millionth time playing Lollapalooza, Chris joked. It's good to be back. Before the start of Outshined, he waded into the sea of fans up front, shrieking the song's opening verse among a roiling churn of humanity. In the immediate aftermath of Lollapalooza, the future of Soundgarden remained murky to outside observers. It wasn't until several months later that the band gave their fans a measure of clarity via a message on their website. Over the past few months, we've been busy jamming, writing, and hanging out together, exploring the creative aspect of being Soundgarden, they wrote. It feels great. We have some cool new songs that we're going to record very soon. In the meantime, Chris worked to maintain a measure of musical independence. In the spring, he embarked on an extensive run of his own, hitting 25 intimate theaters on what he called the Songbook Tour. Each night for two hours, he regaled rapt fans with the power of his voice, accompanied by acoustic guitar, pulling out tracks from each era of his career, along with a wide range of covers, like the Beatles' A Day in the Life, Elvis Costello's What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding, and Bob Marley's Redemption Song, each night was different, as he largely eschewed writing set lists, preferring to play whatever came to him in the moment. The stage was sparse, reflecting the stripped-down vibe of the music. There were two props that had emotional significance to him. The first was Jeff Buckley's red telephone perched on a stool right next to him. As he was packing to hit the road, he had impulsively grabbed it and decided to make it part of the set, drawing comfort from the simple reminder of his departed friend. The second was a record player that he used to play a vinyl pressing of Natasha Schneider's piano on When I'm Down that he sang along to. I had to convince her to play this style of music, Chris told the crowd at the Strand Theater in 2015. She was Russian and didn't think she could do it. She basically said, fuck you, I can't play that shit. And then she did it unlike anyone ever. So this is the only way I like to sing it. The solo shows took him outside of his comfort zone. He'd always been more comfortable in a band setting, even as a solo artist. The pressure to entertain on his own was intense, so he committed to rehearsing and nailing the performances. More often than not, that meant playing in the bathroom, the one place a father of young children can find solitude. Nobody would bother me. People don't want to run into the bathroom, he said. There was something about the tight walls and echo that appealed to him. It eventually got to the point where once he finished writing a piece of music, he'd have to run it through the washroom to see how it sounded. Once it's a written song with words, I think, well, let's see if this works. I go in the bathroom and play it. Months after the solo run ended, Chris collected some of the recordings from the tour, 
and released them as part of a live album dubbed Songbook that hit stores on November 21, 2011. Along with unplugged versions of fan favorites and deep cuts was a new song called The Keeper that he had recorded for the film Machine Gun Preacher. Chris initially struggled to relate to the film's story of Sam Childers, a biker-turned-activist who founded an African orphanage. Inspiration struck when he considered the aesthetic of one of America's foremost troubadours, Woody Guthrie. The feeling was that if Sam Childress, if he were Woody Guthrie and he were writing a song, what would that song be, he said. Because Woody Guthrie's songs were very simple and very direct, like Sam is, and very matter-of-fact. The Keeper is one of the more tender and evocative compositions of Chris's latter-day career. It also netted him his first and only Golden Globe nomination for Best Original Song. Even though his plate was becoming increasingly full, Chris also did a bit of extracurricular recording. He wailed for Carlos Santana's take on the Led Zeppelin classic, Whole Lot of Love, for the legend's guitar heaven. He also sang on a track called Lies by Italian pop group Gabin on their album Third and Double. Most sensational of all, he connected with Slash for a song called Promise on his eponymous solo project. Promise was probably the most unorthodox piece of music that I'd written. It was very different, Slash told Music Radar. I sent it to him, and within 48 hours, he sent me this great lyric, and we were off and running. It was as simple as that. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Soundgarden was still rolling forward. They booked festival appearances in Ottawa and New Orleans before announcing a summer tour while Chris was wrapping up his songbook tour. It would keep them on the road through most of July 2011, hitting familiar venues like the Molson Amphitheater in Ontario, which they'd headlined with Nine Inch Nails back in 94, and the magnificent Gorge Amphitheater in central Washington, where they had opened for Metallica in 96. With every new gig, Chris's confidence and comfort grew. I don't think it was like riding a bike, I think our body of work is too big. Our songs are complicated. There's that all eyes on you kind of thing, he told the Toronto Sun. It wasn't until we actually got out and played a few shows that I started to feel like we were the sound garden that I remember. Things had been looking up within the band since Matt Cameron had sent a message to the guys, letting them know he'd been working on new music that he was ready to share with them. This was shortly after Lollapalooza. After checking everyone's schedules, Cameron booked time in the studio in November 2010, and the four of them convened to mess around with the drummer's creations. One song Cameron brought to the group was Eyelid's Mouth. Cameron had the guitars and drums arranged and wanted to hear what the other guys could add, whether they could soundgardenize his ideas. If his goal was to inspire his bandmates, it was mission accomplished. We were trying to get it to be a David Bowie Diamond Dogs sounding era, Shepard recalled. Time had done little to dull the chemistry between the four fingers of grunge rock's most vicious clenched fist. They could still punch with frenzied rage. Musical ideas sprung to life in the room, and there was no longer any question about making a new album. The only impediment was finding a window in their busy schedules. Fortunately, because they were working without a record deal in place, they could write, rehearse, and record at their own pace, free from external pressure. Soundgarden's musical return would happen on their own terms. The technical leaps in emails since the last time Soundgarden had worked on music in the late 90s certainly helped keep things moving at a good clip. Chris often sang at home over stereo mixes. He edited on his computer and then sent files back to everyone else to critique. An early boon from the band's digital dialogue was a track called Rowing. Shepard had cooked up the swirling, mechanical-sounding bass riff during one of their jam sessions. Because they recorded everything, Chris managed to isolate a loop of it on his computer and turned it into a full-fledged song. That was before we'd even written or jammed out a lot of songs, the bassist recalled. Hearing Rowing for the first time was a crystallizing moment for Shepard, who felt that the gloves were truly off. Chris was motivated and already took the next step, so we had a full, concrete song for once. By February, they reconvened at Studio X. Adam Casper was brought in again to produce and was pleasantly surprised to find the band in a prolific mood. 
It didn't seem like we missed much of a beat at all, he said. We had the songs, the demos, and we'd all been listening to them, and we just got to work. Chris commuted to Seattle from his residence in Miami, but most of the vocals that ended up on the album were actually recorded by Chris at his home studio. Nevertheless, the vibe at Studio X was good. Chris had like a buddy with him, this guy Paul, who was like a sponsor type guy, Casper remembered. Really nice dude. He would kind of come in with us. It was a good team. Family, friends, local guys. Very comfortable atmosphere. Soundgarden titled their return album, King Animal. The name was pitched by Thile after the macabre bone-strewn image created by sculptor Josh Graham was chosen. It was the first time they had picked a cover before they had landed on a name. I was badgering Kim to come up with something brilliant, like he's done before, Chris said. He's the one who blurted out, Bad Motorfinger and Ultra Mega OK. Of the 13 songs that made the final track list, four were credited solely to Chris. Three of them were stacked together on the latter half of the album, beginning with a miasmic acoustic-based track called Black Saturday. After that was the more pop-flavored Halfway There, followed by Worse Dreams, which opens with a frenetic but controlled riff that brings to mind ACDC's Thunderstruck, mixed with a dull moaning guitar drone that sounds like the guttural death rattle of an ailing mastodon. His other song is the truly despondent-sounding Bones of Birds. Lyrically, it was inspired by his innate fear of his children losing their innocence when the world inevitably reveals its harsher nature. It's never a good thing, he said. It's always because of loss or something bad happened or something they weren't expecting. I guess it's the stress I feel about. Not wanting them to have to go through those things, but obviously knowing it's going to happen. Just as he had on Super Unknown and Down on the Upside, Chris locked in creatively with Ben Shepard. They shared credits for rowing, which was positioned as the closer while also hammering together a ferocious rock track that screamed single. It didn't have a name while they were working on it, as Chris remained stuck trying to find a thematic throughway to the music. They referred to it as EBE, after the song's tuning structure, E-E-B-B-B-B. -B -B -B. It was the same tuning that Ben Shepard had used decades earlier on the bad motor finger cut somewhere. I had a hard time writing lyrics to it, because it seemed whole. Chris recalled. One night I couldn't sleep, and I had some up-tempo, punk-rocky song in my head with that line, I've been away for too long. I thought, well, that might be a cool new Soundgarden song. Been away too long might be a little too on the nose for a lead single on a reunion album, but in the face of that exhilarating guitar fade-in, Cornell's blistering vocals, Cameron's thunder of drums, and Shepard's reliable bottom end, who could complain? Shepard had ideas of his own that he'd been honing from years earlier, including a simmering bluesy track called Tarry that he originally intended to put out as a part of a solo record. He'd never recorded vocals for it, however, and privately hoped to get Chris to sing on it one day. The bassist's instincts were dead on. When he cut that vocal, I was just like, shit, Adam Casper said. That was kind of the thing with those guys, Chris, Cobain, and Vedder. When they stepped off to deliver it, man, it was like, woo, it's so good. Two of the most compelling songs on the album, however, were written by Thile. Both of them sounded like the vintage metal sound garden. A thousand days before might be the high water mark of King Animal. Prior to naming it, the band referred to it as Country Eastern. It was a not so subtle nod to the Indian flavor Thile brought to the track from the raga-sounding opening and an open-slide tuning to the electric tambura added by producer Adam Casper. The chicken-picking elements account for the countrified portion of the temporary name. The guitarist's other major contribution was Blood on the Valley Floor, just like Never the Machine Forever on Down on the Upside. The song barely made it onto the finished record. It was presented to the rest of the band late in the process and became the last song they finished. After honing the music together, Chris took the track home and ruminated on a few different ideas before filling Thiel's composition with vivid allusions to things like dried blood and 11 million clowns wielding razors. 
While recording King Animal, another opportunity fell into the band's lap. The producers of The Avengers asked Soundgarden to provide them with an original song for the soundtrack. The scale and scope of the Marvel film was beyond any film project to which they had contributed. It especially appealed to Thiel, who was a massive comic book fan. Initially, they considered giving a work in progress from King Animal before opting to write something new. Chris was cognizant that the song should sound a little more conventional than typical Soundgarden fare. In other words, check the 11-8 time signature at the door. Yet there's a lot of complexity at work on Live to Rise. The alternating acoustic verses, the stratospheric choruses, the meandering bridge that leads to a frenzied guitar solo. Given that Soundgarden's main priority remained finishing King Animal, they had to rush to complete the Avengers song. I think we got Matt okayed on a Friday or something, Casper said. Chris was working with Gary Gersh to get a song approved. He'd written a new song. And all of a sudden, we had to get it done by Monday. Fortunately, they managed to get Live to Rise in the can in the nick of time, and the song became the public's first taste of new Soundgarden material in over a decade as part of the highest-grossing film of the year. Live to Rise eventually hit number one on Billboard's mainstream rock singles chart. Though they originally expected to finish working on King Animal sometime in 2011 and release it that year, the process stretched out much longer. By the spring of 2012, they sewed everything up and eyed an October release, which got pushed back to November 13, 2012. They inked an agreement with Tom Wally, the former CEO of Warner Brothers Records, on his new imprint Loma Vista Recordings. It was a one-record deal with an option for a second. In its first week of release, King Animal sold well by contemporary rock standards, moving 83,000 copies. It was good enough to land them a top-five debut on the Billboard album chart, but a long way off from the sales behemoth that was One Direction's Take Me Home. The press was largely kind. Rolling Stone gave the album three and a half stars, with John Dolan noting Chris's ability to roll around his multi-octave vocal range like some kind of backwoods metal mariah. In praising the music, rock critic Stephen Hyden wrote for Grantland that King Animal is about showing that the sound of Soundgarden slowly inhaling and exhaling as a working musical unit can still be intoxicating like dreamy smoke sludge sucked out of a honey bear bong. Been Away Too Long hit the airwaves a month and a half ahead of the album and did well enough to secure a number one showing on Billboard's mainstream rock singles chart. The second single off the album, By Crooked Steps, also hit number one. Thanks in no small part to a hilarious music video directed by Dave Grohl, featuring the band riding on segways. If Kim Thiel can't look menacing on a Segway, no one can. Chris maintained a punishing schedule throughout 2012. It started out in January with a Soundgarden run through Australia and New Zealand. In February, he found himself in San Francisco, the star attraction at a campaign event put together at the Masonic Temple for President Barack Obama's re-election. Whitney Houston had only passed away a few days earlier and Chris decided to honor her memory in front of the Commander-in-Chief by performing the iconic vocalist's signature song, I Will Always Love You. He taught himself the song while waiting to go on stage in the green room. It must have gone over well, because less than a year later, after coming out on top over Mitt Romney, Chris was invited to perform at the Commander-in-Chief Ball on the night of the inauguration. He played three songs for military members and their families, none of which he authored. Elvis Costello's What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding made the cut, as did Creedence Clearwater Revival's searing hymnal, Long As I Can See the Light. His set ended with an ode written by his hero, Imagine, by John Lennon. After the Commander-in-Chief Ball, Chris joined Soundgarden for the official invitation-only public inaugural ball. Soundgarden was the final act on the bill, and let's just say that some of the D.C. elite, garbed in their finest attire, weren't exactly thrilled to have their rib cages rattled while Chris screamed about breaking out of his rusty cage. As Kim Thiel told Pulse of the Radio a week later, there were definitely many people making for the exits when we started playing. 
Because we are loud and aggressive, and people in their high heels and their ball gowns probably went to some other function and realized that their evening was over. The rest of Chris's 2012 was an alternating mix of solo performances and sound garden shows. Along the way, he managed to hit nearly every corner of the world, from Florida to France, Toronto to Tel Aviv, and everywhere in between. 2013 was equally busy. Soundgarden did a dead-of-winter swing through the biggest markets in North America, typically playing back-to-back -back shows in ornate theaters, 20 dates in places like the Hammerstein Ballroom in New York, the Riviera in Chicago, and the Paramount in Seattle. The last show of the run at the Wiltern in Los Angeles, an epic two-and-a-half-hour, 28-song barn burner of a set, was filmed by PBS as part of their Live from the Artist's Den series. It was released on DVD and Blu-ray several years later. Soundgarden hit the road again for another 19 dates a few months later. Then, in October, Chris kicked off another 30-date iteration of his solo tour. He'd finally reached a point in his career where he felt free to do anything. So he did. He expressed a kinship with the wily Canadian artist he'd spent two weeks opening for while still a young man. I kind of get Neil Young he told Rolling Stone's David Frick. He goes on tour with Crazy Horse, then he's out with Booker T and the MGs, then he's on tour by himself with seven guitars. It makes sense to me now. He's not trying to find who he is. His elder statesmen of rock bona fides were enhanced that April, and he was asked by Ann and Nancy Wilson to induct Hart into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He gave a stirring speech that night in Los Angeles, paying tribute to the Wilson sisters and their valiant assault on Rock's long-entrenched patriarchy, while also tipping his hat to them for paving the way for Soundgarden and their peers. Hart was important to us, not just as musicians, but also as proof of the fact that Seattle could produce something beautiful and rocking that the rest of the world might actually care about, he said. Later that night, he checked off a childhood dream when he sang the classic blues track Crossroads, backed by an all-star coterie of musicians that included the members of one of his all-time favorite bands, Rush. 2014 was all about Soundgarden and looking back. Chris had turned 50, and milestones like that have a way of causing people to reflect. Coincidentally, 2014 was also the 20th anniversary of the release of their seminal album, Super Unknown, and Soundgarden intended to celebrate in style. With the record company's backing, they cleaned up their breakout record, remastered it, plucked an array of demos, rehearsal clips, and B-sides out of obscurity, and placed them all in a massive deluxe package. Later that year, they emptied out the rest of the archives via the three-disc box set, Echo of Miles. Super Unknown's anniversary remained the big event, however. The band went so far as to play the entire album front to back, at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas, that March. They repeated the feat at Webster Hall in New York City a few months later. In between, they played a few shows in South America before performing Spoon Man and My Wave on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Nine Inch Nails' The Downward Spiral was also celebrating its 20th anniversary. Coincidentally, both albums had been released on the same day. A joint tour between the alt-rock legends had originally been penciled for autumn of 1994, but Chris was having issues with his voice and had resolved to rest it. Now there were plans in the works to finally make it happen. There was just one problem. Chris hadn't forgotten Trent Reznor's caustic remarks about Scream. Reznor wrote Chris a letter of apology, which the singer accepted. Reznor was also effusive in his praise of Chris in public. I've always been in awe of what Cornell's capable of doing with his voice, Reznor told UK publication The Skinny in 2014. When I was coming up in the 70s, listening to rock music, every singer could somehow sing high as shit, and I thought, well, I can't be a singer, because my range isn't that high. When Soundgarden appeared, it felt reminiscent of that same kind of great rock singer, like, God damn it, I was pissed off that he could sing that well. I don't have the skill to sing like that. The tour was a go, but then another issue arose. While a July through August arena run worked for Chris's schedule, it didn't for Matt Cameron's. Pearl Jam had just put out Lightning Bolt, 
and Cameron's commitments to the band overlapped with the Soundgarden Nine Inch Nails dates. Rather than call the whole thing off, the band brought in a familiar face, one-time Pearl Jam drummer Matt Chamberlain, to fill in for Cameron. It was an elegant solution and marked the first time since Scott Sunquist left in the 80s that Matt Cameron wouldn't be on stage with Soundgarden. The tour was a huge hit. Sold-out audiences greeted both bands nearly everywhere they went as middle-aged Gen Xers and young millennials turned out to see the best of 90s rock in all its savage glory. When we started as a band almost 30 years ago and we started writing songs that were a little bit moody and depressing to a lot of people, that somehow caught on and there was a whole generation of people that understood how we felt, Chris told the kickoff crowd in Las Vegas. Right now, dance music is really popular and people like to have fun when they listen to music and have a positive outlook. That's great, but it doesn't seem like the world is better. We all have our way of dealing with it. The tour ended at White River Amphitheater, just south of Seattle. With his commitments to Pearl Jam concluded for the time being, Matt Cameron rejoined his brothers on stage, and the show turned into a triumphant homecoming for the conquering legends. Just a few days later, they were in an even more celebratory mood when they performed a tight six-song set outside of Century Lynx Stadium in honor of the Super Bowl champion Seahawks' NFL season debut. The last remaining Soundgarden items left on Chris's docket that year were a pair of performances at Neil Young's annual Bridge School Benefit Concert in Northern California on October 25th and 26th. Of all the major grunge bands, Soundgarden was the only one that had never filmed an episode of MTV Unplugged as an acoustic-only showcase. The Bridge School Benefit gave them a chance to make up for lost time. For Chris who had been alternating between Soundgarden's visceral wall of sound and his contemplative solo shows. It was the perfect way to close out the year. Soundgarden went on in the latter portion of the afternoon on both days, performing in front of a wall of young children in motorized wheelchairs, afflicted with varying physical and verbal impairments. Soundgarden opened with Fell on Black Days before slipping into Blow Up the Outside World, Black Hole Sun, Zero Chance, and ending the set with Dusty. The only difference in the set list between the two shows was the addition of Burden in My Hand in the second show at the expense of Zero Chance. Chris and the band had done quite a bit of charitable and philanthropic work over the years, but it was clear that the opportunity to help these particular children in need really resonated. Make some noise for the real stars of this event, which are the students behind me back here, Chris implored the crowd. We've gotten to meet a few of them, and they're amazing. Backstage, he and Matt Cameron even sat down and were interviewed on camera by one of the school's students. Cameron pulled double duty that weekend in Northern California, with Pearl Jam on the bill as well. Speculation ran rampant among those in attendance that a Temple of the Dog reunion was inevitable. Eddie Vedder did little to squelch the chatter when he strode out that first night, wearing a black New Dragons t-shirt. And then just after jamming out to fucking up with Neil Young, Vedder summoned Chris from the wings to help him sing Hunger Strike. The next night, they repeated the cameo, this time with Vedder decked out in a Mickey Mouse t-shirt. There's a lot of singers back there, he said. How about a Chris Cornell-type singer? At the mention of his name, the man who sparked Temple of the Dog's inception jogged out. This right here is the best Chris Cornell-type singer you'll ever hear, Vedder promised as Chris plopped himself down on a stool next to him. They smiled, clasped hands, and intertwined their voices one more time for the grateful audience. No one could have known that this would be the last time Eddie and Chris ever sang together. Chapter 16. No One Sings Like You Anymore. 5 p.m. Wednesday, May 17th, 2017. Chris Cornell is standing outside of the Fox Theater in Detroit, Michigan. It is unseasonably warm, with temperatures hovering around 80 degrees. He flew into town earlier that day from New York, joining the rest of his band after a three-day break between shows. Lingering outside on Woodward Avenue, he pulls his iPhone out of his pocket to snap a picture of the 89-year-old building's large marquee. Live Nation presents Soundgarden, tonight 8 p.m., 
sold out. Satisfied with the image, Chris shares the picture with his nearly 2 million followers on Twitter. Hashtag Detroit, finally back to Rock City, he writes. Hashtag no more bullshit. Detroit has long been a favorite city of Chris and Sound Gardens, going all the way back to the days when they hoofed it around the country in the red Chevy Beauville. Detroit was always just an amazing experience because the crowds there just love to go crazy, love to rock, Matt Cameron noted. Maybe it's just the weather, or we just hit the right notes. Soundgarden is two-thirds of the way through a month-long swing through southern and midwestern America. Along the way, they alternate between ornate old theaters like the Fox in Detroit and massive outdoor festivals like Rock on the Rage, scheduled two nights later in Columbus, Ohio. Though they don't have anything new to promote outside of a reissue of Ultra Mega OK, they have been steadily working on material for a new album. The tour is a prime opportunity to reconnect with their fans after a nearly two-year hiatus. Chris appears to be in good spirits. According to his manager, Ron Lafitte, he was as optimistic and happy as I can ever recall him. He was so excited about all these things and a new record we were going to put out in the fall. At 8 p.m., the opening act, The Pretty Reckless, hit the stage. The group is led by one-time actress Taylor Momsen, known primarily for her role as Jenny Humphrey on Gossip Girl. Momsen is a rock and roller at heart and a huge fan of Soundgarden. A few days earlier, her year was made in Indianapolis, when sitting outside of her dressing room, Chris swung by to say hello. I'd met him a couple of times before in passing, but here he was, actually talking to me, she wrote on Instagram. We hung out for a while chatting about things like singing and their record King Animal and how much I loved it. Later that night, Chris dedicated the song By Crooked Steps to their opening act. The pretty reckless depart. The low hum of guitar amps cuts through the air. Just beyond the stage, 5,000 people pulsate with the intoxicating anticipation of an evening full of music, memory, and for the love of God, volume. Soundgarden is primed to give it to them. The moment arrives, the one they've been waiting for. The lights go dark, and Chris Cornell strides through the blue-tinged darkness out onto the stage, with the adoring screams of the rock and metal-loving horde pinging in his ears. Gripping his black Gretsch guitar, he chucks a few chords while Matt Cameron beats out the beginning to ugly truth. He's been here before. He knows what to do. Chris Cornell was far from finishing singing Temple of the Dog tunes at the dawn of 2015. That January, Mike McCready booked a star-studded show at Benaroya Hall in Seattle, in part to honor the memory of his short-lived grunge supergroup, Mad Season. Mad Season had only released one album during their existence, Above, in 1995. John Baker Saunders and Lane Staley's tragic deaths from heroin overdoses in 1999 and 2002, respectively, had put an end to any possibility that Mad Season could endure. For this one night, McCready was determined to pay tribute to his departed friends. Seemingly half of the best and most notable rock musicians that Seattle ever produced in the 90s were on hand to participate. Duff McKagan played bass, Matt Cameron and Sean Kinney from Alice in Chains played drums, along with Barrett Martin from Screaming Trees. Stone Gossard and Jeff Ament were there, and so was Chris. We rehearsed with the Seattle Symphony, and then Chris came in, McKagan recalled. That guy can sing. He didn't even have to warm up. He just walked in from his car, got in front of the mic, and this huge voice comes out. After beginning the evening playing a few pieces with the orchestra, McCready invited Chris out for a three-song run of some of Mad Season's best tunes. They began with Long Gone Day, before shifting into River of Deceit, and ending with I Don't Know Anything. After another three-song Mad Season block with Kim Verrant and Jeff Angel on lead vocals, Chris returned to sing a pair of Temple of the Dog cuts. Perhaps not coincidentally, the two that highlight McCready's playing the best, the languid Call Me a Dog, and the expansive Reach Down. The onstage chemistry between Chris and the Pearl Jam guys was palpable. A month after the Mad Season gig, Chris and Soundgarden took off for a quick seven-date swing through Australia and New Zealand. 
The band's only other show in 2015 was a headlining appearance at Canada's Big Music Fest outside of Toronto in July. The majority of Chris's year was spent writing, recording, and promoting his latest solo album, Higher Truth. Higher Truth was the product of the many different songbook concerts he'd performed over the last several years. The album sprung from a desire to strip his music back to its barest elements, lush acoustic guitar and his era-defining voice. There was only one edict that he abided by while writing the songs that would comprise the final track list to his fourth solo album. They were all written in the same bathroom, he told Cameron Crowe. The one rule was that they have to work there first. They have to work in that context first as just a guy playing an acoustic guitar and singing. After working for months demoing different arrangements and lyrical ideas at his home in Miami, he compiled the best and sent them to Brendan O'Brien, who liked what he heard. O'Brien was on board with the idea of making a largely acoustic album. What he didn't want to do was confine the music to two elements just for the sake of it. Chris remembered O'Brien saying, I love the idea of making an acoustic record, but I'm scared of the idea of it just being singing and one acoustic guitar. But if you're open to adding different textures and different things here and there to just kind of keep the song going, then I think we can make a great record. There was a caveat, however. He also said, I don't think anybody but you or I should play on it. For the most part, as the two men recorded Higher Truth, that remained the case. Matt Chamberlain was brought in to play drums, while Anne-Marie Simpson played strings and Patrick Warren added a bit of piano. Chris showed off his chops on mandolin, harmonica, bass, and percussion, while O'Brien added bits of keyboard, bass, percussion, and one of the strangest instruments in the Western canon, the hurdy-gurdy. I'd run down a couple song takes on acoustic guitar, then Brendan would play bass over that, and I would sing to those two instruments, Chris said. He has a Paul McCartney approach to the bass, which works well with my songs, because as a songwriter and arranger, the Beatles are by far my biggest influence. We went for a Beatle production approach on Higher Truth. It's a little epic, but not overdone. To that end, the duo incorporated sonic flares that surely would have drawn an approving smile from John Lennon, such as the fuzzy psychedelic guitar solo on Nearly Forgot My Broken Heart. Then there is the avalanche of chaotic noise that drowns out the end of Higher Truth, a la the Fab Four's A Day in the Life, and the frenetic Eastern String arrangement on Our Time in the Universe. You can practically hear Chris mining the deepest parts of that appropriated Beatles collection from his youth for sparks of inspiration. One of the characteristics that marked Chris's approach to song creation was the way in which he fleshed out characters in an attempt to tell stories from a detached point of view. Only these words, for example, tells the tale of a young princess who suddenly finds herself stripped of all her luxurious trappings. Circling is told from the perspective of a junkie, nodding in the stairwell. Let Your Eyes Wander is the story of a heartbroken lover, desperately hoping the object of their affection will see the error of their ways. Though none of these people are Chris, they bear his DNA. I think it's easier to allow yourself to share personal experiences, thoughts, feelings, and emotions when you're doing it through some character that you've created, he told Songwriting Magazine. And at the end of it, I can read the lyrics and realize that, okay, even though this is a character in a story that I've created, there's a whole lot of me in it. And while there is plenty of dark imagery interspersed throughout Higher Truth, its central message is hopeful. The throughway that connects many of these songs is the idea that you have a finite amount of time on this planet, and you have to try to make the most of it. That idea hits hardest on the soaring ballad, Before We Disappear. As he told a crowd in Bogota, Colombia, in December 2016, it's a song about letting the people that you love know that you love them, because we're all gonna die pretty soon. The song serves as a poignant reminder to appreciate the good things in life. It might be the best song on the record. Higher Truth dropped on September 18th, 2015. The night before its release, Chris was in New York, performing the lead single Nearly Forgot My Broken Heart on The Tonight Show, while backed by a four-piece band. 
Shortly after that, he hopped a flight to San Diego, where he kicked off the first show of a 30-state solo tour across North America, accompanied by cellist Brian Gibson, followed almost immediately by a swing through Australia and New Zealand that was capped by a pair of bravura performances at the famed Sydney Opera House. The next day, on December 13th, he flew back to America, where he played the Forum in Los Angeles, as part of K-Rock's Almost Acoustic Christmas, before ending the year a little over a week later with a gig in Aspen, Colorado. Gibson had gotten the job through a friend. Chris was looking for a multi-instrumentalist who could add distinct textures to the show. After hearing a cello part that Gibson had worked up over a live recording of Fell on Black Days, Chris knew he had found his man. From the jump, the cellist was struck by just how much Chris simply loved music. During our first rehearsal, we played Like Suicide, which is one of my favorite Soundgarden songs. And suddenly he stopped playing and was just quiet for a moment as I continued playing. The cellist told Play Buzz. I wasn't sure what was going on, and then eventually stopped and asked him if something was wrong. And he said no, that he was listening to what I was playing, and it was just so good that he lost his place. Higher Truth wasn't a blockbuster but the critical response was much warmer than it had been for anything he'd put out under his own name since Euphoria Morning. This is hardly an exercise in folky restraint. O'Brien's backing tracks and Cornell's nuanced growl, all the more burnished with age, infuse Root's music with alt-rock dynamics. John Dolan wrote in his Rolling Stone review, For the most part, this is the balance of power and intimacy Cornell has always wanted his solo music to have. Chris spent much of the next year touring solo, but there was another project taking up an inordinate amount of his time and attention. 2016 marked the 25th anniversary of Temple of the Dog. Chris hoped to celebrate that milestone in some way, but there was a problem. Rick Parasher, the album's producer and owner of London Bridge Studio, had died in 2014. His brother Raj Parasher came into possession of the master tapes and refused to give them up. As a result, a and Records sued him. Chris was furious that someone thought they had the right to hold on to his music, especially after the record company had a signed agreement with Rick Parasher dating back to 1993, where the producer agreed to turn over the tapes in exchange for $35,000. To pretend he has a right to keep the recordings makes no more sense than the owner of a laundromat claiming he owns the clothes he washed in his washing machine. Chris said in a statement shared with the Associated Press. By the spring of 2016, the lawsuit was settled out of court, and the Temple of the Dog master tapes were returned to their rightful owner. The resolution had come just in the nick of time. A couple of months later, Chris announced that Temple of the Dog planned on hitting the road on their first nationwide tour. He'd be joined by Matt Cameron, Mike McCready, Jeff Ament, and Stone Gossard. Eddie Vedder would be sitting this one out. The run was limited to eight shows in five cities. Two opening performances at the Tower Theater in Philadelphia, an arena show at Madison Square Garden, another two theater gigs in San Francisco, a date at the Forum in L.A., and finally two gigs at the Paramount Theater in Seattle, the same place where they had come together to celebrate Andy Wood after his untimely death. Tickets sold out almost as soon as they went on sale. Prices on the secondary market soared. The seats closest to the stage were going for thousands of dollars. By October, the band congregated at Pearl Jam headquarters in Seattle and started trying to remember how to play the songs. Temple of the Dog spans just ten tracks and adds up to about an hour's worth of music. Considering that Chris regularly performed for upwards of two and a half hours at a time, and Pearl Jam was known to cross the three-hour threshold. The band wanted to add tracks that made sense historically and musically. Pearl Jam cuts were off-limits, so were Soundgarden songs. Instead, they sprinkled the set list with a collection of their favorite dynamic classic rock songs, like Achilles' Last Stand by Led Zeppelin, War Pigs by Black Sabbath, and Fascination Street by The Cure. Mother Love Bone tracks like Stargazer, Heart Shine, and Temple of the Dog's namesake, Man of Golden Words, were cool too. Chris even threw a few of his old Poncier tape era compositions like Seasons and Missing 
into the mix. The whole set was designed to pay homage to a time and a place when they were all young men trying to make sense of the senseless loss of a friend. The night before the first show in Philadelphia, the band was still working to nail down every element of the 23-song set list. After running through a preliminary take of pushing forward back, something didn't sound right. They convened around Matt Cameron's drum kit and listened to the original version through an iPhone while trying to figure out where they went wrong during the breakdown. The hard work paid off. The performance the next night was a triumph. So was the night after that. So was the gig in New York City, the one at the Forum, both shows in L.A., and the tour enders in Seattle. Though the run was short, the entire experience was more cathartic than Chris could have anticipated, especially the act of performing Andy's songs for so many people. Apple by Mother Love Bone is another album like Temple of the Dog that is among the best rock records of its period that did not have a band to go out and support it. Therefore, not so many people heard about it, and it's never been toured before, Chris told Whiplash. That was the thing that maybe hit me personally the hardest when this guy died at 24. We all thought of him as among the most talented of anyone in the scene. And for him to go away and no one to ever discover that, that almost seemed harder than anything else. So to be able to play all of Temple and all these Mother Love Bone songs in the forum and seeing that many people out there listening to it, that's super fulfilling to me. Despite his hectic schedule, Chris managed to carve out time to write and record new music when the right opportunity came along. There was the atmospheric ballad, Till the Sun Comes Back Around, written for Michael Bay's military thriller, 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi, released in January 2016. An acoustic track titled The Promise, he put together for a film by the same name that hit theaters in April 2017. He also recorded covers of the Beatles' Drive My Car for the Australian animated television series Beat Bugs, as well as a take on Terry Reid's Stay With Me Baby for Mick Jagger and Martin Scorsese's HBO drama Vinyl. The most rewarding project that came his way during this time was the chance to work with John Carter Cash on a tribute album to his father, Johnny Cash. Chris had long said that no one really complimented his lyrics, until the man in black deigned to record a version of Rusty Cage. Now John Carter came to him with a piece of Cash's own writing that had never been set to music. He hoped that Chris could turn it into a song. The poem was called, You Never Really Knew My Mind. Cash had written it in 1967 about his first wife, Vivian, not long after she filed for divorce. Chris instinctually found a powerful, heartbreaking way to turn Cash's no-hold-barred assessment of his relationship, you did not see me well enough to recognize the signs, into a mournful ballad, devoid of bitterness, graced with an aching slide guitar, and breathless vocal melodies. The first time I heard the song, it was a demo. He recorded it in a hotel room closet, John Carter Cash said. Chris sent me a picture of that closet and the microphone setup his wife Vicky and his clothes on the hangers around, his guitar leaning on a chair. Though the subsequent album, Forever Words, was packed with incredible interpretations of Cash's words from legendary artists like Chris Christopherson, Willie Nelson, Alison Krauss, and John Mellencamp, few, if any, managed to match the emotion that Chris imbued into his composition. All the while, Chris worked on new material for Soundgarden, he could hardly get through a single interview without someone asking him how the follow-up to King Animal was coming. Soundgarden is in the middle of writing songs, he told the Hartford Current in 2016 while promoting Higher Truth. After this tour, the songs will become real and we'll put an album out. There's much more to Soundgarden. We've had blocks of time where we get together and write, then disperse again for a while, then get blocks of time, like days at a time. Ben Shepard explained to the Kansas City Star on May 10th, 2017. We've done that like four times, maybe five. So we have an amalgam of songs, kind of. They're not really worked out, and I'm sure we'll do it a couple more times before we hit the studio. Intermittently, the band shared tantalizing updates on social media, showcasing photos of themselves in rehearsal and studio spaces, ostensibly working on new material, Though they hadn't collected enough material for a full album, 
they were on their way, with songs bearing titles like Road Less Traveled, Orphans, At Offian's Door, Cancer, Stone Age Mind, Ahead of the Dog, and Mermis, in various stages of completion. The band booked several multi-day recording sessions at Strange Earth Studio in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle throughout August and September 2016, and again at the beginning of 2017, to try to get as much accomplished as they could. But the wait for Soundgarden's latest album would continue after the band announced plans for their first tour in two years. It was a relatively short run, just 18 dates, mostly in the South and Midwest. The itinerary was a mix of large outdoor festivals and intimate headlining theater dates, set to kick off on April 28, 2017, in Tampa, Florida. Before the tour began, however, Chris had one more reunion up his sleeve. The election of Donald Trump as president was a dismaying turn of events to millions of Americans, Chris Cornell among them. On January 20, 2017, the night of Trump's inauguration. Tom Morello, Brad Wilk, and Timothy Comerford were playing as part of a supergroup named Prophets of Rage, along with Chuck D. from Public Enemy and Be Real from Cypress Hill, as part of a special anti-inaugural ball concert at the Terragram Ballroom in Los Angeles. Chris had joined Tom Morello on stage a few years earlier in 2014 for a $15 minimum wage increase benefit concert at El Corazon in Seattle, formerly known as the Off-Ramp, so it made all the sense in the world that he'd reunite once again with his audio slave bandmates to voice their displeasure in the loudest terms possible with the incoming commander-in-chief. The band didn't even bother introducing Chris to the crowd before Morello kicked into the jittery opening notes of Cochise. When he emerged to scream his lungs ragged on the opening verse, it was like a bomb had been set off in the small venue. Thank you very much, he said after the song ended. Twelve years is a long time coming. The next song, their most popular song, Like a Stone, got the people singing. But Audio Slave was out to level them with their final selection, Show Me How to Live. After the second chorus, Chris did a swan dive into the front row and surfed over the heads of the grateful fans before they returned him to his rightful place on stage. Chris couldn't have been happier with the way things went that night. It was interesting because the dynamic for that band was really just there, he told Music Radar. We just counted the songs in and they were totally where we left them ten years ago when we'd just gotten off the road. According to Tom Morello, the singer had been so stoked about the gig that he was all in on the idea of trying to do some more performances down the line. The last thing Chris said to me was, I had a great time. Let's do this again. Just let me know when. On April 28, 2017, Chris joined the full Soundgarden Road crew in Tampa, Florida for the first date of their spring tour. They were scheduled to headline a regional festival called Rockfest in front of 6,600 people, playing ahead of local heroes A Day to Remember, who recently received the key to the city of Ocala a short while earlier. The next night they were in Jacksonville, headlining the Welcome to Rockville Festival, before heading further south to close down the Fort Rock Festival in Fort Myers, Florida, the night after that. The band got a few days off after their three-day Florida blitz, then hit the ornate Fox Theater in Atlanta on May 3rd. They finished off their southern swing at the Beale Street Music Festival in Memphis, then shot north, hitting Indianapolis, Iowa, Wisconsin, and finally the Starlight Theater in Kansas City, Missouri on May 14th, putting on a well-received performance. The crisp sound production, vastly superior to Soundgarden's 2013 appearance in Kansas City, allowed fans to appreciate every nuance of the deep-groove bassist Ben Shepard and drummer Matt Cameron, created during a faithful version of the 1994 hit Spoon Man, Kansas City Star reviewer Bill Brownlee wrote, saving special recognition for the man on the microphone. His three bandmates are excellent musicians, but frontman Chris Cornell is a bona fide rock star. With Kansas City in their rearview mirror, Soundgarden received a few days off before reconvening for the next show three days later. Chris had missed Mother's Day while out on the road and was eager to spend some time with his family. So he jetted back to New York, 
Soundgarden's tour was scheduled to end in the middle of Memorial Day weekend, so he talked to his family about maybe taking a vacation somewhere afterwards to decompress. The upcoming run of shows was going to be especially packed. Seven gigs over ten days. First up was Detroit. Chris flew into the Motor City from JFK in New York the afternoon of May 17, 2017. After snapping a picture of the marquee outside of the Fox Theater and waiting for the Pretty Reckless to finish their set, he hit the stage around 9 o'clock and launched into ugly truth. He seemed like his typical charismatic self. Detroit Rock City, hey, he exclaims after the song. I love you guys up there on the top shelf, but you gotta stand up and show me something. I have bragged about Detroit crowds for 30 years, so stand the fuck up and make some noise. An explosion of cheers erupts from the balcony. Now make some noise down here to congratulate them, Chris says, pointing to the front row. That's the spirit. The band then reaches into the earliest moment of their history to play their first single, Hunted Down. I remember Chris had just gotten into town and was a little tired and his voice was a little rough. But by about the fourth or fifth song, it kicked in and then it was just like super amazing. Beautiful, clear and strong, and I thought particularly emotive, Kim Thiel later told Billboard. At one point, Chris's guitar goes out of tune and he has to leave the stage to grab another. But other than that hiccup, it was a largely straightforward Soundgarden performance. Chris smiles between songs, tells stories about the genesis of tracks like Mailman, and applauds the crowd for their boisterous energy. I feel bad for the next city, he jokes. The main set ends with Jesus Christ pose. After a few moments of pregnant darkness, Soundgarden re-emerges to rapturous applause and launches into the frenetic rusty cage. And then, just like every other night of the tour, just like he's done hundreds of times in rooms like this one, Matt Cameron begins pounding out the plodding rhythms of slaves and bulldozers. Moments later, Chris is screaming his lungs to shreds while a sunburst Gibson Les Paul swings around his hips. Kim Thiel rips into the song's psychedelic solo with furious gusto, while Ben Shepard hammers the central riff home. Near the end, Chris interpolates some of the lyrics to Led Zeppelin's In My Time of Dying over the jam. And I promise, he proclaims, in my time of dying, I ain't gonna cry and I ain't gonna moan. All I need for you to do is drag my body home. Green and then white strobe lights dance around the heads of the audience as the band brings the song to a stultifying close. Detroit, thank you. We'll see you soon, Chris promises over Soundgarden's dense cacophony. Then he unstraps his Les Paul, walks over to his amplifier, crouches down and begins pulling wailing walls of feedback from the speakers. He stays there, crouched down, while the noise whooshes past his curly mane for just under a minute before walking out of view. The crowd's ears are still ringing, when, at around 11 o'clock, Chris piles into a car with his bodyguard, Martin Kirsten, and, along with a police escort, drives less than a mile down the road to the MGM Grand Hotel. The rest of the band hops on a bus and starts toward the next town. Once Chris arrives at his hotel, he signs a few autographs before heading up to room 1136. Kirsten followed Chris into his room and worked to fix his computer. After that, he gave him a couple of sleeping pills to help him relax and left for his own room two doors down the hall. Shortly after midnight, Kirsten got a call from Vicky Cornell. She sounded angry because he wasn't answering his phone, the bodyguard told police. She told me to go to the room and check on Chris. According to Vicky, who spoke with People magazine weeks later, Chris woke her up by turning their lights on and off in their home, remotely. She became alarmed and called him. He was on a rant, she says. I said, you need to tell me what you took. And he just got mean. The situation was dire. After getting in touch with Kirsten, the bodyguard raced down the hall. He had a key to Chris's room, but the door was locked from the inside by an interior latch. He raced back to his room and called security, asking them to open the door. But they refused, because it wasn't his room. Kirsten updated Vicky and she told him to kick the door down, which he promptly did. When he entered the room, Chris was nowhere to be found, and the bedroom door was locked. Again, Kirsten called hotel officials, 
asking for security's help in opening the door. Again, they refused. Kirsten told them he was about to damage their property and asked that the operator call for an ambulance. After about six or seven solid kicks, Kirsten managed to access the bedroom. He walked in and noticed that the bathroom door was ajar. He could only see a pair of feet. Peering deeper into the room, Kirsten saw that Chris had tied a red exercise band around his neck. The other end was latched to the top of the bathroom door, secured with a carabiner clip. Kirsten untied the band. Chris wasn't breathing. Immediately, the bodyguard began performing CPR. At around one in the morning, paramedics finally arrived and began life-saving protocols. For half an hour, they tried to revive Chris, but he wouldn't come to. At 1.30 a.m., the doctor on the scene pronounced him dead. Chris Cornell was gone. He was 52 years old. An autopsy was eventually completed by the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office, who found several substances in Chris's system, including butalbital, a mild pain medication, a decongestant called pseudoephedrine, as well as its metabolite nor pseudoephedrine, caffeine, and naloxone, an anti-opioid that is used by medical professionals in overdose situations. They also found the presence of 41 nanograms per milliliter, of lorazepam, an anti-anxiety medication. Ultimately, the medical examiner ruled that the drugs did not contribute to the cause of death. Vicki Cornell called the report completely misleading, telling the Detroit News that, I lost my husband. My children lost their father. We're in a lot of pain, and we have to deal with these people coming after us. If the autopsy report was thorough, I believe some of this could have been avoided. She specifically faulted Wayne County for failing to test for the steroid prednisone, which was found in the bathroom and has been proven to affect mood and cause confusion and depression. Through her attorneys, she retained a set of medical experts, including the chairman of the Department of Pathology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, Dr. Richard Cote, who disagreed with the medical examiner's findings and concluded independently that Terminal events occurred while under significant mental and motor impairment. She later filed a lawsuit against Chris's doctor for malpractice for negligently and repeatedly prescribing dangerous mind-altering controlled substances to Chris Cornell, which impaired Mr. Cornell's cognition, clouded his judgment, and caused him to engage in dangerous impulsive behaviors that he was unable to control, costing him his life. Specifically, the drug Ativan. The unmonitored use of such excessive amounts of lorazepam, the suit argues, was known to increase the risk of suicide because it can severely impair judgment, thinking, and impulse control, and diminish the ability of a patient to think and act rationally. The case is still pending. The news of Chris's death came as a colossal shock to millions around the world when they awoke on the morning of May 18th. Social media was flooded with expressions of sadness, incomprehension, and appreciation for the art he left behind. And then there was that nagging question for which there really is no good answer. Why? Why would he do something so drastic and terrible? Only one person has the answer to that question, and sadly, he's not around to provide it. Matt Cameron was the first member of Soundgarden to find out about the tragedy when he woke up on his bus and saw a ripped Chris Cornell post on Facebook. The drummer quickly called Kim Thiel, who was on a different bus, and along with Ben Shepard began scouring the internet and calling friends and family to find out whether the reports were true. Their tour manager was the one who received the official confirmation. Rocked by the awful news, the band pulled over to the side of the road and hugged one another. Rather than head back to Detroit where a bevy of media and press waited, they pressed on with the rest of their road crew to Columbus. They later organized a tear-strewn vigil in the conference room of their hotel. In the days and weeks that followed, Chris's musical peers and protégés took to performing his songs while offering glowing and sometimes tearful onstage tributes to his memory. Writers of all stripes composed long, passionate tributes to the power of his voice the impact of his writing, and his extraordinary legacy. My brother gave freely of his gifts, and it was never a struggle. 
Peter Cornell wrote on Facebook. He kept himself from the saturation of celebrity in such a humble way. The power and anger and passion of my brother's music was always genuine, original, and legitimate. He was the powerful, sensitive, fragile, angry, mystical creature that will exist forever in his body of work. And he did it for all of us, giving it away, leaving all on the stage or in the recordings that will keep him immortal. Tom Morello expressed his appreciation and love for Chris on Instagram. I am devastated and deeply saddened that you are gone, dear friend, but your unbridled rock power, delicate haunting melodies, and the memory of your smile are with us forever, the guitarist wrote. He later penned a poem that he shared with Rolling Stone in which he called him a revealer of visions. You're the passenger. You're a never-fading scar. You're twilight and star burn and shade. Elton John paid his respects online, as did Courtney Love, Perry Farrell, Slash, Joe Perry, Robbie Robertson, Lynn manuel Miranda, Paul Stanley, Cheryl Crow, Daniel Craig, Alice Cooper, St. Vincent, Chuck D., and Jimmy Page, who summed up the feelings of most in the simplest terms. Incredibly talented, incredibly young, incredibly missed. In his hometown of Seattle, the local radio station KEXP played Chris's music throughout the day. Chris Cornell's remains were cremated at a private ceremony on May 23rd in Los Angeles. His wife Vicky was there. So was his brother Peter, the singer J.D. King, and Linda Ramon, the widow of Johnny Ramon. Hollywood Forever Cemetery was chosen as his final resting place. It was only a half a mile down Gordon Street from Cello Studio, where he recorded the first Audio Slave album. His plot was located just a few feet from Johnny Ramone, in a tranquil spot overlooking the cemetery's swan-strewn pond. The funeral took place on a Friday afternoon. The typically sun-filled Los Angeles sky was drowned out by gray clouds, as Chris's friends and family members gathered to say goodbye. Somewhere nearby, a person had modified a sign on the grounds that typically read Garden of Legends to read Sound Garden of Legends. Eulogies were given by movie producer Eric Israelian, actor Josh Brolin, Tom Morello, Jeff Ament, Kim Thile, and Matt Cameron, who called Chris his brother and artistic soulmate. Perhaps the most touching moment of the service came when Chester Bennington, accompanied by his bandmate Brad Delson, sang a gut-wrenching rendition of the song Chris's friend Jeff Buckley had made famous. Hallelujah. Bennington took his own life just a couple of months later, on July 20th. It would have been Chris's 53rd birthday. As mourners filed out of the funeral, the strains of All Night Thing, the sparse final track of Temple of the Dog filled the air. Around three o'clock, the public was allowed to pay their respects, one by one, they filled by the shiny black headstone emblazoned with Chris's name. One by one, they reached out to touch the letters scrawled into the permanent slab. Voice of our generation and an artist for all time. Chris Cornell, 1964 to 2017. Beloved husband and father. A long time ago, practically a lifetime before this somber day, long before Audio Slave, Temple of the Dog, and Soundgarden, Long before he became the rock god and the sex idol. Long before the Grammy Awards, the magazine covers, and the sold-out concerts. Long before he rubbed shoulders with presidents and royalty. Chris Cornell was a tall, baby-faced, 19-year-old kid driving home from work in his crappy green Ford Galaxy. Just another Joe Nobody from a part of the country people hardly paid attention to. A high school dropout for whom a life of food service or manual labor seemed preordained. It had been an unremarkable evening at Ray's Boathouse, another night of dirty dishes and fish guts. But as Chris piloted his sedan home, a moment of clarity washed over him like a soft Seattle rain. It occurred to me that there was no guarantee that, as a musician, I would ever have any kind of financial success. But I was fine with that, he remembered thinking. That night, as he navigated his way through the inky black Pacific Northwestern night, he made a promise to himself. No matter what happened in terms of success, I was going to be one of those guys playing music until he drops dead. 
because of the tragic way that Chris Cornell's life ended. There's a propensity to view his story as a tragedy. That would be a mistake. Chris Cornell lived his life to the fullest. He overcame seemingly insurmountable challenges time and time again in the pursuit of a dream too enormous to fathom. He used the tools at his disposal, his one-of-a-kind voice, his guitar, and his imagination to craft era-defining music that many turn to time and again in moments of sadness, anger, joy, anguish, fear, doubt, and love. He lifted the hearts and minds of countless people from all walks of life on nearly every continent on the planet with his unique and unparalleled artistry. He did what he loved, and along the way created a musical legacy that will endure for generations. Chris Cornell kept his promise. Epilogue January 16th, 2019 Los Angeles, California It's nearly four years to the day since the last time I witnessed Chris Cornell singing on stage. It was the triumphant Mad Season gig at Benaroya Hall in Seattle when he reunited with his friends in Temple of the Dog. He seemed invincible that night, tall, powerful, and of course, loud as hell. I get goosebumps whenever I think about how he crooned and screamed his way through Call Me a Dog. Now here I am, one person among 17,000, packed into the forum in Inglewood, stealing myself for the emotional night of musical transcendence to come. The stars are too numerous to count. Jimmy Kimmel is on hand to serve as the evening's MC. Leonardo DiCaprio is drifting around backstage. Brad Pitt is in the building. So are Courtney Cox, Josh Brolin, Jack Black, Tom Hanks, and so many others. I'm sitting directly behind Michael Kelly, the guy who plays Doug Stamper in the Netflix series House of Cards. We're all here for the same reason. To honor the musical legacy of Christopher John Cornell. For five continuous hours, some of the biggest, most talented, and impactful musical artists of the last half century flood the stage to play a collection of Chris's finest compositions. Forty-two songs total. Before the show begins, the three surviving members of Soundgarden make their way out to an enormous standing ovation. Matt Cameron does most of the talking, expressing how he had mixed emotions about the idea of putting on a tribute show. I heard his voice, and I found my strength, the drummer said. There's so much I miss about Chris. But what I miss most is Sim walking into a room. Chris is with us tonight. He's got the best seat in the house. You could only hope. The Melvins kicked the show off moments later, ripping into their set like they were all the way back at the Paramount Theater in 92, opening for Soundgarden on a sweaty Friday night. After that, Alan Johannes comes out to honor Chris's euphoria mourning period by performing Disappearing One with Nika Costa. Foo Fighters play three of Soundgarden's deepest cuts before the band departs, leaving Dave Grohl alone to perform a tender, melancholic take on his song Everlong. Then Josh Holm ambles out and plays a solo Johnny Cashified version of Rusty Cage on his tobacco burst Telecaster. Before Audio Slave hits the stage, Jimmy Kimmel recalls the time the band forced the LA Riot Squad to flood Hollywood Boulevard during a performance on his show. Then, along with Black Sabbath's Geezer Butler on bass, they tear into a collection of their greatest hits with an assist from Parry Farrell, Juliette Lewis, Brandy Carlisle, and once again Dave Grohl, who shreds the remnants of his vocal cords on Show Me How to Live. Another emotional moment follows when Chris's daughter Tony appears to sing Redemption Song with Ziggy Marley on guitar. This is only her third live performance ever but she is prepared. Only a few years earlier, she had performed the song on stage with her dad at the Beacon Theater in New York City. Chris's eldest daughter, Lily, appears on stage and delivers a sage piece of wisdom her dad had imparted to her. The most influential advice he gave me was that his success did not come from a desire for success. It was more from a passion and an absolute love for what he did, she said. He reminded me often it was an added benefit, but that can never be the driving factor. My dad had a beautiful gift, but the most important part of it was that he loved what he did, and he did it because he loved it. 
Metallica play next, mixing two of their own songs with two of Soundgarden's earliest, Head Injury and All Your Lies. And then there is Temple of the Dog. Though Eddie Vedder isn't in attendance, my mind is blown away by Miley Cyrus's pained and beautiful take on Say Hello to Heaven. And then somehow, Brandy Carlisle and Chris Stapleton managed to kick things up to an even higher gear during their hair-raising duet of Hunger Strike. Not long after that, the three remaining members of Soundgarden emerge from the shadows once again, take their places on stage, and honor their brother with a scorching eight-song set of their most beloved material. Taylor Momsen of The Pretty Reckless Sings, Rusty Cage, Drawing Flies, and Loud Love. Marcus Durant, Kim Thiles, MC5 bandmate, wails over Outshined and Flower. Foo Fighters drummer Taylor Hawkins has the unenviable task of subbing for Faith No More's Mike Borden, who fell ill before the show, pouring everything he has into I Awake and The Day I Tried to Live. And then finally, Peter Frampton picks out the haunting familiar chorus pedal painted notes of Black Hole Sun. A weight falls over the forum with the painful recognition that this is the end. Brandy Carlisle, a native of the Puget Sound area, steps to the microphone, summons all the power of her own show-stopping voice, and delivers a performance stricken with raw, gut-twisting emotions. I'm not the only one left with tears streaming down my cheeks. At song's end, the members of Soundgarden let their instruments feed back for nearly ten minutes. The last sound many hear as they file up the aisles is Chris's guitar that had been set up at the center of the stage, a solemn totem in the center of the sonic maelstrom crying out one last time. As I walk out into the cool L.A. evening, the ground around my feet puddled with the remnants of a torrential downpour of rain that snarled traffic to a near standstill earlier this afternoon, I feel a deep sadness swell up in my chest. The entire performance was an amazing tribute to a generational artist. It was the kind of concert you know you're going to remember 10, 20, 50 years from now. The one you tell people about and watch as their eyes grow wide with awe and wonder as you rattle off name after name after name of the myriad artists who gathered together in salute of someone they admired and respected. The sheer amount of love, compassion, and effort that went into every second of the show and from every person who took part in it was palpable. It meant something to them. Chris Cornell meant something to them. It meant something to all of us, too, out in the crowd. It was our chance to grieve, but also our chance to collectively remember all the times this singular artist and his music was there for us in times of sadness, anger, and joy. It was our chance to say thank you. And yet, when it was all over, after every superstar had their turn behind the microphone, you couldn't shake the impossible desire for the man himself to amble out of the wings one more time to show us all how it's really done in the dynamic, stultifying way that only he could. Call it cliché, but it remains undoubtedly true and probably will until the end of time itself. No one sings like him anymore. Disclaimer. If you or someone you know is suicidal or in emotional distress, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Trained crisis workers are available to talk 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Your confidential and toll-free call goes to the nearest crisis center in the Lifeline National Network. These centers provide crisis counseling and mental health referrals. 1-800-273-8255. For more information, please visit the official Suicide Prevention Resource Center at www.hspc.org. This concludes Total Fucking Godhead by Corbin Reif. Narrated by Michael Butler Murray. Copyright 2020 by Corbin Reif. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Post Hill Press and was produced in the year 2020 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.
Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.